Welcome back, my students, to our brand new episode of Comic Class. And in today's lesson, guys, we'll be starting an entire retrospective looking at Stanley and Steve Ditko's Spider Man run, the first 38 issues. And yeah, uh, today we're going to be looking at Amazing Fantasy number 15, which was the debut of Spider Man as a character, his first issue. And yeah, uh, without further ado, let's jump right into today's story. Let's go. So, the story for Spider-Man, you know, the first issue of Spider-Man ever, uh, being Amazing Fantasy 15, uh, shows Peter Parker basically being an outcast, and basically being made fun of by a ton of his classmates. Now, we get to see that Peter Parker is actually, um, looking at the science experiment going on in this laboratory, when a radioactive spider actually bites him and gives him spider powers. And after he realizes that he has spider powers, he basically starts using his abilities, his newfound abilities, to take on wrestlers and win some prize money. And once he realizes just how strong and fast he is and how agile he is, he uses his abilities to get a lot of money and try to become famous off of his new powers. Now, Spider-Man, you know, Peter Parker basically uses this money to, to create web shooters and shows his genius intellect even at this young age that he was able to create web shooters and web fluid. Peter also makes his iconic Spider-Man suit and it's really cool to see, you know, where this character started out from. And eventually he comes to this point where he basically wins, you know, one of these uh, bout fights and gets the prize money and there's this guy escaping from a police officer and he basically lets the guy get away and the police officer even tells him that all he had to do was trip the dude or you know grab him and he would have been able to catch this dude and put him in jail but you know spider-man basically tells the cop that he's done being pushed around and that he's looking out for number one that means me and it shows how you know uh, cocky and how selfish that Spider-Man is acting at this moment, that he's not the responsibility type character that we, you know, recognize in this first issue. Uh, this is Spider-Man in his beginnings, not having the loss of Uncle Ben yet, and not having that responsibility kind of like put on him and that feeling of having to take care of other people. So this scene is really good. Now we get to see that Aunt May and Uncle Ben basically buy Peter this like uh, microscope that he wanted basically and you know it just shows how kind-hearted they are and it shows how selfish you know that Peter is in this one that he thinks to himself that he's okay with having these two people that love him and the rest of the world can kind of hang for all he cares but this comes back to bite him in the butt and why this does is because he continues to use his powers for selfish gain and eventually he gets all this money and he goes back home and there's police officers there and they basically tell him and inform him that his uncle Ben has been uh, killed, shot and murdered. And Peter is basically angry so he goes off and heads to where the cop told him that the criminal was being held off at. And it's this type of warehouse so Spider-Man basically arrives and goes in to confront the dude and tells him that there's no way that he's going to be able to escape him and his vengeance basically. So he basically webs the dude's gun and his hands stop him from firing and lands a punch on him. Now I'm surprised that Spider-Man didn't take this dude's head off considering this is when he first started, uh, you know, getting his powers. But I'm guessing he had been using it for a few weeks or months. And yeah, so we can kind of assume maybe he had a little bit of a hold on himself. And that's why he didn't kill this dude right out, right? But yeah, so basically he takes off this guy, you know, his hat, and he sees that this is the guy that he had a chance to stop earlier in the issue. And it's just pretty sad to see that, you know, Spider-Man had a chance to save Uncle Ben's life, but because of his own selfishness, someone that he loved died. And, you know, there's no coming back from that, you know, you're dead. And yeah, so basically, one of the, you know, cop, you know, the captains and the rookie basically say, look, that it's him on a spider's web and we get to see the guy has been webbed up and left for the cops you know spider-man didn't kill him which is really good and we get to see peter basically take off his mask and just start crying saying that only if he had stopped him that uncle ben wouldn't have died but now uncle ben is dead and this is where we get the great line that with great power there must also come great responsibility basically setting up spider-man's character in his own solo series which will start in the next video 
So, our story pretty much starts off with a recap of Spider-Man's origin. Peter basically tells us everything that happened in Amazing Fantasy number 15 for those that hadn't read it. And we're going to get introduced to the character of Spider-Man in this first uh, solo issue. So, Peter basically has the powers of a spider. And he also is dealing with the death of Uncle Ben. And his aunt, you know, Aunt May basically doesn't have any money to pay their bills. So she has to pawn stuff like jewelry in order to pay their stuff. So, you know, Peter basically feels pressure to go get a job. Now, Peter basically confronts Aunt May about this and tells her that more than anything, you should probably just quit school and get a job that we can help pay, you know, their bills. But Aunt May basically, you know, tells Peter that Uncle Ben wanted him to be a scientist like he wanted so he doesn't need to quit school and that they'll find a way to make some money so peter basically has a lot of stress going on uh you know at home and at school because he's worried about aunt may and it's just really cool to see you know how peter has these interactions with his fellow classmates which have no idea what his life actually is like at home and yeah so eventually we're introduced to the character of j jonah jameson probably one of the most famous of spider-man's uh, side characters and it's really cool to see how even in the beginning when he was first introduced he hated spider-man and it basically brings this dynamic to spider-man because before this everyone just loved spider-man and j jonah jameson when you read amazing fantasy number 15 and you see how much everyone just you know praises everything spider-man does uh j jonah jameson is actually very needed to bring a balance to spider-man and to let him know that not everyone agrees with him and that there's going to be challenges along the way when you choose to be a masked uh, superhero so we get to learn that j jordan jameson's son is actually going into space and that he actually is coming back you know i believe on that day that peter sees this news and while peter is out in the streets looking for a job you know looking at the paper he basically hears about you know j jordan jameson's son coming back uh today and he also sees Aunt May basically selling her jewelry to try to like pay their bills. And Peter basically lashes out and feels like, you know, everything is useless despite his powers. He can't help his, you know, aunt basically, uh, you know, provide for them. Uh, so it's pretty sad. But we get to see Spider-Man basically go and make his way to where J. Jordan Jameson is at. And it turns out that, you know, uh, J. Jordan Jameson's son is actually... Uh, his ship is malfunctioned and he's gonna die. Basically, he's gonna crash and die. So Spider-Man gets into costume and he goes to J. Jonah Jameson and just tells him that, you know, he's gonna go and save uh, his son. And J. Jonah Jameson doesn't believe this, but he goes anyway. So Spider-Man basically arrives to where, you know, the space uh, capsule is at and he tries his best to try to save uh, J. Jonah Jameson's son. And eventually he's able to open some type of mechanism that allows the astronaut to be able to manually, uh, you know, get his parachute out and he's able to save his life basically, which I'm pretty sure that in the future this will come back in a plot line uh, regarding J. Jonah Jameson's son, but I think that's like hundreds of issues later. Uh, so there's no real point in talking about that right now, but yeah, Spider-Man saved his son. And, of course, J. Jonah Jameson, in repaying Spider-Man, basically poses that Spider-Man is a menace uh, to society, you know, to New York society. And, you know, Spider-Man's just, like, surprised seeing this, considering that he just saved his son, and this is how he writes about him. So, Spider-Man becomes a wanted man, and he has a reward for his capture, and now Peter's gonna have to deal with this type of situation in the next coming issues, and, yeah, it was really good. Now we jump into the second half because when Spider-Man first started as a solo series, we had about, I think it was like two stories per issue. Um, they were really pushing, you know, Spider-Man's uh, world building, you know, uh, just introducing tons of side characters and stuff like that and the world that Spider-Man lives in. So uh, for a little while, I believe that we're going to be covering two stories per issue. But yeah, this story uh, contains the chameleon story, basically, and it introduces us to Spider-Man's interactions with the Fantastic Four. I believe this is his first interactions, and he gets into a battle with the Fantastic Four and does all right. Eventually, you know, he kind of gets away from each one of their superpowers, uh, showing how strong Spider-Man actually is, considering he had just gotten his powers maybe like a few weeks or a few months ago. 
and the Fantastic Four have already been superheroes for quite some time, I believe, when this takes place. Now, granted, the theme does state that he was holding his punches, you know, pulling his punches, uh, so we don't really know if he would be able to knock Spider-Man out at this point. But yeah, Spider-Man basically tells him that he was just looking for a job and wanting to join the Fantastic Four, but, you know, after how much they, you know, judged him just because of his costume, he decides to leave and not come back. Um, and it's really cool. Eventually, we know that they'll be, you know, friends in the future, especially him and Reed Richards, both being type of scientists. Uh, definitely do hit it off in the future and being friends. But at this moment, you know, Spider-Man's just a kid. And, you know, he just did not have a good interaction with these people. So Spider-Man is basically, you know, just living his life, and we get to see the character of the Chameleon, one of Spider-Man's, if not his first rogue that's introduced in his solo series, who has the ability to change his appearance. So he basically tries to frame Spider-Man, and he, you know, does all these type of crimes, trying to get Spider-Man to be blamed, basically giving J. Jonah Jameson, you know, free advertisement for what he's trying to put in the masses minds about what they should think of spider-man and yeah the issue ends basically with spider-man uh chasing down the chameleon who kind of like almost got caught out and eventually he like uses the cops disguise to try to get spider-man to be uh captured by them to try to trip the guards and spider man spider sense is first uh introduced in this issue which is like this tingly feeling he feels when he, his body is in danger or something like that i'm not sure if it's just his body's in danger or if in general if he's in danger or someone he knows is in danger um it's not explained completely but yeah this is the first time we ever see the spider sense and the chameleon basically turns off the lights but spider-man's able to sense him in the dark in some way and while he's trying to use his you know webs he basically finds out that he's all out of the special fluid that he uses and spider-man basically grabs the chameleon tells him that he found him and he basically rips off uh, part of the chameleon's disguise you know his cop outfit uh, while the other cops are being tricked by the chameleon to come and attack spider-man spider-man gets away and it's revealed to the cops of that so with the spot that spider-man had ripped off of the chameleon showed his spider-man disguise underneath and he's basically taken into jail uh you know he's taken in by the cops and sent to jail because uh they found out that this indeed is the chameleon so that was pretty smart spider-man knowing that the chameleon would have his clothes underneath so he was able to reveal who he was while being attacked by the police and spider-man is actually crying at the end of the story was saying that he wished that he had never gotten uh, my superpowers, basically, as he says. Because of these powers, he got cocky and it led to the death of Uncle Ben. And now he's like legit, like considered a criminal by almost the entire city. So Spider Man has a lot going against him right now, but we're definitely going to see him rise above it in the next few issues. And we also get this scene with the Fantastic Four basically asking what will happen if Spider Man ever turns you know, evil if he goes against the law and uses powers against the law uh, because right now he's just a teenager he was able to take on the entire Fantastic Four you know granted they might have been holding back as you know uh, Ben Grimm the thing said but um, even so he did really well against four super powered people that are very you know uh, versed in using their abilities so what would an adult super, uh, Superman what would an adult Spider-Man be like uh, it's kind of scary if he ever turned evil and as the issue ends it says and the whole world will have to wonder until our next great issue don't miss it and that's the end as it says and spider-man we know is not going to turn bad spider-man is literally one of the greatest superheroes of all time of our time um and he is you know one of the, one of the most beloved superheroes so the story pretty much starts off with the vulture in action we get to see him robbing someone and we also get to see Peter Parker overhearing his classmates talk about how the Daily Bugle, a newspaper uh, publisher, basically is gonna, you know, uh, hire people or at least pay people for good pictures of the Vulture. So Peter Parker basically has the idea to turn into Spider-Man to take pictures of the criminal, the Vulture, basically to pay his aunt's bills. And yeah, so he basically uh, starts to get ready to go take these pictures and the Vulture is you know contemplating how he's gonna eventually have to do with spider-man spider-man is a thing now 
Now the vulture basically is out, you know, doing his thing, gonna go rob people. When he gets in a battle with Spider-Man and he's easily he's able to easily defeat Spider-Man and puts him into this type of water uh, container. And this water container is like super heavy, so Spider-Man is in this, you know, a giant amount of water, and he uses his super strength, his spider-like strength to kind of like break open the lid on the top and he's able to escape with his life. So Peter basically realizes that he needs to step up his game that you know him not having enough web fluid and stuff like that is going to be a no-go in the future and that now that he's fighting people like the vulture and you know the chameleon you know people that have abilities like him he's gonna have to uh, up his game so he starts building a utility belt that holds more of his uh, web fluid canisters and yeah it just shows that he's learning he's adapting with the opponents that he's having to face which is really cool to see and it is one of the reasons why spider-man is such an interesting character now peter basically takes the pictures that he was able to take of the vulture to you know j jonah jameson and he pays him and it looks like things are going good for peter parker which is awesome now, Peter basically eventually becomes Spider-Man again, you know, gets in suit, and he takes on the Vulture a second time, but this time he has a plan. So him and the Vulture kind of engage in a flight battle with the Vulture thinking he has the advantage because he can fly. The Spider-Man basically made a device that made his, I guess, attachments that he uses to fly uh, malfunction. So he's basically falling to his death with Spider-Man as well, but Spider-Man uses his webbing to basically save his life while the Vulture is able to, you know, kind of get control of his flight suit, uh, but is still crashing down into one of the buildings and the police capture him and put him in jail. And at the end of the, you know, story, we get to see that Spider-Man is pretty happy that his anti-magnetic inverter uh, worked, which enabled him to get the win on the Vulture. And he gets paid uh, from J. Jonah Jameson for more pictures of the Vulture and his capture. And because of this, Peter was able to pay the rent for a whole year for his Aunt May. And it looks like things are going up for him. And this is the start of Peter, you know, using a job as a photographer to make money while he's Spider-Man. Which is a really cool thing that they came up with to have Spider-Man able to have, a, you know, a normal job in a way while saving people in New York. And it ends with the Vulture basically saying that he will get revenge on Spider-Man and that he's also going to develop better flight suits to take on Spider-Man and that next time it will be his turn to gloat. And yeah, that was the first story with the Vulture. Now we jump into the second story which has to do with the Terrible Tinkerer. Now, basically, Peter is talking to the science lab uh, professors and he gets offered an opportunity to study under a very renowned professor so he takes the opportunity to go learn from this dude and while he's there the guy basically tells him that he needs to go check something or go check with his boss or something like that and it turns out that there's a ton of these alien uh, working underneath in like the basement area and spider-man basically has a spider sense and senses that something's wrong so he dresses into his spider-man outfit and heads down to check out what exactly is happening with the professor and eventually he comes down to the basement and the aliens actually spot spider-man and they try to attack him and spider-man actually has to you know climb up walls use his web shooters use his super strength to fight against uh these aliens and it's a really cool fight scene that we get to see between these characters eventually the tinkerer lands a hit on spider-man and puts him into this type of capsule and in this capsule they're basically going to drain all the air from it basically suffocating spider-man you know and suffocating him to death which is pretty brutal but spider-man uses uh some of the air holes that they had inside of the capsule to shoot his webbing through and is able to hit the control panel that gets the capsule to open and with this spider-man basically engages in combat again knocking one of the aliens into the control panel destroying it and the tinkerer basically tells them not to leave him and spider-man grabs the tinkerer basically telling him that there's no way he's gonna let him get away because he's a traitor to the human race uh, because he was gonna sell him out to the aliens basically having the aliens take over earth which we know wouldn't happen just the avengers or something like that you know other superheroes in this world would definitely stop the aliens spider-man isn't the be-all 
but this is his story so we have to believe it being that bit of a threat and yeah so the tinker basically tells spider-man to get his hands off him that nobody touches the tinker and it's implied that the tinker dies i believe so spider-man leaves with his life basically barely escaping you know suffocating on you know the gas you know the smoke and yeah at the end we get to see that the aliens go up into their spaceship and leave earth seeing that there's no way they'll ever come back again because they're already found out and they definitely will be prepared for them in the future showing that they really have no chance against these super powered people which is really cool to see now we also get to see you know the professor basically coming back one of the professors talking to you know peter parker telling him how his you know studying went under that professor and it's revealed that you know in the con confusion of the smoke and that uh engagement that he had with that other professor that the guy actually dropped a mask showing that he actually wasn't uh who he said he was so i'm not sure if it's ever gonna get revealed on who this guy actually is in a future issue pretty sure it will uh but we'll cover that whenever you know it gets revealed in the future and that's how the issue ends basically him saying that he's not uh sure how everything went but you know he did have a good time basically the guy you know not suspect anything and while at the same time holding this mask that this dude was using to try to fool everyone so i wonder who that guy is that was behind this mask and hopefully we see that in a future issue so this story pretty much starts off with spider-man utilizing a new gadget known as i think the spider signal or something like that and he takes on a ton, to, uh, ton of criminals and basically stops them from robbing this uh, safe. So Spider-Man basically ties up these people and leaves them for the police. And we're introduced to the character of Dr. Octopus, Otto Octavius. And we're seeing that he's just a regular scientist that has developed this new invention, these uh, mechanical arms, these four arms that add to his appendages. And yeah, he's basically able to use these uh, new appendages to basically interact with radioactive material making him one of the only people on earth to be able to handle radioactive uh, material without uh, being in danger but something goes wrong and a blast occurs with the radiation basically melting the uh the mechanical arms to his body so now he's kind of like stuck with them on his body and he wakes up in the hospital and utilizes his new abilities to break the bars off of his hospital window and escape and utilizing this newfound strength and understanding what this could mean for him he basically turns himself into a super villain and as he says he sees himself as a supreme human being on earth now Peter has more jobs, you know, coming from J. Jonah Jameson, so he's out there doing his Spider-Man theme when he comes across Dr. Octopus actually having these people hostage uh, in his lab, and yeah, he's basically making them do whatever he wants, and that's a no-go for Spider-Man, so Spider-Man goes in there to take on Dr. Octopus. Now Spider-Man is very cocky in this inner Interaction with Dr. Octopus. He basically even says before he starts the fight that he was looking forward to this and that he wanted a little action. So Spider-Man is kind of getting too used to, you know, winning at this point in his career. And he basically gets in a fight with Dr. Octopus. And Dr. Octopus is more than Spider-Man can handle at this point. Because at this point, he's had it really easy with people like the Vulture not being, you know, much of a physical threat to Spider-Man. But Dr. Octopus's mechanical arms are definitely a match for Spider-Man's spider strength. And he easily defeats Spider-Man and throws him out the window. And Spider-Man can't really believe that he just took a loss to Dr. Octopus and in such a manner as what happened. Um, so Dr. Octopus goes on to continue doing whatever he's doing. And Peter basically is having a sort of like depression spell because he got defeated by Dr. Octopus so badly. Now we get to see that during uh, Peter's time at college... I guess the next day we get to see that uh, Johnny Storm from Fantastic Four The Human Torch basically is giving a type of speech to uh, the college students and Peter takes this speech from Johnny you know about trying your best and never giving up and that it takes more than just your you know born with skill or you know the skills that you have to win a fight or to win any obstacle in your life so Peter takes this to heart and he goes back and to try to defeat Dr. Octopus so he makes his way to where Dr. Octopus is at at his lab and they engage in another fight and this time Spider-Man brings his brains with him and he utilizes some type of chemical that he was able to make with some of Dr. Octopus's uh, 
uh, I guess, formulas that he had lying around, the chemicals he had lying around, and he's able to try to meld two of Dr. Octopus' mechanical arms together, and they engage in a fight. And, and these things that Dr. Octopus uses, you know, these mechanical arms are no joke, and they hurt Spider-Man. So Spider-Man utilizes his webbing to kind of like uh, shoot some webs into Dr. Octopus's glasses to make him not be able to see, uh, to temporarily blind him. And after Dr. Octopus basically takes off his glasses uh, to try to see what Spider-Man's doing, Spider-Man basically takes, you know, a few punches from Dr. Octopus. And there comes a point in the fight where Spider-Man has to let go of one of the tentacles, which requires him to, you know, throw a punch in a split second, which he does and knocks out Dr. Octopus in one hit, considering that Dr. Octopus is only a normal human. And Spider-Man, you know, definitely was holding back when he hit Dr. Octopus. You know, he would probably kill him if he wasn't holding back, but he was able to knock him out and he puts some web fluid all over him, you know, webs him up for the police when they find him and eventually uses his spiders to know to get the police to you know see where dr octopus is at and they basically you know find dr octopus and he just says you know don't just stand there get me out of this and he's basically taken to jail and spider-man has saved the day once again and i guess it's implied that he saved the hostages as well they're not really shown i think uh, during their second encounter so i'm guessing that either dr octopus just let them go like he said just dr octopus does seem like a person that has some sort of honor code but i'm not sure at this point so he might have just let them go you know with his own uh you know logic or a uh, spider-man definitely saved them but it's not really shown so i don't know what to say about that but they definitely probably got away but yeah spider-man basically shows up to uh i guess a medical examination that uh, the Human Torch was taking Johnny Storm and basically the doctor tells him that he's completely fine that Johnny Storm should be able to be back to normal so you know he's pretty excited to go show off to the Fantastic Four showing that he's okay. And Spider-Man shows up and basically tells Johnny thank you for you know doing that speech at the college campus and that that's the reason why he was able to defeat Dr. Octopus and he basically leaves without another word with leaving Johnny just wondering what exactly happened and what did he exactly do to, you know, take down Dr. Octopus or help, you know, Spider-Man, because him and Spider-Man kind of have, like, a love-hate relationship, at least at this point in the comments. And, yeah, so Spider-Man basically sees the Human Torch, you know, showing up, uh, talking to the college campus again, he's just smiling, saying that, you know, one day he's going to show the Human Torch what, you know, what he's all about, basically, and how good of a hero he is, and it just shows this little rivalry between two, and it's really cool to see. And it makes me happy to see, you know, interactions like this between Spider-Man and other people, in the Marvel Universe. So our story pretty much starts off with Spider-Man kind of foiling a robbery attempt. At least that's what it seems like, but before they can actually rob the place that they're gonna rob, Spider-Man jumps in and tries to stop them. And they kind of point out that because they hadn't done a crime yet, you know, they hadn't committed the crime, that Spider-Man is actually an outlaw and they can use the law against him. So they call for a police officer and when the police officer shows up, Spider-Man tries to make his getaway and yeah, they basically feel like they outsmarted Spider-Man, but even the cop says he can tell that they're kind of like, you know, suspect uh, and for them to kind of like just run along. So the good thing is that Spider-Man did stop the robbery from, hap from happening, so that's good. So Spider-Man basically is just, you know, going around town, you know, after he escaped the situation, kind of reminding himself that he needs to be more careful when he's doing his superhero work. And eventually he sees this dude climbing this ladder up a side of a building, and this turns out to be the Sandman. So Spider-Man shows up, and he realizes that the Sandman must be up to no good, so he engages in a fight, or, you know, he tries to capture him, and he basically reveals himself to be made out of sand, or that's his power. And he's able to utilize his sand ability to either make himself super soft or super hard like iron. So uh, Spider-Man basically gets, you know, hurt in the process. And the Sandman basically attacks Spider-Man and rips his mask in two, uh, kind of revealing Peter Parker. So lucky for him, he didn't, you know, see the Sandman, didn't see his face. But Peter has to run off because there's no way he can reveal his secret identity. So the Sandman gets away free. So we get to learn the Sandman's uh, origin being that he was in a nuclear plant or a nuclear test explosion that caught him unaware and he basically fused his body uh, with the sand that was around that explosion making him into a type of Sandman. Uh, and yeah, so Peter Parker basically goes back home and he has to fix his mask and he almost gets caught by Aunt May in his costume 
but he pretends to be sick and while he's doing that he sees on the TV that the Sandman is making some robberies and he's basically just doing a ton of stuff. So eventually Sandman goes to Peter Parker's I guess college campus and he gets in a confrontation with the principal of that college and tells him that he wants a diploma and yeah I guess the Sandman had never graduated high school so he's about to you know lay waste to this principal after the principal denies him a diploma saying that he can't betray the trust that he has been given by the government you know to make people educated and spider-man shows up and lands a hit on uh, the sandman really nice either right hook or left hook and they engage in a fight and the sandman utilizes his sand abilities and shows us more of what he can do with the sand abilities that he has being that he can change his hands into different weapons to try to you know squash the spider and their fight is pretty interesting spider-man tries to web him up but realizes that that's not going to work he just the sandman can just easily turn into sand and get through his webs he tries shooting the sandman through with a type of i guess gun or something like an air gun and it's either an air gun or a nail gun i have no idea what this is um i think it's an electric drill and he tries using that to, you know, drill through the salmon, but it's no use because he can just make his sand very soft. And yeah, eventually Spider-Man comes up with this awesome idea to use a vacuum cleaner type of, it's some type of vacuum device. And he basically, you know, absorbs all the salmon sand, trapping him in the container for the police. And Peter, you know, utilizes some sand uh, from, I guess, the container or, you know, from some uh, other, I guess, pot that was nearby. It kind of replicates what he was doing for some shots for Daily Bugle. It's a little, you know, slimy, but Peter does say that he did fight the salmon for real. So it's not that slimy, but still feels a little iffy to me. But uh, whatever, I guess, gets the bills paid for Spider-Man. I mean, he is saving everybody's lives every day. So I guess he can get a break for a little bit. So J. Jonah Jameson basically is not impressed with what Spider-Man has done, you know, taking down the Sandman. And Spider-Man uses his signal to show that he was the one that defeated the Sandman. And J. Jonah Jameson basically tells police that they need to, you know, capture Spider-Man and lock him up. And the police basically tell J. Jonah Jameson that he's the only one trying to take out Spider-Man and that the police appreciate Spider-Man's help in taking down the Sandman. Showing that J. Jonah Jameson's uh, bad press for Spider-Man is kind of going down the drain a little bit at a time. So hopefully soon we'll see Spider-Man get a lot of praise uh, for his heroic efforts and at least some respect for the job that he does every day for the citizens of New York. And yeah, so Peter gets uh, talked with J. Jonah Jameson for the pictures that he got of Spider-Man vs. the Sandman. So he's probably going to get a paycheck from him to pay the bills for Aunt May, so that's good. And the story pretty much ends off with Flash Thompson, Liz Allen, and uh, other classmates of Peter basically making fun of him for being a coward and leaving the scene when the Sandman had showed up to, you know, attack uh, the college campus. And of course Peter knows that he's Spider-Man and he actually saved all their lives, but he can't, you know, uh, give out his uh, secret identity, so he kind of has to just take the you know the mental abuse basically you know them just making fun of him the humiliation and you know he had blew off his date with liz allen earlier in the issue so she doesn't really want to talk to him but he does lose his temper a little bit with flash but it, peter basically realizes that with his spider strength he would easily demolish flash so he decides to not go through with it and of course flash you know teases him for that calling him a coward and yeah so the issue ends with liz and flash going out on a date with flash kind of just making fun of peter you know telling him not to lose his books uh from some kindergartners and stuff like that just you know some friendly teasing as you just say like a natural bully like uh talk you know that you see in like shows and stuff and yeah so, so you have peter basically walking around town he actually overhears people talking about the daily butyl and the bad press that they're giving spider-man still so he's still having to deal with that side of the city that doesn't really trust him and the issue is just with spider-man contemplating if he needs to continue being spider-man and of course we know he will but it will be interesting to see how exactly he handles these issues in the next coming you know few issues of the story and hopefully soon the city realizes what spider-man is doing and that he's not against the city and he's not a menace to society like J. Jonah jameson says and that he is indeed their friendly neighborhood spider-man 
So this story pretty much starts off with Peter Parker with his classmates at a bowling alley and basically they're hearing J. Jonah Jameson talking about Spider-Man, you know, in a bad light. And Peter, to try to keep his identity a secret, kind of goes against and agrees with J. Jonah Jameson even though we know that's a lie. Uh, but he does this so that not to raise suspicion basically and his classmates basically, basically clown him for, you know, uh, thinking Spider-Man might be a bad dude and for agreeing with J. Jonah Jameson. Now, Spider-Man basically leaves, you know, this situation and he goes back home to, you know, work on his uh, spider powers that work on his agility and his webbing and stuff like that. And Doctor Doom utilizes this new technology to try to contact Peter Parker and get Spider-Man to join him. So he kind of uses uh, Spider-Man's spider sense to bring Spider-Man to his lair, this lab that he's working at. And Spider-Man and Doctor Doom basically start interacting with each other, which was really cool to see. They basically have a discussion with Doctor Doom trying to recruit Spider-Man to this side of evil. And Spider-Man basically tells Doctor Doom that he ain't gonna do it. And he attacks Doctor Doom, kind of like trapping him into some spider webs. And Doctor Doom reveals that that was actually a Doom bot. And they engage in a battle. And it's a really cool scene because we get to see Doctor Doom utilize his genius intellect to try to trap Spider-Man, but Spider-Man is just too agile, and he's able to make his getaway and make an escape. Now, Peter Parker, while he's at the Daily Bugle, it seems like he's gotten a job, you know, bringing uh, pictures of Spider-Man, uh, is kind of noticing that Betty Brant, which is one of the assistants at the Daily Bugle, seems to have a crush on him, so that's pretty interesting. We also get to see that Flash Thompson has made his own Spider-Man suit that looks pretty identical to the original, which is actually really impressive. It makes you wonder where he got the suit from or if he made it himself. And he basically dresses up as Spider-Man to try to scare Peter Parker and kind of like, you know, make fun of him and get him to be the laughing stock at school. So while Peter is walking down the street, uh, Flash basically is about to go and scare him with the Spider-Man costume. And Flash gets knocked out by some sleeping gas, you know, like a little like powder blast from uh, Doctor Doom and Doctor Doom brings into his lab. And Peter Parker gets a call from Liz Allen basically telling him about the prank that Flash was going to do on him. And Peter just tells her that it's not really his problem that Flash isn't, you know, one of the people that's up on his list of saving. Um, which we know Peter's going to save him because he's Spider-Man. He knows that he has a responsibility to save even the people that hate him. So Peter basically talks to Aunt May and tells her that he's going to go out to get some stuff. And while he's out, he gets dressed into his uh, Spider-Man outfit and goes after Flash uh, to rescue him. Now, Peter eventually meets it to Dr. Doom's place and he gets in the lab and uses his spider signal to get Dr. Doom's attention. And they engage in a battle. And this battle is really good. Like, I think you'll have to remember that this was made in like the 60s. And for a 60s comic, this has some, some really good action in it. And he utilizes, uh, you know, yet again, Dr. Doom's intellect. He's using all these different machines to try to, you know, trap Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And it's amazing. We get to see these, like, little, like, uh, balls that, like, float around, like some type of gravity device. And Peter's just using his agility to try to dodge all this stuff. Eventually, Dr. Doom uses this type of uh, death ray or something. And he actually equipped his own bodysuit to not be damaged by it if he gets hit by it. And the fight just keeps continuing, eventually they get into like a fist brawl. And they just start attacking each other and Peter Parker, you know, he's realizing that uh, these hits are like damaging him, you know, like Dr. Doom is no joke in the strength department. And eventually the Fantastic Four actually start to arrive there and Doctor Doom realizes that there's no way he can take on the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man at once. So he meets his getaway and Doctor Doom escapes, uh, leaving Spider-Man to, you know, live another day. Uh, so I'm pretty sure Spider-Man's glad that the Fantastic Four arrived. But, you know, knowing that Flash is saved now, he just leaves Flash there. I just, it's not like Flash was tied up or anything. I guess he had gotten free um, during the, you know, all this chaos, this battle that Spider-Man and Doctor Doom were having. So the Fantastic Four arrive and actually grab uh, Flash and the Human Torch actually notices that this cannot be Spider-Man. It basically tells, you know, Ben Grimm that, you know, the Thing, that this isn't, you know, Peter Parker, this isn't Spider-Man, basically. I'm not sure they know Spider-Man's secret identity yet. You know, maybe the Human Torch does, I have no idea. Uh, but they realize that Flash isn't, you know, really Spider-Man. And But Reed Richards does notice some web fluid, you know, lying around, you know, some webbing. And so he does say that the real Spider-Man must be here. Now, Peter basically arrives back at, 
you know Aunt May's house at their house and he basically tells her that he wasn't able to get the fuses because he was scared to walk the dark streets alone you know having to make an excuse so that she doesn't realize that he's spider-man and yeah you know this is a really cool you know fight that spider-man had and really shows you know the type of duality that he has to have being peter parker and spider-man you know he's going to be in these situations where he's going to have to come up with these type of excuses now peter the next day goes to J. Jonah jameson and he basically gets you know hassled about not getting pictures of the whole spider-man flash and uh you know dr doom incident betty basically you know stands up for him and tells him that she thinks that he's wonderful and just showing that she kind of has like a little crush on him so we'll see how that relationship you know blooms in the next few issues and yeah peter goes back to you know the college campus and this is where he's here overhearing flash basically talking about how he wasn't scared of dr doom he basically got lucky that he left before he was able to pulverize him and it's just you know really funny as we got to see you know flash like crying telling dr doom not to you know murder him and stuff earlier in the issue so it's pretty funny to see that that's how flash was acting when he was captured but, you know, once he's, you know, in the public view, he has to act like this, you know, huge tough guy. Uh, so I thought that was pretty funny. I like how Liz basically makes fun of Peter saying that he must be jealous of Flash for being, you know, a real He-Man. And it's just, you know, funny because, like, Peter says that he has luck, but, you know, it's all bad. And that's how the issue ends, you know, with Peter basically, you know, having to deal with everyone thinking that he's, like, some type of weakling. Uh, you know, after fighting one of the strongest supervillains of all time, Doctor Doom, in the Marvel Universe. Uh, so yeah, Spider-Man's getting no respect still, so that's sad. So, our story pretty much starts off <clears throat> with the Lizard basically in uh, Florida. And he's confronting a ton of people, and he basically, you know, rips off a tree, you know, from its uh, roots, you know, its trunk. Uh, just showing the amount of strength that you know, the lizard has and what the lizard actually does is the lizard is kind of intelligent he does have the ability to speak uh, because he is originally a man and we see that the daily bugle issues a challenge for spider-man to go fight and defeat the lizard in florida now peter basically goes to talk to j jonah jameson asking him if he can you know send them to florida to take pictures of the battle between spider-man and the lizard but jonah basically just you know blows him off and tells him there's no way that spider-man's gonna go fight the lizard someone that can actually defeat him when he can just continue beating two-bit uh criminals at, you know in uh, new york city so peter basically has a conversation with betty brandt and they basically start flirting with each other which was a really cool thing to see and Peter, you know, the next day goes to the Natural History Museum for his high school uh, class, I believe. And while they're there at the, you know, museum, these two guys, these criminals, basically try to uh, rob the place. And they almost, you know, take out the frustrations on Peter when they suspect that he thinks that they're on something. And they're willing to actually shoot a high school kid, which is kind of crazy. So they take Liz and they, you know, try to use her as a hostage, but Peter gets into his Spider-Man costume and attacks, uh, you know, the criminals basically leaving them for the police. And yeah, he saves Liz Allen and kind of flirts with her a little bit. And this kind of gets Flash, you know, a little nervous, you know, because comparing himself to Peter, he's okay with, but comparing himself to Spider-Man, you know, he feels a little insecure, which I mean, I think anybody would be when you're competing against, you know, Spider-Man. So Peter gets into costume and he goes in and talks to J. Jonah Jameson webbing him up and tells Jonah that, you know, he's going to go to Florida to fight against uh, the lizard that he's taking the Daily Bugle up on their challenge. But he tells him to go send Peter Parker, some photographer, to go take some pictures of his fight with the lizard. So Betty Brandt, you know, comes in and sees that Jonah is, you know, tied up. And Peter goes in there and talks to J. Jonah Jameson basically letting him know that you know he's gonna allow him to go to florida to take pictures of spider-man uh, fighting the lizard and yeah i think jonah is paying for him to go take these pictures which i guess is a normal thing but it seems that jonah is paying peter to go on this trip you know he's paying for both of them and yeah they're going to florida to take some pictures of the lizard and you know get this you know breaking story this is definitely will sell some papers spider-man versus the lizard 
So they arrive at Florida and Peter makes his way away from Jonah and gets into costume and he goes after to find the lizard. And they come face to face with each other and the lizard gets a surprise attack on Spider-Man bringing him into the water. Now Spider-Man is able to throw some dust into the lizard's face letting him uh, get away for a moment and he gets out of the water. He eventually makes his way to some house where he gets told the bad story of Kurt Connors who is the lizard uh, from his wife and we get to learn that Kurt Connors was basically I guess a war veteran that had lost his arm during the war and he just been uh, experimenting with lizard DNA and to try to figure out how to get his arm back you know kind of like get the regeneration that uh, lizards have reptiles have and yeah eventually he was able to successfully get his arm back but in the process he actually mutated into the lizard and now he wants to actually take uh, everyone and put them in this new type of you know, transformation he wants to make other people like how he is so he's making a formula and he wants to put it I guess into the water to make everyone like how he is so he almost you know uh, gets you know to this situation whenever uh, Peter basically hears Billy which is Kirk Connors son you know running away from him whenever I guess Kirk came to see his family and Billy is saved by Spider-Man when there's a snake on the ground about to attack him but the lizard sees this and tells him that there's no way he's going to let Spider-Man take away his son from him and they engage in a fight and Spider-Man even mentions how hard you know the lizard skin is that it almost feels like a dinosaur skin and it almost broke his hand when he landed his punch on him so yeah this guy is no joke uh, at least at this point in spider-man's career uh he might be a little too much for him so kurt you know meets his getaway and then peter gets you know to working as he is you know he wants to be a scientist you know peter parker before he got his spider powers so he's actually able to meet an anti-serum i'm not sure if it was him or you know Kirk Connor's wife or maybe Kurt himself but his wife basically gives it to Spider-Man and tells him that he needs to get Kirk Connors to drink this and that he will save Kurt and turn him back to human so Peter <clears throat> makes his way to some type of like well which is I guess the cover of this uh, issue and Spider-Man engages in a fight with all these different alligators that are trying to attack him eventually he makes his way into the well and gets the lizard to follow him where he traps him in here with him uh, so that he can get him to drink the serum so they engage in their fight and peter eventually gets the upper hand and get the lizard to drink the serum but it doesn't uh, go into effect right away and peter you know is just uh taking a beating from the lizard like you said it almost feels like he got hit by a runaway sledgehammer but eventually uh the lizard starts feeling the after effects of drinking of the serum and he turns back into Kurt Connors into a normal human man and Spider-Man takes him back to his family and it looks like they're gonna have a happy ending at least for now uh, Peter arrives to J. Jonah Jameson and tells him that he's got the pictures but Jonah just grabs him and rips him up uh, because he didn't want to you know be proven wrong that the lizard was actually you know a real thing and the issue ends with Peter and Jonah basically heading back to New York City so yeah so Peter arrives back home and he actually calls Liz Allen to see if she wants to go out on a date but she's actually you know flustered and wants to be with Spider-Man kind of falling for him after he saved her life I mean I'm pretty sure she was into him before that uh, but definitely now she's waiting to see if Spider-Man will call her which is very you know weird because I don't even think she gave him his number her number but you know yeah so it's pretty funny just peter's like you know that he is spider-man so it's kind of weird getting turned down uh, and you know at the same time being kind of like wanted at the same time it's just really weird and yeah betty brent at the end basically is talking to j jonah jameson spider-man basically sends j jonah jameson a letter in the mail it's a really funny scene and yeah it's you know that's how the issue ends with uh, a tease that the next issue will focus on the vulture returning after we haven't seen him since you know issue two so our story starts off with a recap of what happened in the amazing spider-man issue two when spider-man fought the vulture for the first time and ever since then the vulture has been in jail now the vulture has been 
on good behavior and he has been given access to working on machinery uh, in the prison and he has used this opportunity to get materials to build a new flying device which he uses in his jail cell and figures that you know it's finally time to make his escape so while he's out you know doing his outdoor exercises uh, the next day he actually uses his flying device to go over the wall and escape uh, the prison and spider-man is basically playing i guess some volleyball with his classmates and flash thompson and he hears uh something over the radio that the vulture has escaped so he has to kind of like blow his friends off as well as flash thompson and tell them that he's feeling kind of sick so he can go home get changed to spider-man a uh, uniform uh, slash costume and goes out to fight the vulture now the vulture is out uh, in the city causing havoc and he basically uh, robs this dude at gunpoint and takes away some of the jewelry that he was selling eventually him and spider-man come to blows and he's able to outmaneuver spider-man similar to their first fight that they had in issue two uh, with spider-man getting a little cocky thinking that the same device he used on the vulture in issue two would work this time which it didn't and actually got spider-man's arm to get broken uh, so he's gonna have to deal with that handicap so Peter basically goes to the doctor after it animates him and tells him to be a little more careful uh, with himself because, you know, he kind of like, I guess, fractured his arm. And yeah, the kids at school basically, you know, tease him for it. And Peter's basically, you know, telling himself that he's kind of losing his patience with Flash, constantly bullying him. So we'll see what happens in the next issue where they finally get to, you know, take each other on. And yeah, the Vulture's getting ready for his next heist. And he goes to J. Jonah Jameson while Peter is there talking to him. And Peter slips away for a moment while J. Jonah Jameson is trying to negotiate with the Vulture, trying to get him to not take all his money, uh, offering to give him publicity and stuff like that, which is pretty funny because the Vulture, you know, is a super villain. Pretty sure he doesn't care about stuff like that. And he even tells him that all he wants is his money. So Peter gets into costume and uses his webbing to kind of make a type of slink uh, for his broken arm or fractured arm and he comes in and takes on the vulture uh, hand to hand and you know tries to save J. Jonah Jameson even though he's always constantly uh, giving him trouble and Spider-Man and the Vulture fight in the Daily Bugle which was really interesting to see. Eventually they make their way out of the building and go into the air once again where Spider-Man comes up with an idea to use his webbing to put both of the vultures uh, wings together so he can't fly and they're both gonna fall to their death when Spider-Man meets a parachute out of webbing and he has the vulture go down by himself to get caught by the police once again and you know sent to jail once again. And Peter you know shows up to J. Jonah Jameson telling him that he had taken care of the vulture and while that's going on, you know, J. Jonah Jameson basically starts attacking Spider-Man verbally. So Spider-Man webs up his mouth and he goes back to the Daily Beetle and changes back uh, into Peter Parker. So Peter and Betty hit things off and it seems like they're starting to flirt with each other a lot more with every issue that passes. And it seems like the relationship will bloom between the two. And Betty does mention that, that you know, something's wrong with J. Jonah Jameson. Peter basically says, you know, Ron gets an improvement making a joke. And he tells Betty that, you know, he wants to, you know, uh, just spend some time with her right here while J. Drew and Jameson can't talk. And that's how the issue ends with them kind of embracing each other and just enjoying each other's company. And I really enjoyed it. So our story starts off with a professor uh, coming to the class of Peter Parker. And he's basically showing something off called the living brain, a machine that can tell any answer that you give it. And Peter is getting bullied by Flash once again, where Flash goes overboard and actually causes Peter Parker's glasses to break. This leads the two to get into an argument saying that they want to fight each other, which is really cool. And it's something that has been coming since the Amazing Spider-Man, uh, you know, issue one. Now, the living brain, as the professor says, he wants Peter Parker to come up here and do a demonstration. And the students ask, you know, what is Spider-Man's identity? There's also a couple of crooks here. They're going to try stealing the living brain as well. So keep that in mind. And yeah, they ask who is Spider-Man. And Peter starts freaking out because there's a chance that the living brain might guess correctly and, you know, reveal his secret identity. Peter realizes that the living brain is giving 
a type of decoding message so it's not going to say it right out so you kind of have to know what it's saying but the professor tells him that he'll definitely be able to decode it for him in the you know in a little bit and the crooks are about to make their move whenever the you know whenever flash uh tries to pick a fight with peter once again by trying to take uh the decoding message from him and the professor tells them that he's seen that they're kind of like at odds with each other his entire class and he wants them to settle their differences in the gym today so we cut to the gym where peter and flash are both gonna uh, put on some boxing gloves and have a boxing match to show each other you know uh, who's boss and to kind of get this bullying over with you know that for peter to show that he's not someone that needs to be messed with every day so peter is in a type of situation that he can't really go allow just he would probably decapitate the you know flash if he were to you know not pull his punches i think there's even a, an issue with spider-man where dr octopus is in control of spider-man's body or in spider-man's body and he like takes off the scorpion's jaw or something so yeah spider-man constantly pulls his punches even when he's you know not saying it and he pulls his punch he was dodging flash so fast that it seems like he's always just out of reach when in reality he's actually dodging his attacks his punches uh which shows the speed that spider-man has and by you know not even putting just like a little ounce of his power behind his punch is able to knock flash clear out the ring and yeah you know the people the kids think that flash is joking and telling him to get back in there and take out you know peter uh, and while that's happening we can see the two cruds attack the professor that i guess is the one that created the living brain and while they attack him one of the cruds hits the control panel on the living brain causing it to go berserk and, uh, and haywire and yeah it's basically going to try you know destroying everybody or you know just causing destruction all over the place like you know collateral damage and stuff like that we cut back to the fight with peter and flash and while, you know, Peter and Flash are having a fight, Peter's about to land the final blow to knock Flash out whenever they hear some sounds, you know, calling for help because of the living brain going crazy. And Flash turns his head and Peter accidentally hits him while his guard is, you know, down and uh, he knocks, you know, Flash out. And the students kind of boo him for it because, you know, it was a foul. Just Flash wasn't even looking at him while it happened. Peter's not happy about this win either. But he is glad that he held back and that, you know, Flash won't be really hurt, but instead, you know, just knocked out. So while Peter takes Flash to, you know, I guess the um, the locker room so that, you know, he can be there until he, you know, wakes up, he gets into a uh, costume and he goes and takes on the living brain. And he is able to free the, you know, the classmates, his classmates, and gets everyone out of the building while he takes on the living brain. The living brain is full on machine, so nothing that Spider-Man does is going to cause it any pain. So it's just going to keep going until, you know, it destroys everything. Eventually, Peter's able to deactivate the machine, but not before it's going to fall down some stairs uh, through a window. Peter's able to web them both uh, back inside the building, and he was able to shut off the living brain. And while the crooks are trying to, you know, get away, the professor, you know, tells them that they need to try stopping them because they're the ones that caused this entire situation. Uh, Flash waits up and is, you know, getting himself, you know, dressed and he's tying his shoes whenever the crooks accidentally, uh, you know, fall on top of him and knock themselves out. And Peter uses this opportunity to kind of get the classmates to think that Flash is actually Spider-Man, mentioning that he was the only one that was trying to get the paper from Peter to see who Spider-Man was, in a way could be trying to protect his uh, secret identity, and also that he was able to knock out these two giant men, uh, you know, quite easily without even knowing what he did, uh, you know, supposedly. And it's pretty funny to see Flash trying to, you know, try to uh, validate himself, you know, try to you know uh make it to where he's not guilty he's not spider-man but the classmates are convinced that he must be spider-man and it's just a very funny end uh to this issue and we get to see peter just you know singing uh you know whistling down the road uh you know and just see his peter parker uh uniform basically you know just being peter parker so now we go into the second story in issue eight where it's spider-man tackles the torch and it seems like the human torch is having to sort a of party at his mansion or something like that and Peter doesn't take kindly to how the Human Torch flaunts around, how awesome he is, and his fans and all that. So Peter makes a, a bat out of, you know, webbing and kind of like just, you know, swings it around, I guess. Or he made it like fly off of like a, off a net or something, kind of like a slingshot. And it makes, you know, the party guests kind of scared. 
and uh, you know Johnny tries to attack it and gets webbed in the process and this kind of like tits the Human Torch off even the guests themselves are a little tipped off that Spider-Man is being so tacky you know in coming to the Human Torch's party and doing something like this and the Human Torch is not happy so after Spider-Man meets a show of himself he tries to exit the building basically and gets the Human Torch to follow him where they have a fight on a beach and this fight is pretty interesting we get to see the Human Torch utilize you know his heat abilities Spider-Man Spider tries to use sand to get him to like cool down uh, but this just gets the Human Torch even more mad and he uses these type of like fire discs to try to attack Spider-Man he eventually does this giant fireball and Spider-Man tries to escape but when Spider-Man tries to escape he realizes that the rest of the Fantastic Four are watching their battle and he gets kind of tipped off that they're laughing at him thinking he doesn't have a chance against the Human Torch and they basically tell him that he might have bitten more than he can chew so he gets in a fight with Mr. Fantastic and the Thing, and it's a really interesting battle. But Sue Storm grabs you know Peter while being invisible and tells him that he needs to chill out. And she even kind of like flirts with Spider Man, saying that he's probably more handsome under the mask, and it's just pretty funny. Eventually, she wants the human torch of Spider Man to make up, and Spider Man just you know leaves, saying that they're all uncool except you know for uh, you know the human torch's sister Sue. And he actually webs out a heart for her uh, and you can tell that Mr. Fantastic was not happy that Sue was flirting with Spider-Man saying that you know he's probably handsome under the mask. He's like crossing his arms on the panel when she says that. It's pretty funny and that's how the issue ends and uh, you know that was just like a little mini story. It feels definitely like a little filler that they put in there just for fan service for people that want to see Spider-Man take on the Fantastic Four again because people probably love that in issue one and it you know shows that back then in the 60s that they would do stuff like this to please the fans and that's awesome and i wish we'd see more stuff like that in modern comic books and you know just doing a little bit of fan service isn't doesn't really harm anybody as long as you know keep to the plot uh in the main story you should be fine uh which we saw with the spider-man versus the living brain so this story starts off with peter uh tending to aunt may who has been kind of sick and while he's worrying about anime, we get to see that I believe his name is Matt Dillon, who is Electro, uh, building up his energy, his electricity, to go do some robbery. And yeah, he goes to steal from some uh, bank trucks, I believe, and he is successful. And Peter actually finds out that his aunt is actually in the hospital and that she'll have to be there for a little bit. And he goes on and continues with his studies and the stuff like the bullying and that is just really not worth it today so he kind of just leaves without saying anything to anyone not even trying to defend himself and flash notices this and realizes that something's wrong with peter that maybe he shouldn't have you know been so hard on him and we're starting to see a little bit of a shift and flash even says that after their fight in the last issue that we got to see that you know he's starting to respect Peter a lot more so it seems like Flash is making a little bit of changes but he's still a little bit of a bully but yeah Peter goes and talks to Aunt May and we're seeing that Betty Brandt is there with Aunt May showing that her and Peter seem to have started some type of relationship and Peter is you know Betty is worried, worried about Peter and it's really cool to see that someone you know is taking their time uh, to put Peter in their life and this is like Peter's first real relationship it seems in this comic uh, which is really cool to see because Peter does definitely deserve somebody uh, and Betty is just a really cool person very nice person and her being there for Aunt May is really cool and nice to see now Matt's Dylan you know Electro attacks uh, J. Jonah Jameson as well as goes to a bank uh, that J. Jonah Jameson is at and steals from them basically so Spider-Man uh, shows up eventually. I'm not sure if he was just patrolling uh, throughout the city, but he actually takes on Electro and Electro uses the power of electricity and Spider-Man hasn't made a suit that is re uh, resistant to electricity. So when he tries to grab Electro, he gets shot and you know, this is enough of a shot to kill any normal human. Uh, so it's really interesting that Spider-Man was able to survive. Now we get to learn that uh, Electro's bad story is that he was working on some type of telephone pole or something and a lightning had hit it and it, it granted him like electricity powers which is you know pretty comic booky. I mean in real life you would you get murked uh, you know if this happened to you and you were touching a telephone pole uh, but this granted Electro his powers 
and he uses these powers for evil, basically to steal from Banks and stuff, to rob. And Electro gets a ton of goons, I guess, from, I guess, the prison. And he tries to free all of them. So Peter leaves Aunt May at the hospital, he even talks to Betty real quick, and he leaves. And he gets into his outfit, you know, his costume, and he goes to the prison, and he takes on all these prison people, as well as fighting against Electro. And their battle is really interesting, because it cuts between Spider-Man fighting against Electro, and also having to fight against these inmates, these prison inmates. And Peter comes up with the idea to use a water hose, or some type of water hose, to use on Electro, short-circuiting his power, you know, kind of like a battery short-circuits Electro and he knocks him out with this, you know, electric shock. And, and this basically just, you know, puts it to where Starring can give him to the police. And it looks like Electro is going to prison. Now, Peter was able to get pictures of Electro versus Spider-Man and gives them to J. Jonah Jameson after J. Jonah Jameson said that he was gonna sue Peter or something like that, pretty funny stuff. And yeah, it's really cool because, you know, J. Jonah Jameson you know, changes his tune real fast when he sees what Peter has brought him. And it seems like, you know, Peter's gonna continue to work for J. Jonah Jameson. And him and Betty get into a little bit of a fight. And they kind of have like a little bit of a disagreement with him not trusting her or something like that, you know, not putting her first between his job. And it's just, you know, it's really cool because Betty is older than Peter and she realizes this, that Peter's still in high school. And at the end, they actually, you know, a walk together and you know Peter sees Aunt May and sees that you know the doctor said that she can go home in a few days and it's really cool just she seems worried about Betty Brandt showing that you know she's a really good fit for Peter and it's just one of those situations where Peter is a younger guy and Betty's you know a little older than him an older woman that has had relationships and that this is like Peter's first relationship and it's showing that at the two, at the end, with the two walking together, that they're working through their differences and these problems and these arguments that they're going to have. And it's just really cool to see these problems that they're having are getting dealt with as adults. And it shows Peter's maturity, uh, learning that just because he's Spider-Man, he does still have to deal with normal human problems, such as relationships. And yeah, that's how the issue ends. And hopefully you can see more of Betty and uh, Peter's relationship in the future as Peter and Betty are amazing as a couple, at least right now. So this story starts off with a heist with a couple of criminals uh, led by the big man called the Enforcers. And right off the bat, this issue starts out with Spider-Man trying to thwart their attempt at a heist. And he actually fails in his attempt to stop them. And they were able to outsmart Spider-Man. And the people below actually saw him, you know, get, you know, kind of like owned by these criminals. So Spider-Man definitely feels a little bit uh, disappointed in himself uh, for letting, you know, his guard down for these, you know, little criminals in his mind. And yeah, so we get to see who these criminals are. They're known as the Enforcers. And they're kind of like split up into four different members. We have Ox, which is like the giant strong dude. We have Montana, which is the guy with the lasso. And then we also have, I believe his name is uh, Fancy Dan, who has like a judo uh, black belt and he's very fast on his feet. And we also have the leader of the game, uh, the big man, who wears this type of like white mask. And yeah. So Peter is at the hospital with Aunt May, and it turns out that he's going to have to do a blood transfusion uh, for his aunt, and he realizes that this could be bad because they might recognize that his blood might be mutated and could give away his uh, secret identity as Spider-Man. But Flash and Liz, which really surprises Peter that Flash came to visit his Aunt May, kind of showing that he does care for Peter in a little bit. It seems like he's slowly changing as the issues go on, and eventually they will become friends. And yeah, he kind of like blows it off as Liz just, you know, forcing him to come with her. But I'm pretty sure Flash does care about Peter, and he's starting to show more respect for Peter and his family. Uh, so that's really nice. And yeah, so Peter basically gets, you know, made fun of by Flash saying, you know, why is he scared of, you know, a big, uh, bad needle? And eventually Peter realizes that Liz is right, that he has to do this for his Aunt May in order for her to survive. So he goes through with it and he does the blood transfusion as the doctor does it for them. And it seems like Aunt May is going to be okay, but she'll have to stay in the hospital or I think she like goes off, uh, with her family, uh, to Florida or something like that. 
So the big man is continuing to, you know, do his reign of terror on the city. And it turns out that Betty Brandt actually borrowed money, it seems, from the big man or at least one of his groups. So the enforcers show up and they tell Betty that if the, she doesn't pay up, they're going to do some really bad stuff uh, to her and the people that she loves. And yeah, Peter steps in and tries to save uh, Betty, but he can't, you know, do anything about the situation as he'll give off his identity as Spider-Man. So he has to play as, you know, a very weak dude. And it's pretty crazy because Betty does say that she'll pay the money and not to hurt Peter. It shows how much she cares about him. So Peter gets into his Spider-Man costume and goes and finds the guy that pointed out Betty for the Enforcers and gets information from him on where the Enforcers are at. So Peter arrives and is a surprise attack by Montana that uses his lasso to kind of grab Spider-Man and bring him through the window that they're at. And Spider-Man engages in a battle with all the members of the Enforcers. Otz does a really well job against Spider-Man being super strong and Fancy Dan is pretty fast and even surprises Spider-Man and you know how fast he is but Spider-Man's reflexes are allowing him to fight against multiple opponents at once even though you know it's a very hard thing to do and he's going through like Montana's ropes and stuff and he's landing you know punches on uh you know Otz. Otz even mentions that he's always wanted to land a haymaker on you know spider-man and he just takes a beating because he's fighting you know three on one and the big man i guess uh, gets away or something like that and peter i guess cuts out the lights or the big man cuts out the lights and peter makes his escape kind of like reeling from his battle but he does check in on betty trying to figure out why she's keeping this a secret from him and it seems like this is driving a wedge in the relationship so we'll see how that plays out later eventually peter realizes that J. Jonah jameson i guess was talking to the big man or at least his group or groups that were associated with them so he actually arrives at their base it seems and he takes all of uh, their goons on and eventually gets in a battle with the big man himself trying not to get you know killed and he fights fancy dan he fights uh ox and he fights you know all the enforcers montana as well and eventually the big man says that he's not like spider-man and that he will not play by his rules he won't fight by his rules that he knows when to make an exit so he actually escapes now peter goes to the daily bugle and sees J. Jonah jameson talking to uh, one of the guys that i guess works for him and it turns out that a police officer shows up and peter thinks that J. Jonah jameson might actually be the big man himself kind of showing a little bit of a bias that you really want J. Jonah jameson to be the big man that way he doesn't have to deal with his rhetoric uh, anymore. But it turns out that, you know, it wasn't, you know, J. Jonah Jameson, that it was actually Foswell. And Foswell comes clean and says that, you know, it's true that the police did find his outfit and his mask, I guess. And it turns out that he used, you know, modified shoes to make himself look bigger as well as his coat to make him look bigger. And he was like the perfect disguise. And he almost got away with it, except, you know, he has some really uh, crummy luck. And at the end, Spider-Man has to admit that he was kind of biased and they shouldn't have, uh, you know, thought that it was J. Jonah Jameson without any, you know, facts or even evidence at all. And J. Jonah Jameson wants Foswell to say that Spider-Man was in cahoots with him, but Foswell just says that, you know, I'll worry about it all the way to jail. And yeah, the issue ends with Peter, you know, and J.J. Both, basically both learning a lesson and with J.J., learning as well that you should have evidence before you start making all these accusations because it's hurting his reputation you know and, and the newspaper of the daily bugle uh, so he's dealing with that and he's learning that lesson and while that's happening peter arrives and checks his mail i guess and realizes that betty brand hasn't you know actually sent him any type of letter saying where she's at and he's afraid that she doesn't you know care about him and remember this is peter's first relationship it seems in high school and he's not a full-on adult yet so he's really taking this hard thinking that you know she really just you know uh ghosted him basically but we get to see uh what's happening with betty brandt that she's actually very uh heartbroken that she's not able to tell peter what's going on she just wishes that there's a way she can get spider-man's aid so i'm guessing this will all come together in the next few issues uh, so we'll keep a lookout on this uh plot line and that was the end of the issue you know asking us the question will betty brandt find out the secret identity uh, Spider-Man and what is the strange secret of Betty Brandt which um, I think will be pretty interesting to you know talk about when we get it in the next few issues as it looks like that's what's going to be happening 
So this story starts off with a flashback of Dr. Octopus's and Spider-Man's last encounter. And yeah, we also get to see that Spider-Man is working on a new type of, I think it's like a tracking device. And it turns out that Dr. Octopus actually gets out of prison on good behavior. And he's actually, it seems, uh, meeting up with Betty Branch. He's driving him somewhere. So Spider-Man uses his, I guess, spider tracer to find out where they're heading towards. And this is where we get revealed to uh, to Betty Brandt's brother. And he's like a type of lawyer that's dealing with a criminal called Blackie. And yeah, so we get to see Betty Brandt and her brother interact with Dr. Octopus. With Dr. Octopus basically telling her brother that he understands what he is. That this guy called Bennett, you know, Betty Brandt's brother, uh, it's just like a coward, basically, can never really stand up for himself and got himself in some bad company. And yeah, so Betty Brand is out in the town whenever she gets confronted by Peter Parker. And he basically tells her that he's here to support her and that he wasn't, you know, super mad at her for what she did, you know, kind of ghosting him the last few days or weeks. And yeah, we get to see that Dr. Octopus goes and frees Blackie out of his prison cell. And they're going to start working together again. And... We see that they kind of have like a deal in place, you know, for Dr. Octopus to get paid. The Spider-Man arrives at the place that Betty Brand, uh, Bennett, uh, Blackie, and Dr. Octopus, as well as uh, Blackie's henchmen are at. And Spider-Man gets in a battle with all of these people. Eventually, him and Blackie get into a type of fight. And Blackie has a gun in his, in his hand. And he accidentally shoots uh, Bennett during him and Spider-Man's fight. And Bennett basically gets killed, and Betty kind of blames Spider-Man for, you know, getting Bennett killed. So Spider-Man is kind of like in a rage, and he, you know, grabs Black and basically, you know, uh, tells him that he's going to take him out, and he's going to put him back in prison. And Dr. Octopus and Spider-Man get into a confrontation, because uh, Dr. Octopus wants revenge for Spider-Man putting him in jail in, uh, you know, their last encounter. And the fight is pretty interesting with Spider-Man having a fight against Dr. Octopus's new improved uh, tentacle arms. And the fight is pretty interesting and we get to see Spider-Man, you know, have to outwit uh, Dr. Octopus. He's just too strong still. And him and Spider-Man basically are just fighting each other, you know. They're fighting each other on this boat. And eventually the police show up and Spider-Man knots uh, Dr. Octopus, I guess off uh the boat as well as himself whenever the boat crashes into one of the piers i think or like some type of like wooden uh things that are holding i guess the bridge and yeah spider-man you know makes his escape so the police don't try to capture him and we also get to see that betty is basically you know crying because bennett's dead and blackie is going back to jail so spider-man has saved the day but dr octopus has gotten away uh, so we get to see Spider-Man, you know, kind of like thinking about everything that went down with his battle with Dr. Octopus, Blackie, and his henchmen. And he goes and confronts, you know, uh, and comforts Betty Brand. And he realizes, you know, because she basically tells him that she doesn't blame Spider-Man, that she was kind of talking out of anger and loss for her brother. And that she kind of forgives Spider-Man, but she just can't bear to look at him because, you know, it would just remind her of uh, Bennett, you know, dying uh, because of Blackie and Spider-Man's fight. And, you know, Blackie basically killed him. So Spider-Man, you know, Peter Parker basically says there's no way you can tell Betty Brant about his secret identity because she won't ever want to see him again. It would just be too hard for her because of these memories. And Spider-Man walks out into, you know, the night once again, like he does in some, uh, a lot of these issues, uh, these early issues of Spider-Man in his run. And that's how the story ends with Peter just realizing that, you know, there's people that might die when he gets into these fights and these battles with his uh, super villains. And yeah, it's just you know, crazy. And I'm glad that we're seeing that there are consequences to Peter's actions and his fights that he gets into for his loved ones. So this story starts off with Dr. Octopus uh, going out and coming out of jail basically and going straight back into robbing banks and stuff like that. Eventually Dr. Octopus realizes that Spider-Man hasn't came looking for him and decides that he needs to do something to get Spider-Man's attention because he wants to get revenge on him for sending him to jail last time. Now we get to see that while Peter, Betty Brandt, and J. Jonah Jameson are working at the Daily Bugle, um, they basically get attacked by Dr. Octopus, and he takes Betty Brandt a hostage, so, uh, leaving uh, Peter and J. Jonah Jameson to basically figure out what to do with 
Dr. Awesome is basically telling Jonah to, you know, send someone to take pictures of Spider-Man getting defeated by him. Uh, so that's how Peter gets to that area without anyone kind of figuring out that him and Spider-Man are the same person. And yeah, Peter eventually shows up and him and Dr. Octopus get into a fight and Betty Brand is able to escape. Now, during this battle, we get to see them kind of like throw hands at each other and eventually Spider-Man is defeated and is unmasked in front of Betty Brand, J. Jonah Jameson and a police officer or police officers. And it turns out that it's Peter Parker now. Dr. Octopus kind of believes that this is all a farce, um, and that's why Spider-Man didn't really put up a fight, because Spider-Man's punches were not knocking out Dr. Octopus, which is very weird, because Dr. Octopus knows that Spider-Man has super strength. Dr. Octopus is, you know, a genius, so he knows something was up, and it turns out that Peter actually had some sort of, like, an illness. He was kind of sick, uh, you know, on this day, and that's why his spider powers were kind of going in and out. And yeah, Spider-Man apparently has that type of weakness that when he gets sick, his powers kind of like go in and out or something like that. Um, so he basically gets, you know, scot free from this and Jonah and Betty and the officers basically think that he put on the suit just to fool Dr. Octopus and to save uh, Betty Brand himself, basically. Uh, kind of saving his identity in the process because they don't believe that this is actually Spider-Man uh, because, you know, his strength was all gone. So Dr. Octopus gets mad and throws Spider-Man to J Jonah Jameson and the police officers. And they basically, you know, just feel good that he's just fine, you know, instead of Jonah wondering why exactly Spider-Man, you know, didn't show up. He even says that he wants to yell at Parker, but he won't do it because the police are there. and doesn't want to make him look bad or something like that. Uh, we get to see, you know, Peter getting taken care of by a doctor and Aunt May, and eventually he gets back to his normal self uh, the next morning. He has like a 24-hour bug or something like that. So Dr. Octopus comes up with an idea to free some of the zoo animals that were in the nearby uh, zoo, the New York Zoo, and Spider-Man has to round up these animals and save the civilians as well as the zookeepers from all these wild animals. Eventually, him and Dr. Octopus get into another fight, and this fight is pretty interesting. It has a lot of good choreography to it, especially for a 60s uh, comic. And eventually, Spider-Man, with his strength back, he just, you know, attacks Dr. Octopus. And eventually, they go into, like, this type of uh, place, this type of building. And their battle gets to, at such a level that, you know, there's fire that's erupting uh, from explosions that were caused uh, by their fight. And eventually, a giant statue falls on top of Dr. Octopus, and he calls out for help for Spider-Man to not let him die here, but Spider-Man has to escape before he actually gets killed himself. And he escapes, you know, using his web fluid and to create like some type of shield all over his body or something like that. And he's able to escape with his life. And he does believe that Dr. Dr. Octopus will get saved by the police and the fire department. And it does turn out that they were able to save Dr. Octopus. And he basically says that next time he fights, you know, Spider-Man, it will be the end. You will be able to beat him. And, you know, the police officers basically just tease him, saying that, you know, that's what he always says. And hopefully, you know, he thinks this next time will be different, but we know that probably won't be the case. And the story ends with Peter basically telling, you know, um, what's her name? Liz Allen. That, you know, he doesn't really want to go on a date and that he has somewhere he needs to be or something like that. I think he says he has a date with uh, Betty Brand or something. Uh, so it looks like they are dating after all Betty Brand and Peter, uh, which is really cool. And I think we saw that in the last issue, you know, with her brother and that. Um, if you remember the last issue, I think they were already dating. Um, and, you know, Liz actually says to Flash that, you know, they have treated him pretty bad, you know, this entire, you know, high school uh, life, basically. His entire time in high school, they've treated him bad. And that she's not really mad that Peter has finally found someone and, you know, kind of doesn't want to be with her. Um, and it's just, you know, Flash kind of mad about this whole thing as well. Uh, but hopefully they all become friends in the future, and I believe they do. So we'll see how that plays out. And you know, the story just pretty much ends like that, you know, with Peter just feeling good. And, you know, that he was able to save the day again. And he's going to go on that date with Betty, it seems. And that's how the story ends. So this story starts off with Spider-Man supposedly robbing, I guess, a bank. And he actually ties up some of the police officers that are kind of like, um, you know, running after him, chasing after him. With some of his web fluid, his webs. And yeah, he basically gets away with a web a parachute. Now, the next day, the first uh, paper, you know, the first page of the Daily Beetle basically is talking about Spider-Man and him supposedly robbing, I guess, a bank or something. So, 
Peter Parker basically starts freaking out, wondering what exactly is happening. Could he actually be doing this like sleepwalking type thing? Because how could someone else have spider powers like him, asserting he got his in an accident? And yeah, so he basically gets, you know, into costume and he tries to go find out from a psychiatrist on exactly what uh, could be happening to him. And he basically almost gives up his secret identity when he realizes that he has to find a different way to deal with what's happening. There has to be another explanation for what exactly uh, is happening with this Spider-Man figure, you know, that's, that's apparently stole uh, from somewhere, and we get to see that Betty Brandt and Peter basically get into a little bit of an argument, with Peter kind of just frustrated with what's happening and not knowing exactly who this Spider-Man uh, figure is that's, you know, pretending to be him. Could it be the Chameleon or someone else? Um, because we do know the Chameleon has tried to frame Peter before, uh, so this is kind of happening again. And Betty does mention that, you know, Peter never has talked to her this way before, and Peter recently goes to talk to J. Jonah Jameson, and yeah. So while Peter is talking to J. Jonah Jameson, or you know, sometime after, Mysterio appears in uh, J. Jonah Jameson's office, basically tells him that he wants to be paid in exchange for taking out Spider-Man for Jonah, so, or JJ. And yeah, so him and Spider-Man basically get in a fight on, I think it's the Brooklyn Bridge, and none of Spider-Man's spider abilities are able to face off against Mysterio because his webbing actually is just getting disintegrated by Mysterio's uh, powers, and Mysterio uses his power of illusions to basically uh, put some smoke screen, like a fog, and just start attacking Spider-Man from different angles. Spider-Man's spider sense not able to figure out where exactly Mysterio's at. Eventually, Spider-Man uh, gets knocked off uh, the Brooklyn Bridge where he jumps off, and Mysterio is trying to like crown the winner by J. Joe Jameson. And this kind of like teats, you know, Peter uh, down a few pits, basically makes him rethink how powerful he actually is. And yeah, he uses a spider tracer on the next day whenever Mysterio shows up to, um, you know, want to get paid by J. Jonah Jameson. And Peter basically uses the spider tracer to figure out where exactly Mysterio's uh, base is at, his hideout, and they get into another fight, their second fight. And Peter uses his spider senses because somehow he's able to use it better uh, this time, and he's able to figure out where Mysterio's at, and he basically attacks him. Eventually, this fight uh, goes on for a few pages, and Peter eventually is able to take some pictures of his fight with Mysterio, and he's able to tie up Mysterio after he knocks him out, and he takes him to the police, apparently. And J. John Jameson basically, you know, Peter was able to get a confession from Mysterio before they started fighting, or while they were fighting, and he was able to clear his name with the police, and J. John Jameson says, now Jonah is going to have to... Uh, do like uh, I don't know what you would call it. It's basically he has to like, tell the uh, public that you know he was wrong in the news in his newspaper. And Spider-Man basically ties Jonah up, saying that he better you know clear his name in the newspaper because he, he's been telling lies about him. And that's how the story ends with Peter basically uh, getting teased by Flash, saying, you know, because Peter was trying to make it where people couldn't figure out his secret identity by going against Spider-Man. And Flash is a huge Spider-Man fan, and the issue ends with Peter basically swinging throughout New York City, saying how awesome would it be if he could tell Flash that his favorite superhero is actually Peter Parker. And that's how the issue ends. So this story starts off with a person basically working on their broom uh, glider basically and they get dressed up as the green goblet so we don't know who this person actually is and they basically meet up with the enforcers and tell them that they want to work together to take on and take out spider-man so spider-man basically is in the city and the green goblin shows up and spider-man thinks that he's a villain so he basically attacks the Green Goblin, and the Green Goblin acts like he's an actor uh, for a movie. So he tells Spider-Man to meet uh, this movie producer, basically. The movie producer offers Spider-Man a few thousand dollars. So Spider-Man says that there's no way that he can uh, refuse because it's, you know, $50,000. This will make it to where Aunt May will never have to worry again. And he basically takes the deal uh, with the producer. 
Now, Peter basically plays it off uh, at the Daily Bugle that he wants to go take pictures of Spider-Man in this motion picture, you know, get some behind-the-scenes uh, photos, it seems. And Betty is basically kind of nervous that Peter will try to get with one of the uh, movie actresses and stuff like that. And this is a very common trope with Betty's character. Uh, she also notices that Peter's been walking with Liz Allen as well uh, at his college. And it just seems like, uh, you know, that this is, you know, how Betty's character is playing out. I don't know. Is, is Peter in college already? I don't think so. I think he's in uh, high school still. But, yeah, so uh, I don't know how I feel about Betty's character constantly being, you know, jealous and stuff and overthinking things, but I guess that's just how her character is. So Jonah basically gives uh, Peter the okay to go take photos of Spider-Man at the photo shoot. Now, Peter gets the permission of Aunt May and basically heads out uh, to where the location is to film this movie. And while on set, he basically gets in a fight with the enforcers and the enforcers basically hit him you know ox hits him with all his force basically and spider-man basically says that if he does that again that he'll forget that this is just a movie and he basically realizes that this is actually a trap and he's basically getting attacked by all the enforcers in the green goblin now during their battle spider-man utilizes his spider abilities even breaks uh, montana's web with his as he says power of chest expansion uh, which was a really funny line and he's basically just getting tag teamed by all these enforcers and eventually he's able to make his way out of there and heads into a nearby cave now while he's in the cave he basically takes out all the enforcers one by one so it's just him and the green goblin left and they basically get in a battle with the green goblin using his pumpkin bombs always flying on his flying uh, broomstick and peter basically uses his webs to try to trap the green goblin and it basically goes back to fighting against the enforcers and kind of subdues them basically and while the green goblin and him get back into battle it's revealed that the Hulk is basically staying in this cave. So he gets in a fight with the Hulk and basically takes a hit from the Hulk. And he also tries to use his web to, you know, uh, stop the Hulk, basically subdue him. But he just rips it as if it was made out of paper. And like I said, he basically takes a hit from the Hulk that almost knocks him out. I mean, this barely hit Spider-Man and it almost knocked him out. Uh, but he fate, you know, he fates basically being damaged like a lot by the Hulk and gets, you know, out of the way from uh, getting hit uh, next to a boulder and basically makes his escape with his agility and spider-like reflexes. So Spider-Man and the Green Goblin basically go outside and Spider-Man tries to capture the Green Goblin but fails to do so and the Green Goblin escapes as Spider-Man stays in a puddle of water basically, you know, a, a little lake or something like that. And the Green Goblin thinks it's because, you know, he's scared of him. But it's revealed to us that Spider-Man is scared of the Hulk because the Hulk is still around the area. And he would have saw Spider-Man had he came up, it seems, from the water. Now, Spider-Man could have left the Enforcers to stay in the cave, but uh, he knew the Hulk found them. He probably killed them and that. So he goes in to rescue the Enforcers and he leaves them for the police uh, to capture, basically. And, you know, the issue ends with Spider-Man basically getting ripped off by the movie producer, basically telling him that he's not going to use him for the movie anymore and that it's canceled and that he has someone else that he wants to use for the movie. You know, make a movie about, basically. But he does pay Spider-Man enough to give himself back to New York City. And we're basically shown the Green Goblin go back to his hideout and basically take off his mask. And we're not shown, you know, his face is covered. So we're not shown who exactly this is. Now, people that know Spider-Man know who the Green Goblin is. But we're going to keep it a secret while we're going through this, uh, you know, set of issues. Because I want to, you know, talk about it whenever it gets revealed, uh, you know, in the issue it's it. Uh, so we'll leave it a mystery for now. And that's just how the issue ends with Peter basically back in New York City. And he knows the Green Goblin is somewhere in the city as well, uh, but he doesn't know where. And even his spider uh, instinct isn't, you know, helping him in a way to where, you know, he knows exactly where he's at. But he knows that, you know, because it's going off, he knows that he could be anyone, basically. That he could be close by. But he needs to relax and just, you know, wait for the right opportunity. 
uh, for him and the Goblin to meet again, it seems. So him and the Green Goblin are definitely going to run in to each other again in the future. And hopefully we see that in future issues uh, in this run. And yeah, so this was how Stanley and Steve Ditko handled the Green Goblin's first introduction, and that was really good. So this story starts off with us seeing the Chameleon, and the Chameleon has hired the help of a person called Craven the Hunter, who is a hunter that comes from Africa that has hunted almost every animal uh, known to man, if I'm correct. And yeah, so we also get to see uh, during this introduction that we get to see that Betty Brandt is still having these jealousy issues with Peter Parker and Liz Allen. Um, we also get to see Flash in this uh, scene as well. And it's just, you know, pretty crazy. Now we get to see that Craven the Hunter goes off to fight against uh, some animals that escaped from the zoo. And I, I think it's the zoo that they came from. They were basically being loaded on like these crates and that, you know, uh, by these machines. And the machines, I guess, malfunction or something, and the animals uh, broke loose from their cages. So they're attacking civilians, or they're trying to attack civilians. So Peter makes his way out of the crowd and gets in his Spider-Man costume. And when he arrives, he sees that Kraken the Hunter is taking on different animals, such as, you know, King Cobras and uh, giant apes, and it's pretty interesting. Now, eventually, uh, Craven goes off, uh, you know, after he defeats all these animals, and he's just, you know, uh, prowling through the city, and he sees Spider-Man in action against some, I guess, gang members or something, and he's basically, you know, uh, foiling their plans. And Craven's just looking at how Spider-Man fights. Eventually, they actually get into a fight of themselves, and it's a really good fight scene. We get to see Craven's hand-to-hand -hand skills and his skills in using different types of weapons to take on animals. He actually lands a hit, which I'm not sure if it's just his uh, pure strength that he was able to damage Spider-Man's shoulder. So if so, then Craven's not a regular human because Spider-Man has, you know, super spider strength. Um, so I'm guessing it has something to do with like some poison, you know, something that he hit Spider-Man with. So, Craven basically attacks Spider-Man, and Spider-Man gets away uh, after, you know, getting hit by some type of poison or something that's making him dizzy, and he basically takes the L. Now, Craven goes to Chameleon, and Chameleon doesn't understand why Craven's so excited to fight someone like Spider-Man, and, you know, why does he find this, you know, just enjoyable, but Craven says that he likes the thrill of the hunt. And he can't wait to fight Spider-Man again. Now, we get to see Peter Parker and Betty Brant's relationship not doing so good because Betty's basically getting jealous over every single girl that Peter saw you to. It's very toxic, this relationship. I wasn't sure if this was the way the relationship was going to be in the last few issues as she has been showing signs of jealousy, but this is really not healthy. And I really hope that they kind of break up because it's just not working out between these characters. Um, and, you know, I understand why Betty's jealous because she's an older woman and Peter's, you know, still in high school, so she thinks he's going to get with a younger woman. But, you know, these are just things that, you know, you have to talk through in relationships and it's just not working. So, J. John Jameson talks to Craven the Hunter and tells him that he wants him to bring, I guess, Spider-Man into, you know, to the law and not to kill him or do something illegal because that will give J. John Jameson a bad name. And Craven basically tells him that no one talks to him like that and no one dictates what he does. Um, yeah, and Peter's basically, you know, getting, like, the jitters because of his recent loss to Craven and knowing that Craven's trying to hunt him down. Eventually, Craven goes off into, I believe it's the New York uh, City Zoo, and this is where they engage in their uh, final battle. Well, you know, not final battle, but, you know, their battle that will decide uh, who wins between these two, and, you know, in their first bout, I guess you could say. Their set of bouts. And yeah, so Spider-Man, you know, tries to fight against Kraven the Hunter. Kraven launches a trap on Spider-Man, but Spider-Man is able to escape. But he's caught in this device that basically tries to bring his shoulder to his, like, uh, I guess his ankle or his knees, I guess, his kneecap. And it's basically like a magnetic force that's trying to bring his, uh, his uh, shoulder and, well, his elbow and his um, kneecap to each other, basically. And it's, it's hindering Spider-Man's ability to fight. Eventually, Spider-Man's able to get uh, this type of, like, handcuff off. And he's able to fight against a Kraven, uh, despite the handicap that he has. He's not able to get it completely off, 
but he's able to make it to where they're not, you know, uh, trying to go at each other, basically. And the battle was pretty good, and eventually Spider-Man gets the upper hand when he realizes that the chameleon was actually impersonating Kraven to kind of throw Spider-Man off to make him think there was two Kravens. And when he figured out that, that the chameleon was one of them and revealed himself, uh, basically got him to reveal himself, uh, he got Kraven to basically run and try to get another strategy to take on Spider-Man, running into Spider-Man's web that he had placed, you know, in a certain spot. And he caught Kraven there and basically took off uh, the handcuffs that Kraven had put on him. And he got the police to, you know, capture the chameleon. As well as he left Craven there for the police to find as well. Now Peter gets the photos that he you know took of their battle and basically of the chameleon as well getting captured by the police. And J. John Jameson basically you know pays him what he's uh, gonna pay him and even offers him a slice of one of his favorite I guess desserts or something like that. I think it's like a chocolate bar. And we also get to see that you know that Peter's just not feeling. Uh, up to talk to Betty right now because they're just really having relationship problems. Uh, later on during the day, he finds out that, you know, uh, he was supposed to meet Mary Jane, which we know who that character is, a Spider fans, but she hasn't been introduced in this uh, comic yet, so we won't talk about her too much yet. But uh, she basically had to cancel because of a headache. And, and, you know, Peter goes to call Betty to see if she wants to hang out after all uh, because now he doesn't have to, you know, do this like dinner date with Mary Jane. Or this meetup, I guess to say, this introduction to her. And Betty basically just hangs up on him and doesn't give him the time of day. So he's basically, you know, saying that he'll just, he's just going to call Liz Allen, which shows the toxicity of their relationship. That he's willing to go hang out with this other woman just because Betty's mad at him, which shows the immaturity of Peter at this moment. And, you know, this is something he'll outgrow in the future, probably. So um, that's just how it is. And it turns out that. She's actually out dancing with Flash Thompson. So Peter's all by himself, basically here at home. So he goes out basically for, you know, a lookout um, of the city. And it turns out that the Chameleon and Craven are basically given a pass. And they're not going to be going to jail in New York City, but instead are getting deported to, it seems, uh, where Craven's from, Africa. So the Chameleon basically asks them if they're going to be coming back. And, you know, Craven says that he's going to be training in the Congo uh, jungles and basically is going to get stronger and then come back to defeat Spider-Man. So we'll definitely we'll see uh, Kraven basically come back to fight Spider-Man in the future as well as the Chameleon. So that's pretty cool. And the issue ends really funny with Spider-Man basically saying that he wishes he could be on that ship uh, not knowing that two of the people that he had just fought against were on that ship. And that's how the issue ends. Welcome back, my students, to a brand new episode of Comic Class. And today is also guys really at Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's The Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number One: The Sinister Six. This is the final video for the Stan Lee Steve Ditko run that's going to be on the channel. Now, this doesn't mean it's the final time we're going to be talking about the run, but as far as covering it, like going through the issues and even this annual, going over the Sinister Sits original story, um, this will be it. Um, so it's a very big video. Um, we're talking about maybe over nine hours of uh, content that's been recorded for this run, and I can't believe we're finally at the end of it. So uh, for this big video, I hope you guys enjoy. Be sure to like the video, show your support. Um, as we're going to be jumping into the John Romita Senior uh, era slash run, um, hopefully by next week. And that's going to be a pretty good um, you know, series of videos to be talking about. And I'll be going through it for the first time myself as I haven't read that era either. Um, so that will truly be different for the channel because I had already read the Stanley Steve Ditko run um, before I started making these videos like, like years ago. Um, so this will be completely different as we're going through John Romita because it will be all new even to me. And it's going to be a whole different atmosphere of videos. Um, but without further ado, let's jump right into today's story and let's finish off the St. Lee Steve Dicker run. And yeah, let's get started with this story. So this story basically starts off with Dr. Octopus in prison and the prison guards basically find a way to take off his mechanical arms from him. Um, they basically think that he's helpless now and just a regular dude, but Dr. Octopus explains that since he had uh, this type of connection with his mechanical arms, he can actually control it in small distances without um, having it to be on him. So that's pretty interesting. 
So he basically is able to break himself out of prison um, and break out the bars and stuff. And while that's happening, we get to see that um, Spider-Man goes to J. Jameson and he basically grabs one of his papers from his desk um, as J. Jonah Jameson sees that Spider-Man stealing it from him and um, he basically goes off on a web um, on this like, uh, I don't know what it would be, like a light pole and stuff and basically he's just sitting there reading the paper. So I thought that was pretty interesting and we get to see that he realizes that Dr. Octopus has escaped. Um, we also get to see that Peter has an uh, altercation with Flash Thompson, and he basically uh, uses spider sense to basically dodge uh, Flash's punch. And Flash isn't able to stop as Doctor Strange is walking past him, and he basically goes through him. And Doctor Strange basically says that this is like his ectoplasmic uh, spirit form that you know he sees in front of him. So there's no way he can actually hit him physically. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. And we get a lot of cameos from different Marvel heroes in this uh, special. But we're not really going to be talking about most of them because they're not really that important to the plot in the story. So um, we get to see that Spider Man's Spider Sense is going off. It's revealed to us that the Sandman has been summoned, as well as other members of the Sister Sits basically go talk with Dr. Octopus for a meeting. So Spider-Man basically goes back home after he couldn't, you know, find Sandman, and he doesn't know what Sandman at the moment, um, or why, you know, Sandman is going to meet up with Dr. Octopus, to, to, and that Dr. Octopus is doing, like, this giant meeting with different villains to meet the Sinister Six, but he basically goes home, and he sees that Aunt May is basically in the attic and crying over Uncle Ben, and this leads, uh, Peter to basically leave the house and go up to a building top and basically realize that he feels guilty about Uncle Uncle Ben basically being dead because of him. And we get a little bit of the bad story of how you know Spider-Man became Spider-Man. We all know the story. And he goes off and he basically tries to grab onto like this little like uh, I don't know what you call it. I think it's called like a chumpy pole or something. And he basically realizes that he can barely hold on to it. And it seems like his spider strength is basically leaving him. And this is very similar to the plot of Spider-Man 2. So I'm guessing they got it from this uh, comic. And yeah, so we get to see that the Sinister Six arrives, basically at Dr. Octopus's meeting spot, and they basically plan how they're going to take out Spider-Man, and Dr. Octopus comes up with the idea that they're going to fight him one at a time, to basically try, because they all have the ego of wanting to be Spider-Man themselves, and not really work together as a team, but Dr. Octopus comes with a with them comes up with a plan to basically try to get Spider-Man to be worn out and basically be able to be defeated by one of them, um, even if it takes all the way to Dr. Octopus to basically get it done. So they basically grab papers and they uh, show the number that they have in the order that they're going to be going in. And we'll see this as the issue goes by. Now, after that, we get to see that Electro and Sandman basically go and they capture um, Aunt May and Betty Brand and basically uh, J. Jonah Jameson sees that the Sandman and Electro have uh, taken them and uh, Don Rathavis basically puts on the disguise of being a very uh, nice gentleman so Amy doesn't expect that he's basically a evil supervillain um, but Betty kind of knows that this guy basically is a supervillain. Now Peter goes and he talks to J. Jonah Jameson and basically tells him about what he saw and then he doesn't care if he believes him or not. Uh, the Vulture recently comes and lets Peter know and J. John Jameson uh, through the window that this is true and that um, Peter needs to contact Spider-Man to basically try to save uh, Aunt May and Betty uh, Brand. So he basically goes and he realizes that he doesn't have his spider powers at the moment. He's trying to get killed if he doesn't. If he does ghost, but he realizes that if he doesn't, then innocent people are right and die. So he goes, he gets in his uh, costume, Spider-Man costume, he goes in order to fight the first person, which is revealed to be Electro. Now Electro basically uh, is at a, like, a power plant, and this amps his powers up to a ridiculous amount, and he basically tries to kill Spider-Man in one shot, and throws like a lightning bolt at him, but he's able to dodge it. And when he dodges it, he realizes that, you know, no normal human can basically dodge, you know, lightning like that. So his spider powers are basically bad uh, because now he believes that he needs to be Spider-Man. And it seemed like it was his own self-doubt that basically took out his spider powers. So um, it's very important that he basically believes that he can do stuff and that he accepts his responsibility. And then that was a really good plot point uh, for this book. As you know, um, not everything in this book is basically in the video. 
um, because I do recommend people to read the uh, stories for themselves. So this is definitely a major plot point in the book, and you definitely should read it to get the full uh, amount of panels that were dedicated um, to him not having his powers and stuff like that. Very important uh, for his character uh, going forward, and you know, very a big important character moment for the character in general. Uh, but he basically is fighting against Electro, and Electro is just powering himself up with, uh, you know, the power plant uh, uh, lines that are there, and Spider-Man eventually defeats Electro by landing, like, a right hook on him, like a haymaker, and he basically leaves Electro there, and Iron Man shows up as well, as cameos from the Fantastic Four as well on panel, he basically leaves Electro for Iron Man to take to jail or something like that, and yeah, eventually he uses the, um, the letter that uh, Electro drops when he gets knocked out and he has on him. And every time Spider-Man defeats uh, one of his villains, they basically have a letter, like a page, that tells where the next location is for the next villain. So he uses this to find his next villain, which is Kraven the Hunter. Now, Kraven basically uses him and his, I guess they're like leopards, I think they're leopards, and they basically attack uh, Spider-Man in like a, like a three-man uh, formation. And it's a really cool action scene. We get really cool splash pages for every single villain fight, which I thought was an amazing uh, direction by Steve Ditko in his artwork. Um, very good scene. Eventually, Spider-Man defeats Traven, and he almost gets help from uh, the Human Torch as he offers his help. But he basically tells him that he wants to do this alone. This is a personal fight. And I thought that was a really cool scene for the character. It shows that he does want to fight his own battles. But he's not afraid to get help when it's too uh, much. But he knows he can take this. So I thought that was really cool. Um, we also get to see that Dr. Octopus is treating Aunt Me and Betty Brant well. And Peter basically goes into the next villain fight, which he doesn't know. He doesn't have the names of the villains that he's fighting in order. He's basically just is told the location of this battle. So he goes into a spot where it seems like the Edsmen are at, and they basically start attacking Spider-Man. And Spider-Man knows something's not right because the Edsmen are heroes, and they wouldn't be, you know, attacking him like this. So Spider-Man basically uh, fights them and realizes that they're just uh, robots, but they are very strong, uh, you know, in and of themselves. In that people like Cyclops' uh, um, optic beam, his optic blast, basically is still uh, dangerous, even though it's just a replication. And eventually, um, Peter defeats all of them, and he goes and he takes off this metal, uh, like, barred uh, wall of iron, and he basically uh, goes through it, or he breaks through it. Um, I think it was just an illusion, saying so it was a way to make him not think he could get through it. And he goes through it, and he sees that Mysterio is behind all this, and he realizes that that's why he was able to replicate the Esmen so well, because it was all like an illusion. He was able to make these robots make them seem like they were real. Um, we get a really cool uh, splash page yet again with Spider-Man basically landing uh, punches on uh, his villains. He basically knocks out Mysterio, gets the letter from Mysterio and he goes off to the next battle, which is the Sandman. Now, his battle with Sandman is pretty interesting. Um, eventually, uh, we get a really cool splash page of him landing hits on Sandman, but this isn't knocking him out. Eventually, Sandman comes up with a plan and a trap, and he puts him and uh, Spider-Man in like this like uh, airtight, um, giant like metal uh, cage. Like It's like this little box that's like just enough for them to be in. And he basically thinks that he can trap Spider-Man and take him out, but before he can kind of like corner him and get him to tire out, he basically tires out first and it's revealed to us that because it's airtight, he basically ran out of oxygen in the bots and he could have killed himself as well as Spider-Man eventually, as Spider-Man's able to hold his breath longer than regular people because of his uh, superpowers and his increased strength, I guess, he increased his air supply or something. Um, and at least this is what Spider-Man tells us, they can his breath longer than a normal person. But he's able to open the door and allow, uh, you know, Flint Marco, uh, the same, and basically to survive this battle. I just he would have killed both of them, basically, as Spider-Man not opened, uh, the, the airtight, uh, metal box. So, uh, the next thing that happens, he gets the card, is that Spider-Man got in the card during the battle with Sandman, I believe he got it first thing before the battle even started. And he goes and he fights against uh, the Vulture. And the Vulture uses a very uh, a useful tactic in that he, you know, tries not to fight Spider-Man with him with his uh, his web cartridges on. So he basically gets him to remove his web cartridges and tries to come up with the plan to basically get him to fall to his death. 
Um, and because Spider-Man can stick to walls, he's able to kind of like outmaneuver uh, the Vulture. The Vulture tries to grab him by his leg, but he reverses this and grabs the Vulture's leg as well. Um, or I think he took it off of himself and then grabbed the Vulture's leg. And he basically gets on top of him and is able to take him out, basically, uh, make it to where, you know, they'll both fall to their deaths. So the Vulture has to give up in the feet uh, so that he doesn't die as well. And Spider-Man basically just webs him up um, after he gets his web cartridges back uh, from one of the buildings, I guess. And the Vulture is basically defeated with him uh, getting the card he needs to get to the final um, location, which is Dr. Octopus. And Dr. Octopus basically tells Betty Brand and Maze to go into a second place as Spider-Man finally arrives at the castle that Dr. Octopus is in. Now, Spider-Man goes into the castle, eventually um, confronts Dr. Octopus, and he thinks he's going to be able to beat him very easily because he doesn't have his uh, mechanical arms. But as we learned in the beginning of the uh, annual, that uh, he can use his, he can telepathically uh, interact with his arms. So he basically tries to sneak it at Spider-Man, but his spider sense basically allowed him to not get hit too bad, I guess, or he kind of dodged it. And the battle basically uh, starts between the two, and it's a pretty cool battle. Um, it's really interesting to see Dr. Octopus not have his arms on him. Eventually, he puts them on him because it's more convenient, and I guess it's better to use them, you know, with his mind, you know, intact, you know, with him on his body. Eventually, he gets Spider-Man to basically uh, run away from his arms, and he goes into, like, a trap. A door that was on the ground and basically falls to this giant like uh it looks like a fishbowl of water and dr octopus gets kind of like um ironic in that he gets his like scooby dive uh, suit and he has like his air supply and stuff like that like his scuba uh gear and he basically gets in this giant fishbowl with spider-man and they basically have a really cool fight scene um in the water i thought this was really interesting from stan lee and steve Ditko. Um, whoever came up with this idea, a uh, very cool idea for an octopus and a spider to fight in water. I thought it was really funny, and you know, Dr. Octopus even mentions this as well. That it's very, you know, funny and ironic that they're doing this. Uh, but he goes through with it. He goes in the water with Spider-Man and basically tries to kill him in the water because he has, you know, an air supply. And Spider-Man doesn't. And he's fighting mechanical arms that are, like, made out of titanium or something like that. It's ridiculous. Um, eventually, Spider-Man comes up with the idea to use his webbing. And he made webbing that doesn't dissolve in the water super fast. I'm pretty sure it still dissolves after time. But it can hold things in the water for a bit. And he uses this to basically web up all of uh, Dr. Octopus's mechanical arms. And eventually, um, he's able, I guess, to break out of uh, the fishbowl, basically, and gets Dr. Octopus out as well. But he's all tangled up. His uh, mechanical arms and him and, you know, Spider-Man's webs, his uh, waterproof webs, I guess. And that's how he's defeated. And he's basically left for the police and stuff like that. Uh, Spider-Man uses Spider-Sense to know where, um, which door, basically, Betty Brand and me are behind. They be, and he basically takes him outside and leaves them, basically, so the police can take him home. And Peter basically goes back home and changes out of his outfit. Spider-Man costume basically adds concern for Aunt May and Betty Brand acting like he doesn't know anything. And they basically go inside and they realize, uh, you know, Amy realizes she lost, she uh, missed her uh, daily show and stuff like that, or soap or something like that. Uh, daily soap. Um, so um, that was a very funny uh, comedy moment. Um, and the relationship between Betty Brand and Peter seems pretty well and healthy in this. Um, this is after I think it's issue 12 with the Craven the Hunter uh, debut issue. So they were still in their like dating phase and stuff. So I thought that was really cool. And um, the issue ends with Aunt May basically telling Peter not to talk with so much slain. He's been doing that uh, throughout this annual. Uh, we see the Human Torch basically uh, going to Junior James and saying that he wants to kind of congratulate him for defeating or for beating the Sinister Sets. And Joey John James is pretty mad. And we can see that Peter's just happy with Betty Brand and May basically. Uh, being safe and sound and them to be able to just enjoy their evening together and the issue ends with Dr. Octopus basically saying that he has another plan to take out Spider-Man with the rest of the members of the Sinister Sits not wanting to hear any of it and saying that they don't want to work with him in the future and the Vulture basically has a funny line you know after Sam says that he says no how they could all have been defeated um you know 
uh, by Spider-Man that even thought he beat him, that he was beaten when he did his, like, little, like, metal botch trap, um, and the Vulture basically says that, you know, the talk is the only thing that all of them can do, and that the least that they could have done was give them their own cell, or their own private cell, and that's how the issue ends, and with Spider-Man basically outside the jail, um, jail cell, basically, you know, in the outside world, basically just looking at them with the sun shining bright, and that's the final panel. So this story starts off with Peter basically getting mad, uh, mad from Aunt May, basically telling him that she wants him to meet a friend of hers, uh, daughter of a friend of hers called Mary Jane Watson and we know who Mary Jane is but in the story so far he hasn't met her yet um so he basically gets out to get some fresh air he gets dressed in his spider-man uh costume and he basically goes to uh you know go uh, swing throughout the city now while he's swinging through the city he runs across a group of criminals basically robbing a place and we get to see the daredevil which is Matt Murdock and he's basically going to get mud or, you know, taken out by these criminals. But then Spider-Man shows up and basically attacks the criminals, uh, making quick work of them and basically saving Matt Murdock from getting mud or, you know, even killed. And Spider-Man basically talks to him for a little bit and then he meets his leave. Now, Matt Murdock basically had it, the entire situation under control being Daredevil. And we're going to see a little bit of what he can do later on in the issue. Now, there's a guy called the Ringmaster, and he basically is having a circus in New York City. And he's doing this type of ploy, saying that Spider-Man's going to be at his circus and get a ton of people to come to the circus uh, to fill the entire uh, top, uh, circus top, basically. Uh, the place where they have all the attractions and stuff and the shows. And yeah, so while that ploy is going on, we can see that Peter talks to J. J. James Syndicate himself to be able to go to the circus and Jonah basically tells him not to take any pictures of Spider-Man he's thinking if he keeps him out of the papers maybe he'll go try to find another city to do his super heroics in uh, which is really funny um we also see Peter and Betty's relationship kind of like a little bit rocky still and with Peter kind of like messing up and showing her that he had a circus ticket to go to circus and he didn't invite her so she suspects something's going on like an affair with a different uh, girl uh which is really interesting uh plot point now peter eventually gets into spider-man costume and he goes and he basically uh plays the part in the circus and the ringmaster puts forth his master plan to get spider-man under his, his uh, hypnosis, basically his hypnotic spell, as well as the crowd of onlookers, uh, the audience. Now, Daredevil not being affected by this because he's blind, uh, was able to go and try to capture the Remaster, but the Remaster has hypnotized Spider-Man, and him and Spider-Man get into a fight. And the fight is pretty interesting. Eventually, Daredevil was able to outsmart and outfight the Remaster, which is a very simple thing to do. It's mainly Spider-Man that he's having to, you know, try to ward off and defend himself from. Eventually he gets the remaster's hat. He's able to take away the effects of the hypnosis from a Spider-Man. And him and Spider-Man basically work together as a remaster. He gets his entire circus crew to attack Spider-Man and Daredevil. Now Daredevil uses acrobatics and his uh, super senses. Basically having an enhanced sense of hearing, smell, and taste to basically um, take out some of the members. Eventually, Spider-Man takes center stage in this fight, and Matt Murdock basically gets out of his Daredevil outfit and goes back into the audience to watch the end of this fight. And yeah, we get a really cool action a scene where Spider-Man grabs like a 500 uh, pound uh, barbell uh, that a guy called Samson was holding and was trying to whack. Uh, Spider-Man with, and Spider-Man basically just grabs it with ease and throws it at one of the uh, members or a group of the members uh, like it was basketball, um, as one of them said. So it shows how strong Spider-Man is in his rookie days. As you can tell, this is a very new to the job super uh, Spider-Man. Now Spider-Man basically takes out all the circus crew and eventually gets to the Ringmaster and the Ringmaster tries to use his hypnotic spell on Spider-Man again but this time Spider-Man closes his eyes so he can't be hypnotized and he basically lands like a haymaker regular punch on 
uh, the remasters claiming that he has a blast jaw and Mad Murdoch basically just claps as Spider-Man has done a really good job in you know solving the situation with Mad Murdoch's help of course um, so Spider-Man basically ties up all of the remaster and circus crew and he leaves them for the police and the issue ends with Mad Murdoch basically with his friends as well as going to the remaster to do a little bit of an inside joke saying that if he needs a lawyer to call him um, with the remaster basically saying to get lost. Um, it was really funny. Uh, we also get to see that Spider-Man had gotten all the people out of the hypnosis, um, the hypnotic spell, and everyone just goes on with their day. And yeah, that's how the issue ends with Spider-Man basically going uh, back uh, into the city, basically saving the day, and that's how um, it ends. I guess he's going back to his house and stuff like that to deal with and maybe sleep nagging him more about the Mary Jane uh, chick as he says um, and it's really interesting and that's how the issue ends so this story starts off basically giving us type of like a flashback or kind of like a recap of what happened in Spider-Man and Great Goblin's last encounter which was actually their first encounter with each other and their first battle they had with each other and we still know who the Green Goblin is at this point. He basically goes off back into New York City to try to find Spider-Man. And he's been waiting months to basically have a battle with him again. So months have passed since uh, the last time that they had battle with each other. Which is really cool uh, that we're getting in a type of like time frame. Now we see that Peter basically is in college and... Um, or I don't know if he's in college or he's in high school, but either one, uh, Flash Thompson is with Lewis Allen and he's basically saying that he has a Spider-Man fan club and this is going to be important for later on, so just keep your mind on that. Now, the issue basically, it, the beginning of it focuses on Spider-Man. Uh, trying to stop a robbery that he assumes is happening, but this actually turns out to be a scene from a movie that's being shot at this area, and it made Spider-Man into a type of laughing stock, which is really funny. Um, and this puts Peter into a predicament because he is being laughed at by J. Jonah Jameson, who wants to print on the paper of uh, Spider-Man's, you know, misfortune, basically, how he messed up on this uh, situation. Now, we get to see interactions between uh, Betty Brand and Peter, and I really do enjoy that Stanley and Steve Duco did a really good job in making the relationship feel real, and that it wasn't like a here and now type thing. Um, did a really good job in piecing the amount of scenes these two got with each other. And we do get an interaction between Liz Allen and Betty Brandt. Um, and I'm pretty sure they'll become friends in the future, but at least at this point, they see each other as type of like love rivals. Um, for Peter, which is really interesting. Uh, so we get to see that interaction, that's pretty funny. Uh, we also get to see that, you know, uh, Aunt May is basically still trying to set up Peter with Mary Jane. So that's like an ongoing plot point throughout these issues. And of course, these uh, plot points won't be uh, resolved during the Steve Ditko Stan Lee run because Steve Ditko left the book on issue 38. I believe Mary Jane gets revealed like issue 45. So he wasn't that far off from showing her off. Um, and revealing her, but that's not going to be in this run, so uh, we won't dive too much into that because that'll be something we'll talk about when we go through uh, the John Romita era, if we go through that on the channel. Now, Spider-Man eventually shows up to the fan uh, club of Flash Thompson for Spider-Man, basically for Spider-Man. And at this fan club meeting, the Green Goblin makes an appearance and basically tries to kill Spider-Man by... Um, kind of like taking off one of his webs, uh, basically snapping it while he's uh, web swinging, trying to get him to fall from a high high, but Spider-Man's agility allows him to, uh, you know, land on the ground safe and sound. Now, a Johnny Storm, which is the Human Torch, basically is in the audience with his girlfriend, and he realizes out of everyone that something's not right. And the Green Goblin makes his appearance, basically, you know, in front of Spider-Man, he basically gets to a battle with him, and we get to see more of... Green Goblin's uh, abilities and the stuff that he brings to the table. I believe this is the introduction of his famous uh, glider instead of a broomstick, which will be uh, synonymous with the character from this point on. 
and, you know, so we have Jameson and Betty Brant in the audience as well, and we get to see the introduction of the pumpkin bombs, which are definitely iconic uh, for the Green Goblin character, and just uh, super villainy in general. I think it's one of the most iconic attacks in all of the comic book villains, uh, the pumpkin bomb. So the battle continues with Spider-Man and the Green Goblin, and it's a really interesting battle, and eventually, uh, the Human Torch uh, steps in when he realizes that there's a group of, like, burglars or robbers, and they're basically aiming their guns at Spider-Man, trying to get him in a sneak attack, basically from behind. And the Human Torch basically goes in front of Spider-Man, I guess, to let him know what exactly is going on, and the, the robbers, basically, they leave, and they notice that the Human Torch has found where they're at, with him, you know, shooting, like, these fireballs at them. Now, the Human Torch uh, goes in front of the Green Goblin, basically about to, you know, do battle with him, and we get little panels showing us uh, Betty Brant's reaction to Peter actually being there, uh, you know, with the, uh, you know, at the place that they're at, basically at the fan club. And the Human Torch basically it gets into battle with the Green Goblin after we see this scene with uh, Peter and Betty's little panel. And he's basically using the smoke from his glider to make it to where the Human Torch can't follow behind him because he can't breathe. Uh, it's really interesting because we get to see the Human Torch and Spider-Man basically both taking on the Green Goblin. And while they're doing battle, uh, Spider-Man gets knocked down uh, to the floor by the Green Goblin from the air and basically overhears one of the people, I guess he's like a butler or something, and he basically says that he'll look for Peter Parker because I guess Aunt May had gotten sick and had a heart attack and that she was in the hospital. So Spider-Man basically seems to run away, you know, but in reality is, you know, going because his aunt might die. Um, and he knows that the Human Torch is fighting the Green Goblin, and I guess he has trust that he'll be able to fight him, or at least get the people to safety or survive this battle, and just get the Green Goblin basically get out of there. Which he definitely did uh, have the Green Goblin, uh, you know, escape. And the Human Torch is surprised, all the audience is surprised, J.J. Jameson is happy that he can put this in his paper about Spider-Man being a coward. And yeah, so we get to see that the Human Torch basically deflames himself and he talks to his girlfriend basically saying he knows something's off with Spider-Man because he knows Spider-Man personally. And though he just know his identity, he does know how he is and this isn't like him. And we just get to see the reactions of all these types of different characters of, you know, how they feel about what Spider-Man did. And yeah, so we get to see that Peter basically goes to see Aunt May and gets the news from the doctor that she'll need to have rest for a few weeks or a month or something like that. And we just get to see the aftermath of, you know, what uh, Peter's basically going through. And that's how this issue ends with Peter basically saying that you know he doesn't feel like he's been there enough for aunt may and that that's the reason why she had this heart attack or that she's in this position so the next issue basically is going to be dealing with all these uh plot threads that we got in this issue and can be looked at as almost like a single story because they really do continue the stuff that we get at the end of this page into the next uh issue so this story basically focuses on and it starts off with uh, all the Rhodes Gallery that we've dealt with so far in this run, basically all reacting to the news of what J. Joe and Jameson has put in the paper of Spider-Man basically running away from the Green Goblin and being looked at as a coward among the people and among his own supervillain uh, Rhodes Gallery. And as well as his peers, you know, being the Avengers, uh, Daredevil, and the Fantastic Four. And it's really interesting to see the perspectives of all these characters, especially the Green Goblin being the one to make Spider-Man basically run away, even though that's not, you know, what happened. That's how he perceives it, uh, without anyone knowing the true reason being that Aunt May had gotten sick and had a heart attack and stuff like that. And that was supposed to die, basically, almost died. Um, so we get to see that Peter basically is taking care of Aunt May, and this is taking, I guess, place over a couple of weeks. And Peter basically goes off to try to figure out what he needs to do to get money to buy more medicine that Aunt May is needing uh, for illness, basically. So he gets to his Spider-Man outfit and he basically goes off to try to figure out what he can do to make money. And it's really interesting uh, to see how he handles the situation where he finds some robbers and basically uh, just calls the police to handle them because he doesn't have time to do it himself and he needs to keep himself safe just in case something were to happen to him and not be able to take care of Aunt May. 
uh, and it really showing the responsibility of the character. I really do enjoy when they do that. You also get to see Peter's relationship with Betty Brand that's really rocky now that she doesn't want to even talk to him. It's what happened in the last issue, which, like I said, if you haven't read, go read it and you'll understand. Uh, but they're having their issues, and J. George Jameson's basically being very friendly with all. Uh, the Daily Bugle staff, uh, which is making everyone feel uncomfortable because of his uh, uplifting mood because of Spider-Man's defeat, basically. We also get Spider-Man basically trying to fix his problems one at a time, trying to deal with them, and eventually he does try to talk to Betty Brandt, but it seems to be pointless because she doesn't want to talk to him. Um, so he basically goes off and he meets with J. John Jameson as he's walking on the street. And J. John Jameson basically gives him a card, a uh, get well card for Aunt May, which shows that he does care about Peter despite how he adds to his employees, he does care about them. So I really do enjoy that part. Um, of the character. We also get to see, like I said, Spider-Man doing these little odd jobs, it seems, to try to uh, make it to where he can get some money to buy the medicine for Aunt May. And when he's on one of these jobs and he's trying to, you know, get some money, he basically uh, goes out of the place and the person that's walking uh, in front of him, basically, or to the side of him, I guess you could say, is Sandman, and the Sandman basically says that, you know, he's been waiting to meet up with him again, so he wants to, you know, squash him, he wants to, you know, just take him out, and Spider-Man tries to explain him that he doesn't want to fight at all at this moment in time, but the Sandman basically starts attacking him, and uh, the Sandman basically says that he didn't think it was true, that he was actually a coward now, but he's refusing to fight back, and that's what Spider-Man basically does. He runs, and J. Jonah Jameson sees it again. The situation of Spider-Man running from a supervillain, and basically can use it again in his paper to make Spider-Man look even worse. And we even get this really cool scene with Sandman basically interacting with Peter Parker. And I really hope we get more scenes like this with him, with his Rhodes Gallery talking to his actual self, um, not him in the mask and the costume. So that was really interesting scenes to watch. Uh, we also get to see that later on Liz Allen comes to Peter's home and basically tells him that Flash is dressing up as Spider-Man to try to prove to his classmates that Spider-Man's not a coward. And he goes and basically gets confronted, well he confronts these three, uh, I think they're like car stealers or something like that, car thieves. They basically beat him, like they beat the snot out of him. And he's just a normal dude, you know, like they say regular punches are causing his wind to get knocked out of him. And they basically just tag team him three on one, and it's not looking good for him until some police show up, uh, right when Peter might have revealed his secret identity. So it kind of worked out for Peter, but basically Flash was just told to not do something like this again by the police. And the next day, Peter tries to like console him and basically try to figure out why that he would do something like this and try to like compliment him, but Flash didn't want to hear any of it. And Peter is just feeling, you know, the burn from everyone, basically, and what he's, his decisions are hurting people, basically. And you see that Betty's actually on a date with another dude, so let's say that relationship is going to be sinking soon, so, um, that's just how it's going down. So nothing's looking good for Peter at this moment in time, but Peter basically goes home and he's ready to just give up on being inspiring. He's putting his outfit, you know, basically in a bag or something like that. And he's just very mad. He throws it in the trash can as well. But he goes to sleep, and that's where he waits up. He sees that Aunt May is basically out of her wheelchair. He kind of freaks out, thinking that she might be over his ring or so. But Aunt May basically does a really good speech about how you have to keep going when bad things happen. And she's not going to allow this heart attack to be speaking, make it to where she can't do nothing. Um, and this gives Peter the confidence, as she says, that the Parkers are tough people. They're going to get through these type of things. They're very tough people, as she said. Um, this gives Peter the confidence he needs to go to his room and basically crumble the paper that J. George Jameson had wrote, written, basically, or, you know, put it, um, bashing Spider-Man, and the issue ends with him basically grabbing his, the bag with his outfit in it, ripping it up, getting his outfit out, and putting it on, basically saying that he is going to continue being Spider-Man, because he's not going to quit, just because things are hard at this moment. Um, so it was a kind of, like, fake-out issue, making it seem like we might get a few issues of Spider-Man not being Spider-Man. Now, I do know that there's a issue called Spider-Man No More that dives into, I think, a little bit of a story-type arc, like, story arc, where he's not Spider-Man. Um, 
if we eventually get to that era, which is the John Romita era, uh, which I am thinking I'm going to be covering after I finish the Stan Lee's digital run, uh, we'll see when we finish this run, um, if we're going to go down that path, but, um, that'll be interesting to, you know, compare this to that, because that's not a fake out, apparently, and we'll get to see what his life really is like when he actually does ditch the costume, uh, but we'll talk about that when we get to that, and that's basically how the issue ends, and yeah, so this story pretty much has Spider-Man start off the issue with him taking on, uh, different crimes, and basically is just, uh, beating up, like, criminals on the streets, and we get to see that some man starts to J. Jonah Jameson basically talking about, uh, Spider-Man's, uh, recent, uh, adventures, basically, uh, which gets J. Jonah Jameson kind of mad that Spider-Man's getting more into the public view, you know, in a good light, I guess, and yeah, so we also get to see that the Human Torch basically is flying out, in New York City when he's attacked by the Enforcers and a fight ensues and the Enforcers aren't too hard to fight against but the Sandman basically uh, surprise attacks the Human Torch and gets his sand all over him basically taking out the flames that has you know Johnny ablaze basically And basically, you know, he puts his sand over him and uh, snuffs out the flames. And it's a pretty interesting counter uh, to the Human Torch's flames. I would not have thought of using Sandman against him. Uh, but that's really cool. And we get to see that Peter basically comes back to his house. And he has dinner basically with Aunt May. And the next day we get to see him basically just hanging out with uh, his classmates at school. And that... You know, these little scenes are pretty cool to see with Peter just being a regular kid. Uh, later on in the day, he actually does uh, start to thwart, uh, I guess, a robbery or something. And he basically gets to a fight with the Enforcers where they try to, I guess, surprise attack him. And Spider-Man's able to make it out of there without, you know, being beaten up and, you know, captured or anything like that. Now, we get to see... That Peter uh, meets Betty's uh, new boyfriend, basically his name is Ned Leeds. I believe that he has some ties to the Hobgoblin in the future, so this is really interesting that we're getting an introduction to this character this early on in Spider-Man's uh, comic uh, history. Um, and Betty basically admits to herself that she was hoping that Ned would make Peter jealous, so it seems that we're still dealing with some relationship shenanigans and stuff like that uh, with these two. Now, J. Jonah Jameson basically comes out and seems like he is mad about something, and, you know, that's just like normal J. Jonah Jameson. Now, we get to see that uh, J. Jonah Jameson basically wants uh, Peter Parker to get more photos of Spider-Man, and uh, basically, you know, from the last issue where he said that he didn't want pictures of him anymore, it seems like with all this good publicity that Spider-Man is, you know, starting to get, that he's gonna, you know, want those photos again for Peter that only Peter can get because he is, you know, Spider-Man. Now, the Human Torch basically captures some type of capsule device and he's not able to flame on because of not having enough oxygen, I guess, in the tank or something like that. And yeah, so Spider-Man basically goes out of J. George Jameson's um, office and he basically goes to try to figure out where exactly the Human Torch is at by getting one of the lower uh, minions of the Sandman, I guess, and the Enforcers. So eventually Spider-Man gets the information he needs and he basically goes to where the Human Torch is being uh, held at and uh, Sandman basically tricks Spider-Man into thinking that it's not being guarded at all with sand on the top of the capsule. Uh, the capsule. And Sandman basically is the sand that's on the capsule on the top of the lid. And he basically attacks Spider-Man. And Spider-Man basically has to fight against the Enforcers uh, plus Sandman. And we get a lot of cool action panels with Sandman using his uh, shape-shifting sand abilities, which are always cool to see. And... Eventually, Spider-Man is fighting, I think his name's Ots or something, and he does like this type of like cannonball type move, and Spider-Man is able to break uh, the Human Torch out, at least break the capsule, which allows uh, Johnny to flame on. And Johnny basically joins the fight, and they make quick work of, you know, all the enforcers. Eventually, it comes down to just Sandman, and he basically tries to trap him in some type of like a wire or something. And the Human Torch is basically able to flame on in, kind of like 
made fun of uh, Spider-Man because uh, Spider-Man thinks he's kind of useless right now because he couldn't get out of that capsule, but that's where the Human Torch basically reveals that uh, there wasn't like enough air or something, oxygen in the tank, and that's why he couldn't flame on, but now he can flame on just fine. And they basically get out of the type of wire uh, trap that the Sandman had. And the Sandman basically used so much of its energy that he was actually able to be caught by like normal cops, like these two normal cops. So that was kind of lame, but uh, basically, uh, we get to see that, you know, the Spider-Man the Human Torch, they basically have um, captured the Sandman, basically, you know, they got him to get captured. And this leads us to the end of the issue with J. Jonah Jameson basically still mad. And with uh, Peter basically giving him photos of Spider-Man and the Human Torch versus um, the Sandman and the Enforcers. And this basically puts uh, Peter in good standing with J. Jonah Jameson, which is really cool. We also get to see that um, Peter's relationship with Betty Brant uh, and Ned Leeds is pretty interesting as well and in that Peter still doesn't show any signs of jealousy, which is what Betty had wanted. So that's really interesting. We'll see how that all plays out in the future. And we also get to see that there's someone that is keeping track of Peter Parker as he's walking home. And it seems like this will be a major plot point uh, because someone had hired this guy that we don't get to see in Shadow at the end. And it'll get revealed in this issue on who exactly the Shadow person is. Um, and that's basically how the issue ends. So this story starts off with a plot thread that we got in issue 19 where it ended that issue in that someone has been hired to follow uh, Peter Parker and try to figure out how exactly he's able to get those photos of Spider-Man. Um, so Peter's been having to figure out a way to get out of his uh, Spider-Man uniform as well as uh, being Peter Parker and going into his Spider-Man uniform as well, kind of like the switch between the two. Because this guy is basically always following him, he's having to give him the slip in order to change to his outfit or get out of his outfit. So it's revealed to us that the guy that was in the shadows at the end of issue 19 was actually J. Jonah Jameson, and he's the one that hired Mark uh, uh, Gargan basically to follow Peter. Eventually, uh, J. Jonah Jameson says that he doesn't need Mark Gargan to, you know, follow Peter anymore. They has an idea to figure out who Spider-Man is or, you know, take Spider-Man out. So he basically goes to Mark Gargan and um, basically takes him to the place that he's going to use uh, experiments on him basically to make him stronger. And Peter kind of senses that something's off because that guy is the guy that's been following him. He recognizes him. And yeah, eventually, uh, J. Jonah Jameson goes to a scientist who grants Mark Gargan uh, super strength and basically um, gives him a suit that kind of like, I guess, uh, kind of like fuses with his skin if it stays on too long and makes him into the Scorpion. So Mark Gargan becomes Scorpion because of the scientist and J. Jonah Jameson. Now, with this new suit and super strength, Mark Gargan basically is able to break apart a, a granite block, which is like ridiculous. He's also able to destroy things with his titanium, I think, uh, tail. Uh, it's like a sledgehammer, as Trader uh, Jameson basically mentions and says. And yeah, so Dr. Steelwell is the one who actually uh, created the scorpion and they basically tell him that he has to learn how to control these new powers. Eventually, he actually gets the he gets the surprise on Spider-Man, and they get into their first ever uh, confrontation. Now, Spider-Man realizes that Scorpion is really different from a lot of his foes, because usually his foes cannot go hand-to-hand -hand with him, but the, the Scorpion basically is able to take a jaw shot from uh, Spider-Man, and basically he gets a jaw shot uh, back, as well as other hits, like a gut punch and stuff like that. Um, it is basically overpowering Spider-Man because Spider-Man is like he's fighting someone that can actually trade blows with him. Um, eventually, Spider-Man tries to use his webbing to try to like web the Scorpion, but Scorpion basically just breaks out of it like as if it was made out of straw. And J. John Jameson was basically worried that, you know, the whole experiment was for nothing, but gets happy when he sees that Scorpion is basically beating Spider-Man in a fight. Uh, Scorpion basically grabs Spider-Man and he throws him into some type of like water. 
um, barrel, basically, um, and he basically leaves him there saying that he's defeated. He doesn't have to kill him, as he says, and just leaves Spider-Man there. Now, we get to see that Dr. Stilwell also has realized that what's happening to uh, Mark Gargan is he's losing his humanity as the Scorpion. Uh, you know tendencies that he put into I guess the formula to make him super strong and to be able to use the suit is uh, Messing with his mind. It's gonna make him into a complete animal uh, You know mind wise now Scorpion basically realizes that now that he defeated spider-man he can basically do anything at once in New York City So it goes and tries to rob I guess a bank car or something like that It yeah, he's basically taking out cops and stuff and while he's doing all these things, he realizes that he's losing his humanity, and he basically just gives in to becoming a straight animal. And J. John Jameson basically realizes that he wants to take out Spider-Man so bad that he created a monster, um, and this is not going to be good for New York City, so he has to rely on Spider-Man to basically uh, get stronger and save the day. And yeah, so Spider-Man basically gets to his second confrontation against the Scorpion, gets some really cool action panels, Scorpion using his tail, and throwing all these like uh, Brits and Spider-Man. Eventually, their fight becomes uh, really brutal, and you know, Spider-Man has to be able to figure out how he's going to be able to defeat uh, someone that's this strong. Now we get to see that the fight uh, continues, and Spider-Man basically. Uh, you know, he gets kind of like fed up with it and he rips the tail off of the scorpion, which, you know, is really, really strong. I'm probably made out of titanium, uh, which shows just how strong this Spider Man is, uh, even in his early days. You know, Spider Man was ridiculous in his uh, super strength that he has, spider like strength, as he says, um, strength of a spider. So we get to see that the fight continues and eventually. Peter, you know, uh, Parker slash Spider-Man is able to defeat the Scorpion after a, a lot of different blows that he had to do on it. More blows than he's had to do on any other foe, basically. Uh, but he does eventually defeat him, and he tells J. Jonah Jameson that he's going to be uh, heading out now, and to, that the police will basically grab the Scorpion and put him into prison. And J. Jonah Jameson realizes how ironic it is that he created a monster to defeat Spider-Man, it's that Spider-Man to defeat that monster and save his life as well as the lives of every New Yorker that probably would have been a uh, victim to the Scorpion's wrath. Um, but we get to see that the issue basically ends with Peter going back to school and getting bullied by Flash Thompson again, almost losing his cool and, you know, gonna try beating him up, uh, which he does have some self-control. And it's really interesting. Now we get to see that uh, like I said, that the issue ends with Aunt May basically talking to Peter and seeing all the damage that he took during his fight with the Scorpion. And Betty basically tells uh, Peter about, you know, that she had heard what happened with the Scorpion. And that she's glad that he's doing okay and stuff like that. And how Spider-Man basically saved her life. Uh, which is really cool. And we also get to see that, you know, that J. J. Jameson... Uh, goes back to his old ways, basically saying that, you know, he wants to take out Spider-Man. And Peter ends everything by saying that, you know, right now his biggest problem is getting his uh, spider suit basically sewed up without stabbing his finger to death. And that's how the issue ends. And overall, so this story basically shows us a flashback and introduces us to the character of the Beetle, which is, I guess, a Human Torch villain at this point. And we basically see that the, that the Beetle wants to get revenge on the Human Torch, and he has a really interesting way to go about it. Now, Johnny is basically, um, you know, in a, I guess, in an argument with his girlfriend, and eventually we get to see that he is using his flame powers, I guess, to impress the people of New York. And it's just a really interesting dynamic between these two. Now, Spider-Man basically sees the Human Torch, uh, you know, uh, do some tricks for the New Yorkers, and he has a very interesting perspective in that he feels like the people in New York don't respect him as much as they respect the Human Torch. You know, they basically love the Fantastic Four in New York City. And Spider-Man does understand why they hate him and love the Fantastic Four. Um, and yeah, that's something I really don't understand either, but I guess it could be because of J.J. Jameson's publicity that he always gives him bad publicity. And the Fantastic Four don't really have to deal with stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so the Beetle basically sees the Human Torch, uh, basically going back to his home. I guess he's trying to, like, uh, troll him or tell him. And eventually the Human Torch uh, arrives and he talks to his girlfriend at, I guess, her place. And she basically makes him do a bet that, you know, he can't go, you know, he can't flame on, basically, for 24 hours. 
or they're not going to be in a relationship anymore. She'll break up with them. And the beetle basically overhears this and enacts his plan basically as uh, the human torch leaves. And eventually, we get to see that Peter actually helps out the human torch's girlfriend. And the human torch's girlfriend basically tells uh, the human torch, you know, she tells Johnny that the guy that you just saw, you know, leave their house or leave her house basically knows how to treat her right and stuff like that. So the human torch uh, basically gets jealous and he goes off to talk to Peter, basically uh, telling him off a little bit. And Betty overhears this and thinks that Peter is actually cheating on her uh, with this uh, woman. And Peter basically goes off on the human torch, letting, you know, him know that he doesn't think anything much about him. Because, you know, Peter kind of forgets that, he, you know, he can't let people know that he's Spider-Man. So he feels like this because he has powers, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, but no one else knows, so it almost comes off as, like, Peter's just being, like, super cocky and stuff like that. Even the human torch is surprised that he's talking to him like this because he doesn't know that Peter is actually Spider-Man. Which would make it really interesting if he actually knew uh, Peter's identity as Spider-Man. Um, and yeah, so we get to see that the beetle basically is going to try attacking the, the uh, human torch's girlfriend when Spider-Man arrives and he actually attacks um, the beetle basically, or the beetle attacks him and they get into a confrontation. Now, the reason why Spider-Man was even in this place is he was going to try making Johnny jealous by making Spider-Man trying to hit on his girlfriend instead of just Peter Parker. Um, and Peter didn't even really like hit on her, he just like helped her out, he was a nice guy. But I guess he had gotten a little mad at what happened with Johnny, and he was going to try getting, like, some little, like, petty revenge or something. So I really do enjoy that when Peter tries to act selfishly, that it kind of bites him. And, uh, that just goes with Spider-Man characters so well. So they basically get into a fight, and the fight scene's pretty interesting. Uh, the Beetle can kind of hold his own against Spider-Man pretty well. And eventually, we get to see that, uh, the girlfriend of the Human Torch basically calls him and tells him, that Spider-Man and the Beetle are fighting outside her house. But the Human Torch basically doesn't believe her and she realizes that she keeps like messing with him and that's why you know he won't believe her now that she really needs him. Eventually their battle, uh, Spider-Man and the Beetle basically go into her house and break through her window. And the battle's pretty interesting. Eventually uh, Spider-Man, uh, I guess, wasn't able to, you know, grab uh, the human turtle's girlfriend before the beetle, and they basically uh, give chase to him, basically, to save her. Eventually, the human torch arrives to his girlfriend's house, and he sees that she wasn't lying, so he flames on and goes to try to help his girlfriend and save her from the beetle. Now, he basically sees Spider-Man and thinks that Spider-Man basically kidnapped her or is working with the beetle, and, you know, Spider-Man basically tries to dodge as many of the fireballs that uh, the human torch is throwing at him, and he even uses his webbing to try to, like, uh, tie up the human torch, but he just, you know, increases his heat and melts the webs and stuff like that and yeah it's a really cool battle scene that we get to see between these two heroes eventually spider-man is able to trick the human torch into going to the area where the beetle and his girlfriend are kind of realizing that spider-man is not the bad guy and that the beetle is the one that did all of this uh to his girlfriend basically kidnapping her and even uh might have even almost hurt her uh, so, so the human torch and spider-man basically team up and they have some really cool action sequences and eventually they both attack the beetle at once and this allows uh, Johnny to put the beetle in some type of like fire cage and we get to see that you know the human torch basically talks to uh, his girlfriend her girlfriend is very wary of um, Spider-Man because of all the bad publicity that J. George Jameson has been doing but the human torch Johnny basically tells her that he believes that Spider-Man's actually a good guy uh, underneath it all and that he doesn't believe in what J. Jonah Jameson and people are saying about him and this really shows the type of like type of rivalry slash friendship the two have uh, and we even get to see some inner dialogue of Spider-Man basically thinking of how much stuff is going wrong in his life and he basically needs to go on top of I guess a skyscraper or something to basically just think about his life right now what does that at least or not have to do next and basically try to just fix a lot of these problems he's dealing with at this moment in his story and that's pretty much how the issue ends and yeah yeah that so this story basically starts off with the Rain Master basically uh, getting out of jail after serving uh, his time. And Spider-Man pays him a visit and basically 
uh, sees that he's in this meeting with the rest of his gang, and Spider-Man just wants to make sure that the remaster is not going to go back to his life of crime, and Spider-Man takes the remaster's hat from him and sticks a spider tracer, it seems, on it, that way he'll be able to find the remaster if stuff starts to go wrong in the city, um, and so he can keep an eye on him, basically, a tap on him. Now, the remaster basically goes back to his meeting with his fellow uh, crime people, and his people basically turn on him and basically say they don't want him to be their master anymore, their leader, because of them almost, you know, going to jail. I'm not sure if they went to jail the first time, or it was just the remaster, uh, but if they did, they're all out. And they're basically saying that they want the clown to be the leader, and they basically beat up the remaster, the clown does, as well as the other members of the circus group. And they basically tell the remaster to basically take a hike. So they basically form a new group with uh, the clown being their leader now. Now you just see that Peter basically has interactions with Liz Allen. As well as um, we get to see interactions with Betty Brandt and how their relationship is going. And they basically are heading to an art museum to basically do some coverage for the newspaper of uh, J. Jonah Jameson. And while this is going on, this art uh, museum thing, uh, someone tries to steal one of the paintings, um, you know, from the art museum. And this is the clown's a circus game. So J. Jonah Jameson basically tries to uh, save the painting, but gets hit in the head by one of the circus members that uses like the metal armor. It basically knocks him out cold. So the police basically get J. Jonah Jameson to the hospital and get an ambulance to come for him. And Betty's basically worried that, you know, something bad might happen to him, but she's just hoping for the best. And Peter basically is able to get away from that situation and get into his Spider-Man outfit, try to find out if the remaster is behind it. Eventually, he goes to the remaster and is able to use his hypnotizing hat to hypnotize the remaster to find out that the clown is actually the one pulling the strings this time. And he basically goes to go confront uh, the clown and his circus game. So when Spider-Man arrives, he basically gets in a battle with the circus game. We get a lot of cool action scenes with Spider-Man taking on the entire crew. Eventually, Princess Python basically grabs him and Spider-Man doesn't want to hit a woman. So she basically tries to use that to her advantage to get the other people to gank up on him and attack him. And yeah, overall it's a really cool scene. Eventually, we get to see that the remaster basically gets out of his hypnosis. And we get to see that Jane Jonah Jameson is doing better in the hospital and basically trying to recover, where Betty's trying to figure out where exactly Peter went after he left the museum. And the fight is basically continuing between Spider-Man and the circus game. Eventually, Princess Python tries to seduce Spider-Man and basically tells him that they should take the money that they're going to get from this art together, but basically Spider-Man refuses, and the clown basically sees what's happening and is unhappy that his uh, teammate basically, or his underling since he's a leader, is trying to get one over him. Now, Princess Python basically uh, puts Spider-Man into this room or lures him into this room uh, where her giant python that she controls is in and Spider-Man gets to a fight with it and is basically able to outmaneuver it with his spider-like agility and get the spy and get the uh, snake to basically uh, knot around itself or you know I'm not sure if that's how it happens or Spider-Man basically puts into a knot but it basically is defeated by Spider-Man and Spider-Man goes after Princess Python. Eventually the clown is basically trying to make an escape by himself and take all the art for himself get the paint by himself whenever the remaster basically comes behind him and sots him behind the head basically knocking him out and the remaster takes the art that you know the clown head is basically going to go cash in on it when the police arrive to take them all in uh to jail basically now princess python's uh confronted by spider-man who's behind her and the police are basically right in front of her and spider-man basically leads her to the police and heads out eventually uh, Peter basically goes to see J. Jonah Jameson who has healed from the hospital or woken up. It seems to be fine. And the issue ends with Peter basically giving J. Jonah Jameson shots he took of him versus uh, circus people. And Betty's basically wondering where exactly Peter went and she basically finds out that you know he had taken pictures of circus people against Spider-Man. And they basically have a really cool joke uh, moment between each other, J. Jonah Jameson and Peter. 
and Betty's basically happy to hear this and hear this joke. And they basically go back to the art exhibit, take some pictures of, I guess, the art itself. Um, so that's really cool. And, um, you know, the issue's final panels basically show Peter coming home very late with and may basically mad at him that he never really stays up that late, you know, stays out that late without calling her first. And that's how the issue ends with Spider-Man basically saying that how would she feel if she found out that he was Spider-Man? That she would definitely worry a lot more that her, uh, you know, taking care of um, nephew basically is a virtual anti um, Spider-Man, costume superhero Spider-Man. And that's how the issue ends. And yeah, that was... So this story basically starts off with the Green Goblin meeting a dude called Lucky Lobo and Green Goblin basically is trying to get control of Lucky's mob basically and when he gives the order for his mob to basically kill the Goblin, the Goblin fights back and says that he doesn't want to kill these people, he wants them to work for him. So that's pretty cool. Now we get to see that Peter basically is still working on managing his uh, work in school as well as saving people as well um, while he's Spider-Man and it turns out that J. John Jameson actually gives the job to the former uh, guy uh, the mass man or the big man I think is what he's called from the enforcers and he's basically giving him a second chance after he's done his time in uh, prison so we get to see that Peter basically has a conversation with Betty Brandt and he sees that she's actually still writing letters to Ned Leeds so that's putting some tension into the relationship. Now we get to see that Lucky basically has a person on the inside, uh, a person that's betraying him. He's basically giving the Goblin information and the Goblin hatches a plan to try to get Spider-Man to take out uh, Lucky basically and get him I guess put into jail again. And the Goblin has uh, Peter basically follow him after he puts himself out in the open for Spider-Man to see. And he drops like a smoke bomb or he puts like some uh, pumpkin bombs to basically gas out uh, the mob and ensure Spider-Man to going into this building. And when Spider-Man gets to this room, he's actually met with Lucky's mob and they basically try to attack him but before they can shoot him with their pistols he basically webs up their guns and he basically engages in combat with all of Lucky's mob. Eventually he meets his way into a room where he calls Aunt May to let her know that he's going to be home uh, kind of late or at least later than what he had said he was going to be and he basically lays a trap for Lucky's mob where he puts a ton of webbing on top of the ceiling and he basically traps them all underneath uh, with Lucky trying to get away but getting caught by Spider-Man. Now Lucky basically tells Spider-Man that Green Goblin was trying to get them to take each other out and that way he can take control of uh, Lucky's mob. And Spider-Man basically leaves Lucky tied up for the police to show up and basically put him into jail. Now, Spider-Man goes on to find where the Green Goblin is at, uh, kind of suspecting that he would want to see the outcome for himself, and he was right in that he was close by. And he basically attacks the Green Goblin and gets on his glider. So a battle ensues between the Goblin using his like laser attacks and his... Um, well, I guess it's like his magic beam attacks and his pumpkin bombs. And the fight scene's pretty nice. Eventually, the Green Goblin was able to boost himself away from Spyro when he tried to grab onto his glider and Spyro didn't have any more web fluid. So he basically had to try to save himself from falling to his death. Uh, but the Green Goblin basically realizes that when he gets back home, that the entire gang or mob of Lucky uh, Lobo basically has been captured and put in to the police. So Peter basically gets out of his Spider-Man costume and goes back to find that the big man is still talking to J. Jonah Jameson. It seems like, you know, J. Jonah Jameson found out about what happened with Spider-Man versus Lucky's mob and Lucky himself. And it's mad that Peter wasn't able to get any pictures of this event and this fight that had just occurred in the city. It's a pretty bit story. And the issue basically ends with Peter being very suspicious of uh, the big man and not really believing that he's trying to like turn over a new leaf. Eventually Peter comes back to his home and he sees Aunt May. He basically just sits down and contemplates what exactly is happening with his life and when exactly will he have to fight the Green Goblin again. 
and he basically has this like nagging feeling that something bad is going to happen in the future and we'll see how this turns out in the next few issues or maybe even the next issue something will happen but yeah so this story starts off with peter basically trying to make money and basically doing his superhero stuff and trying to take pictures of different crimes he's able to bust and that's exactly what peter basically does when he gets to his spider-man costume and basically starts beating up some criminals and trying to get pictures but that's when he sees the big man basically trying to get the scoop and yeah so he kind of realizes that he might not be able to sell these pits to jonah and he goes and he tries to talk to Betty Brant and he finds out that she's still writing letters to Ned Leeds which doesn't put him in a pretty good mood and he basically just you know gets out of there and kind of lets Betty know that he's not cool with her uh, basically sending letters to Ned Leeds. Now we get to see that Foswell which is the big man basically is talking to J. Jonah Jameson and he's basically you know letting him know that you know he also hates spider-man and stuff like that um and we get to see that you know uh peter basically goes and he starts talking to liz allen and he's basically telling her you know that he would like to hang out and stuff like that basically just getting a little mad at what is happening with betty and basically trying to uh you know uh, to basically make himself feel better, basically. And uh, one of the reasons why he's doing this as well is not only because of Betty, but because uh, J. George Jameson and Fossil basically had the idea to get a hear what the people in New York have to say about Spider-Man and basically try to put more bad publicity for him. Uh, and this actually kind of works out. And it turns out that Jonah actually got a psychiatrist to basically give him a report of what he thinks is wrong with Spider-Man. And he thinks that he's going to crack, you know, pretty soon. And basically go mental. And this kind of, like, worries Peter because, you know, this is, like, a professional basically giving his opinion on Spider-Man and the, the antics that he does every day. And that he believes that, you know, maybe it's possibly he might be going crazy. Uh, Flash basically is um, following Peter because he's kind of mad at him and wants to, you know, get him into a fight. Um, after school and he basically uses his spider signal to get flash to the like off his trail and he gets into his spider costume and basically starts hallucinating fights with dr octopus sandman and the vulture and they're really cool action panels and eventually he realizes that there's nothing there this makes him believe that he's going crazy as he looks at himself you know in the mirror i mean it's really interesting a uh, set of artwork panels where we can see just how crazy to go makes peter look i think that was pretty interesting eventually he goes to find the psychiatrist that had made this you know description of him and saying that he's probably going crazy and he gets Spider-Man to basically come to his house and, or, you know, his office. And everything's basically, you know, upside down. Uh, which just makes Peter think he's going crazy even more. This perception of reality is just, you know, losing itself. Uh, eventually, he gets him kind of, like, on the couch. And he starts hallucinating again. And he's about to try to get uh, Peter Parker's identity out. Telling him that, you know, it will make, you know, his sanity basically more sane, not having the stress of trying to keep a secret double identity. Eventually, J. Joe Jameson finds out that the guy who had given the report on Peter, the secret psychiatrist, was actually a fake. And he arrives basically right whenever this dude is basically trying to get Peter to basically unmask himself. And when he, re when he reveals that the dude's basically a fake, you know, Peter, like, just gets mad. And he kind of starts putting two and two together. And eventually, he goes after this guy. While Flash Thompson basically attacks Jojo Jameson, believing that he's trying to take out Spider-Man with this dude. And he basically takes off the guy's uh, mask, which reveals that it's actually Mysterio. And it's a pretty obvious uh, plot twist when it has to do with illusions. So that's Mysterio's theme. Um, but it was pretty interesting with how far he went to try to convince Spider-Man that he was crazy and that he actually rearranged this area to actually be upside down and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty crazy. And the irony of it is Flash says that J. Jonah Jameson would have gotten what he wanted had he not helped Spider-Man because he would have learned his secret identity as Mysterio basically confirms to, uh, to J. Jonah Jameson. 
And yeah, so Peter basically goes and he hangs out with Liz Allen. And it's pretty interesting that uh, Liz Allen basically, who is a popular girl, basically stops. Uh, you know, she doesn't go hang out with her popular friends that hangs out with Peter, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And he basically takes her to go uh, see Aunt May, and he basically tells Aunt May not to worry too much about him, and that he will try not to be as, you know, because he had left earlier in the issue to basically, like, run off because he thought he was going crazy, and he didn't really tell her anything of how he was feeling. So he basically, like, just promises he won't run off like that again because of her old age, so I give her a shot like that. And it basically ends the issue with him and Liz basically, I guess, going out on a date, uh, which does make Peter look a little scummy because, you know, he is dating Betty Brant. But um, that's how the issue ends, and we'll see how that, you know, turns out in the next issue if they deal with that um, topic of, you know, him and... Betty Brant's uh, relationship issues and yeah so this story basically starts off with Peter basically trying to take pictures and sell them to J. Jonah Jameson eventually we get to see that there's a dude that shows up that basically says he has a way to defeat Spider-Man and you know Jonah basically doesn't want to have anything to do with scientists because of what happened with the scorpion recently and peter basically uses his like uh talking skills to basically get jonah to at least look at what the doctor is selling and it turns out to be this like uh this machine basically that has like these uh, tentacles that come out of it similar to dr octopus and Betty is basically trying to get Peter to not let Joey Jonah Jameson basically see what this thing can do because she already knows that he'll probably go for it and he basically gets a demonstration by Smythe where Smythe uses the uh, machine to basically uh, entangle Peter and to their knowledge they think Peter is just a normal human but Peter's actually trying to use his spider strength and he's still not able to break through these tentacles which is going to be pretty dangerous in a future encounter if he does have one. Now once he's freed uh, Jonah basically says that he's impressed with the machinery and he's going to want to use it after all capture spider-man and unmask you and betty and peter basically get an argument because she believed that peter was better than turning on someone like spider-man that's always been there to save him and her and it's pretty interesting eventually you know flash and um peter and i guess this is like the next day basically uh flash tells peter that he wants to have a fight with them and Peter basically isn't hearing anything of that because he's too worried about, you know, the Spider Slayer thing. And eventually, J. Jonah Jameson takes control of this Spider Slayer machinery. And he goes off to try to find where Spider-Man's at. And Peter basically meets a run for it once school is done because he has no time for the battle or fight with Flash Thompson. And Liz basically gets mad at him, claiming he's going to try to beat up Peter. Um, so, Peter basically meets his way out from all of his friends and classmates and gets into his spider-man costume this is where we get a confrontation between the the spider slayer machinery versus spider-man and it's a really cool action sequence we get to see spider-man try to use all different types of things against it eventually he's trying not to get entangled by the tentacles that the machine is able to do and after you know a few attempts he basically tries to run and try to think of a strategy to take the machinery out and J. John Jameson basically is happy to see the you know Spider-Man basically can't do anything to this eventually Betty tries to you know get the machine to stop working by unplugging it from the you know the wall um, cutting off its electricity, but J. George Jameson basically gets her out and tells her to take the rest of the day off without pay, of course. And Betty tries to get in contact with Peter. We get this little subplot where uh, Betty and Liz basically go to Peter's house and they're met with Aunt May, who says that Mary Jane Watson basically is there, and we get to see her face basically covered in that. So they're keeping that a surprise for a future issue. Uh, but she does seem like a threat to Liz and um, Betty basically saying that she looks like a screen star, uh, which I guess is what they called movie stars back then in the Sitsies. Uh But yeah, so basically we cut back to the fight and Peter eventually is captured by this machine. 
and it looks like this is going to be the unmasking and Peter basically comes up with the idea once J. Jonah Jameson leaves the machine to go unmask Spider-Man himself physically, you know, in person with Smythe, uh, Peter sees this as opportunity and basically breaks to the circuitry of the machine and basically teats out its innards or something like that. And when J. Jonah Jameson and Smythe basically arrive, they basically uh, unmask an unmanned uh, costume and there's no there's nobody in the costume instead spider-man's using his web to basically make it seem like he's still struggling uh the costume was struggling against the machine and it was pretty funny it's a funny scene and it shows how smart spider-man is sometimes and creative he can be uh, with his webbing and he basically takes pictures of this situation uh just for his personal collection so he can be you know uh, happy when he sees it and we can see the Mary Jane basically leaves Aunt May's house and we still see her face basically you know covered or looking the other way so uh, they basically you know keep that a surprise and Flash basically um, sees Mary Jane and wonders if she knows where uh, Peter's at um, so it's pretty cool and eventually you know a guard or a police officer basically tells Flash he has to leave the property because he's skidding people thinking that he's looking suspicious so their fight basically will wait for another day or their confrontation will wait for another day and Peter eventually arrives after his fight with the spider slayer machinery and tells Aunt May that he's sorry that he was late and you know that uh, he was sorry that he didn't get to meet Mary Jane Watson after all but it turns out that Aunt May is more mad that she found a spider-man costume in his uh, behind his like dresser or something like that he was behind the bookcase and Peter basically comes up with the excuse that he was going to use it to kind of like pull a prank or something on his friends or classmates and Emmy basically just tells him that she's going to put it away and not for him to you know do something like that it just could be very dangerous and the issue ends with Peter just like contemplating how close that actually was how bad it would actually be for someone in her age to basically get a shot that her nephew is actually Spider-Man that's how the issue ends and overall it was a really good issue and yeah so this story starts off with basically peter doing his day-to-day -day things and we also get to see that the green goblin is meeting up with the crime master and it's revealed to us that the crime master knows the green goblin's identity and vice versa the crime master threatens the goblin to not interfere with his plans and kind of like betrays the green goblin because he had told him that they would work together to control the underground of new york city uh when it comes to crime but he tells them that you know he doesn't want to hear from him. he doesn't want to work with them and that if he does try to interfere with his plans he'll reveal a secret identity but as green goblin mentions he would out him as well so they're not going to do anything to each other so they basically just go their separate ways now the crime master basically goes and leaves a message to one of the rival gangs it seems and while that's going on we can see that peter and betty basically get into an argument talking about peter's uh dates that he's been having with Liz Allen basically and Peter basically doesn't really have an answer for what Tatley has been doing she also mentions about Mary Jane Watson and he mentions that he has never even seen her so it's just having a relationship problems pretty much and J. Jonah Jameson basically tells Peter that if he doesn't have pictures to sell to him that he has to get out of his building because he's there to basically buy pictures for him he doesn't really work there for him and yeah so Peter basically goes to his school and he gets to a fight with Flash Thompson this leads Liz Allen to basically just leave them both and say that she's done with both of them and Peter's just not having a good day at all now the Green Goblin and Spider-Man as Peter you know gets to Spider-Man outfit basically gets his costume and they pass each other without seeing each other and the crime master basically shows up and he tries to attack Spider-Man and Spider-Man basically dodges all of his attacks. We get a lot of cool action panels. Eventually, they get into a confrontation, and the Crime Master uses gas to basically try to suffocate uh, Spider-Man. But Spider-Man is able to get out of that situation. That the Crime Master basically gets away. That the Crime Master basically goes to talk to his fellow gangs, and one of his gang members basically rats him out. And the police are basically going to where the crime master basically is. Now we see the crime master talk with the green goblin. And the green goblin and the crime master basically get into a confrontation. 
and you know the Green Goblin is not someone to be sleepy messed with and he quickly like just gets the Crime Master I guess to run away and eventually Spider-Man shows up and he gets into a fight with the Green Goblin. The Green Goblin uses his pumpkin bombs and was able to tad Spider-Man with Spider-Man not being able to get out of the way in time and basically it stuns Spider-Man or you know knocks him out and the Green Goblin uses this opportunity to take his body to the Crime Master and his game. And the crime master basically realizes that this is his moment to basically take over the crime in New York City in the underground. And he goes to his hideout where his uh, fellow gains are at, I guess. Or I'm not sure if they're his gains or, you know, the fellow gains, you know, the rival gains. And the Green Goblin basically shows up with Spider Man, wanting to make a deal and show the crime master that he's someone to be trusted, someone that can, uh, you know, give his end of the bargain, basically, and actually capture and defeat Spider Man. And that's how the issue ends with Spider-Man being defeated, being captured by the Green Goblin, and it seems like they're going to be uh, trying to kill him in the next issue. And yeah, so this story starts off where the last issue left off with the Green Goblin delivering Spider-Man to the Crime Master, basically making a huge scene about him defeating Spider-Man, the Crime Master, and the rest of the gains of New York City as underground. And Spider-Man's basically put into chains and... The Green Goblin is trying to get the Crime Master to look bad and basically is kind of like showing him up because he's the one that defeated Spider-Man and now the rest of the game, uh, you know, Masters are going to want to, you know, uh, partner up with him it seems. And it's really cool how the whole crowd of the game people turn on the Crime Master. Eventually Spider-Man comes to his senses and realizes that he's in chains and he tries to fight off uh, the people, like the Enforcers, I think, are there um, in the Green Goblin and the Crime Master basically are trying to aim to kill Spider-Man to not allow him to escape this uh, situation and this area. Eventually, Peter is fighting against tons of gang people and the police eventually show up and during the chaos and the fight, uh, Spider-Man breaks free of the chains by just using his spider strength to basically break out of it. A uh, very Superman-esque type panel uh, showing that beat off. And yeah, he basically gets to a confrontation with all the gang uh, members that are there helping the police basically defeat them. And it's a really cool set of action panels. Eventually, Spider-Man gets into combat with the Green Goblin and they basically uh, you know, Spider-Man ties up all of the game members, or at least most of them, and the rest of the game members basically surrender to the police. The Crime Master basically gets away and is making his getaway, as the Green Goblin, I guess, goes after him or something. Eventually, Peter tries to follow the Crime Master through a ton of way, and the Crime Master uses that poison gas that we saw him use in their last encounter. And Peter uses, like, his webbing to make, like, a type of, like, mask so that he doesn't breathe in. The toxic gases eventually he finds his way out of the tunnel uh, system but down in the sewer system uh, the crime master basically gets away and finds a way out without Spider-Man catching him. Eventually Peter meets his way and I guess the Green Goblin got away as well um, we don't really see that I believe but um, he must have gotten away as well so Peter goes to the Daily Bugle as Spider-Man and basically meets his accusations that he believes that the big man basically is the crime master I think his name was Foswell, and it turns out that Foswell uh, was not the Crime Master because as they're talking to Foswell, we see the Crime Master up on a rooftop, and the police basically grab him and take him in for questioning, you know, to put him in jail. And Peter, you know, basically apologizes to Foswell, believing real deep down inside that Foswell has something to do with the Crime Master, despite knowing that it wasn't him. And we don't get to see the Crime Master's identity either or learn about whose identity it is. Um, and it's pretty cool. We get to see the Crime Master basically tries to let them know who the Green Goblin's identity is. And before he was able to reveal their identity, he basically died. Um, so I'm guessing maybe the Green Goblin had something to do with that, like poison him or something. Or maybe his own poison gas uh, was the thing that did him and maybe he was hired to kill himself. Um, with his own poison gas to make sure that the real Foswell, you know, if Foswell is the Crime Master, after all, that he was able to get away and get to the Daily Beagle while this guy took the fall for him. Um, but yeah, so Spider-Man basically apologizes to Foswell. J. J. Jameson wants him, you know, Spider-Man to be arrested and to get out of his building. And Spider-Man basically meets his escape and is still convinced that Foswell has something to do with this. Um, we also get to see that Daily Beagle basically goes back to their usual work. 
And it's really cool to see, you know, that everyone basically goes back to normal after this whole Crime Master and um, Green Goblin situation. And it seems like Peter's gonna go back to making, to getting some pictures of Spider-Man. And yeah, and Boswell, you know, is someone that, you know, was working with uh, G. George Jameson. And it says that, you know, that Boswell actually got the Crime Master, you know, revealed and that, he, you know, J. John Jameson's basically trying to take credit, uh, credit for, you know, uh, nabbing the Crime Master, basically getting his identity, uh, because of Boswell working under him. I thought that was really cool, basically saying that it was all his idea. And the issue starts to end with a reveal of Norman Osborn. We don't get Norman Osborn's name in this, uh, issue, but he is introduced to J. John Jameson. They have a type of discussion with each other. Peter goes back home, obviously works on his suit, I guess with some of the damage he probably took during the fight with the entire gains of New York City. And it's revealed to us that with Foswell, that Foswell has a mask of such that, you know, that the informer that betrayed uh, the underworld, basically, that he was a character known as Patch, which I guess that is Foswell's, um, you know, Foswell's, uh, secret identity as this mask he puts on to hide his real identity which i thought was really cool and we get to see the green goblin yet yet again in like silhouette type form and you can kind of tell that's norman osborne and for most people of this generation we know norman osborne is the green goblin but when this stuff was coming out no one knew his identity and hopefully we'll see how that reveal is handled in the future but it won't be in the steve dick run uh, so we'll we'll see if we're gonna cover the John Romita run, uh, John Romita Senior run after we finish the whole uh, Steve Ditko Stanley run. But yeah, and the issue basically ends with that and Peter and Aunt May basically I guess going home or something like that. And it was like it was really cool. I think uh, Peter was uh, taking Aunt May home on a bus, you know, after she went to go see a movie or something. And that's how the issue ends uh, with them going off with a bus and the panel just saying the end. And we get a little bit of Ted talking about what to expect next issue, but we usually get that every issue. And yeah, so this story basically starts off with us seeing Peter Parker, uh, Liz Allen, and Flash Thompson basically getting ready to graduate from high school. And we get to see that Peter uh, witnesses uh, two scientists basically attacking each other. Just one of the scientists doesn't think it, that the the serum that they're working on or something like that is ready and the other guy basically gets very aggressive and physical and knocks the guy backwards uh with a punch and right when peter is about to you know try to you know save the guy or you know help him to not uh lose his experiment to his uh, co-creator uh, peter basically gets entangled by one of the scientists uh, you know uh, tentacle machines that's supposed to, I believe, uh, like, sense spiders and stuff like that, or can sense spiders. Uh, Peter comes up with some quick thinking and grabs a jar of spiders, making it seem like the machine's working completely fine, that it had misidentified Peter uh, for the spiders that he was holding instead of him being found out as Spider-Man. And I thought that was really cool. Eventually, we get to see that uh, Peter basically... Uh, witnesses the two guys get into an argument yet again and during this argument one of the guys basically gets that's trying to take uh, the serum gets uh, he gets like shot with some like electricity or something some type of beam of energy and this explodes the cancer and drops all the goo that was in it on the guy all the serum and this transforms the dude into the molten man and with this, he becomes super durable, basically, and his strength completely increases to ridiculous uh, heights. It seems he's, he's able to basically destroy a car that he was that he basically uh, got in front of, and the guy basically tried to call him out, and he just grabbed the thing and basically flipped it over and destroyed the hood and stuff like that. And he starts just like you know taking down like uh, phone poles and stuff like that. And Spider-Man gets into costume, basically. Peter goes and gets into his Spider-Man costume. And he engages in a fight with the Molten Man. And we get a lot of cool hand-to-hand -hand combat panels. And Peter is basically taking tons of hits from the Molten Man. It seems like Spider-Man's hits aren't doing the same amount of damage that the Molten Man is doing to Peter. He's able to use his webbing, but that is easily dismantled by his strength. And the fight just continues. There's a lot of action scenes in this uh, issue. It's very action-heavy. 
eventually Peter comes up with the idea to turn off the lights, and this allows him to use his spider sense to basically fight against the Multiman, and uses his uh, super strong webbing to basically try to get the Multiman's uh, hands tied up so he can't punch him anymore. Uh, this seems to be ineffective because he basically just uses uh, his tied up hands to basically still smash into Spider-Man. Eventually, Spider-Man comes up with the idea to use his spider's speed and his reflexes to basically not get hit. And eventually, I guess he just like tires out or something and he has the police basically take the Multiman uh, to jail. And I guess that's where he'll stay. I mean, I'm guessing he's gonna be like a special prison cell for super powered villains considering that he's maybe like the seventh villain that Spider-Man's face that he's put into prison that has powers, I think. Um, so you can assume they're already making different types of uh, prison cells for these guys. Um, now that this has become the norm with the Fantastic Four and now Spider-Man's uh, Rose Gallery as well. Uh, but yeah, so basically after that whole conversation with the Multiman, Peter goes to Aunt May and they get ready to go to Peter's graduation. Uh, Peter tries to talk to Liz Allen before his graduation is able to get finished or started. And she basically tells him that she wants to do a new start and basically make a new name for herself. And it seems like Peter and Flash Thompson are going to be going to the same college. And that's where we'll get introduced to uh, Peter's best friend, Harry Osborne. Uh, for those that don't know, I believe that's when he met him um, in the you know in the original comic run. Um, this won't be in the Steve Dicko run. This will be in the John Romita uh, senior run. But yeah, uh, J. John Jameson basically goes to Peter's graduation and is able to, you know, try to like... Uh, so we talk his way for Peter not to leave the Daily Bugle and take his Spider-Man pictures to someone else, like a rival newspaper. Um, and Peter basically got a scholarship for getting the best uh, grades in his class. And um, overall, these scenes are really good for character development. It shows that the characters are going to be going in a forward direction from this point forward, going to their adult lives. And I really enjoyed that. Um, and Peter contemplating what life is going to be like in college with Flash uh, Thompson is really cool as well. And the issue ends with J. John Jameson basically trying to look good in front of Aunt May and Aunt May, respects J. John Jameson, seeing him as a guy that gave Peter a job that pays, you know, kind of good, as able to let Peter, you know, go to school and also work hard as an adult. Um, and the issue ends with them just celebrating uh, Peter's graduation and walking away. And we get little hints on what the future might hold with Peter's relationships with Liz Allen and Flash Thompson going to be going in a more adult uh, direction and how Peter's going to have to handle these relationships. And that's how uh, the issue ends. So this story basically starts off showing us that Peter Parker is basically getting, I guess, all of his stuff that he had in the pawn shop. Uh, he's basically getting like a loan, I guess, from the bank or something like that. And while that's going on, we get to see that the Scorpion has basically broke, broken his way out of prison and he actually took down the metal bars that were keeping him in uh, the prison cell, basically. So he's basically heading back to New York City uh, to basically get revenge on J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man. So that's really cool. Uh, we get to see that Peter basically goes to talk to Betty Brandt, but it's revealed to us that Ned Leeds basically is back in town. He's back from his assignment. I think that he was like in Africa or something. And yeah, so he's basically back and is hitting it up with Betty yet again, causing Peter to feel a little jealous and kind of like lost in his way. We get to see that a policeman basically shows up and tells J. Jonah Jameson that the Scorpion has escaped, and it's said that he wants to take out J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man, so they basically try to put like a security perimeter around the Daily Bugle and have people watching over J. Jonah Jameson. Uh, but J. Jonah Jameson basically thinks this is all like a ruse and there's no way that the Scorpion would, you know, want to come after him and stuff like that. But Peter basically overhears what the policeman has said and realizes that, you know, the Scorpion is out. And that he was barely able to beat him the first time, so hopefully he doesn't have to, um, you know, have to fight him again. But we know he definitely is. Uh, Betty Brand basically is asked by Peter if she wants to have dinner the next night. Uh, but it turns out that Ned leads actually to her out to dinner. So Peter basically gets frustrated and basically tells her to just enjoy your time with Ned. And we get to see that Jones Jameson is basically freaking out over this whole Scorpion situation. So, Jameson basically puts that Spider-Man and Scorpion are partners in his newspaper, and Spider-Man basically is just out uh, patrolling the city, trying to figure out where exactly Scorpion might be. 
Eventually, the Scorpion arrives at the Daily Bugle and tries to attack J. Jonah Jameson, with J. Jonah Jameson basically running for his life. Eventually, Spider-Man figures out that the Scorpion is at the Daily Bugle, and he engages in a battle with the Scorpion. Uh, Ned Leeds takes this time to talk to Spider-Man, basically tells him that he'll protect Betty from danger, and even tries to give Spider-Man some tips on how to fight against the Scorpion, where, you know, Peter's just getting frustrated with Ned Leeds. Uh, being this great man, basically, he doesn't want to like him, but he's just, you know, putting Betty first. And he even tells uh, Ned, you know, to basically shut up. After he keeps telling him on, you know, how to fight the Scorpion. Uh, the fight continues, and they basically just go to blows over and over again, with J. John Jameson just running away the entire time. Eventually, they make their way out of the Daily Beautiful building, and J. John Jameson basically acts real tough, telling them that they're cowards, and for them to get back here before he had time to, you know, take them out, or, you know, give them a word or two. And the police officer makes a funny joke, saying that, you know, he's acting tough because, you know, they got there, the police, and it's pretty funny. So, their battle basically continues, Spider-Man and uh, Scorpion, eventually uh, Spider-Man basically webs up the Scorpion and they land into an, the ocean down below, and in the ocean they basically start having another fight, and the Scorpion is basically really in his element during this fight scene, but eventually Spider-Man's able to use some webbing that he created to be able to handle being in the water and not dissolve, apparently with the water. And he's able to capture Scorpion in this web, and apparently he's able to, you know, hold Scorpion this time. Last time they fought, he basically just ripped out of Spider-Man's webbing. This shows that Spider-Man's getting a little smarter in how he's utilizing his webbing and what he's making it out of for certain opponents. And I really enjoy that about the Ditko version of Spider-Man, that he's very smart and does use his uh, intellect to basically try to win his battles. Um, the issue ends with Peter basically trying to call Betty, and Ned basically tells uh, Peter that she's basically kind of like a little like rocked by what happened with Scorpion and Daily Beetle. Um, so he's taking care of her basically at her apartment with her and her friends, uh, with the doctor basically saying that they don't want Betty, you know, going out anywhere and stuff like that. So she's gonna take some rest days. And Aunt May basically uh, has this like headache attack her and she drops a glass on the ground. Peter comes to ask what's wrong, but Aunt May doesn't tell him that she's feeling ill lately. And this illness will be revealed in the next issue, I believe. And it's definitely leading up into uh, probably the biggest story arc in the Steve Ditko Stan Lee run. Uh, but we'll talk about it when we get to that. And yeah, so this story basically starts off with us uh, picking up where we left off with Aunt May having an illness. Betty Brand basically resting as they have that whole ordeal with Spider-Man and Scorpion in the last issue um, at the Daily Bugle. And Spider-Man is on patrol when he almost catches up with a character called, I think, the Burglar, the Cat Burglar, the Cat, I think is what he calls himself. And he's basically a burglar. And eventually, Spider-Man uh, comes into a conflict with a group of henchmen that are working for this type of like mysterious boss behind the scenes. Uh, Spider-Man gets a little cocky and is able to be outmaneuvered and outdone by these henchmen, which is very sad for Spider-Man in this situation. Uh, eventually, Spider-Man basically goes back, changes back into Peter Parker, and he gets into a conversation with Liz Allen. And it's a really cool thing that we're going to see them interact with each other. Flash Thompson is basically listening to their uh conversation and liz basically is telling peter that he's trying to figure out where she works uh making flash look really creepy but yeah so flash gets to a conversation with peter parker basically he says that he's gonna get peter to tell him where liz works but peter basically one taps flash and makes it seem like they both knocked each other out uh so that he can go and uh try to catch the cat burglar um so he gets to spider-man outfit and goes after him uh, and eventually he goes back and he basically uh, tries to pretend that he knocked out, you know, Flash and himself. So that was a really funny scene. Uh, we get to see Peter and Betty basically talk to each other. And it's kind of crazy because uh, Betty basically tells Peter that Ned Leeds basically asked to marry her. And she doesn't tell him what her answer was. But Peter basically says that he doesn't want to 
you know, continue this, so you just hear he knows where it's going. He basically leaves Betty with the answer that he thinks things should just end between them because it's clear that Ned Leeds is the better option for Betty Brandt. And we'll get more into this, I believe, later on in the issue. Eventually, we get to see that uh, Patch, or uh, Foswell, he goes by the, you know, the pseudo name Patch when he puts on that mask. And he basically is telling uh, J. Jonah Jameson about that, you know, he's trying to find, uh, who the cat is or where the cat is. So he's basically continuing to be this, like, a uh, news reporter for J. Jonah Jameson and try and get the scoop for him. Um, so we'll see if Fossil goes back to crime in the future, but for right now it doesn't seem like he's doing this, trying to, like, being undercover getting the crime people where he wants them. Um, eventually Spider-Man gets to a conversation with some game people, makes quick work of them, basically leaves them for the police. And Peter basically goes off and eventually the cat burglar uh, gets found out by just a local citizen because apparently they had just cleaned the windows or something. And it was just some bad luck for the cat burglar. The cat burglar tries to get away and J. Jonah Jameson sees him on the TV screen and eventually Spider-Man shows up to confront the cat burglar and the cat burglar tries to outmaneuver, uh, outmaneuver, um, you know, Spider-Man and this just isn't gonna happen. But he does have some tricks up his sleeves and he gets this giant water tower to basically explode underneath uh, to make it lose its bounds and try to crush Spider-Man but Spider-Man's agility allows him to not get crushed by it. And he basically goes up to where um, the cat burglar is, and he tries using a gun on Spider-Man, but Spider-Man is definitely above bullet level, bullet speed, so it's definitely not going to work on someone like Spider-Man. Uh, the cat basically gets uh, blocked by the police on one side, Spider-Man on the other side, and he tries to use the distraction of smoke to get away, but eventually he gets caught by the police as there's only one spot he really could hide. And they threaten to cut the rope that he's holding onto, and he just gives up. Says I going to go to jail and stuff like that. So that was a really funny scene. And the issue ends with us seeing Peter basically cash in on the cat pictures that he was able to get of him fighting against the cat, and the cat being, you know, um, captured and being sent to jail. Um, and we get to see that Peter basically breaks things off with Betty Brandt, saying that he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. That the relationship is just basically done. So Peter basically cashes in with Jason Jameson, uh, ends his relationship with Betty Brandt, and we get this really cool panel at the very end, final panel of the issue, with Peter and Betty being separated by an invisible Spider-Man. Very cool panel uh, by Steve Ditko, and I really like that and how it ended the issue. And yeah, so this story basically starts off with the master planner sending his henchmen to, I guess, leave a delivery uh, to his hidden base underwater. And Spider-Man comes in to try to foil their plans. And during the battle uh, with the henchmen of the master planner, they basically are able to uh, send the cargo down into the underwater base by going in and diving, I guess, and putting it uh, inside the base for the master planner. Uh, this will be important for later on. Uh, Spider-Man continues to have his battle with uh, the henchmen and eventually gets himself out of the helicopter that they're in and uses his webbing to basically swing himself out of there and basically foiling uh, the plans, at least in his mind, uh, of the henchmen of the Master Planner. Now, Peter is at home with Aunt May whenever she actually falls down and is shown to be ill in front of Peter and Peter gets a doctor to come over and look over her and he basically tells her and Peter that he's gonna have to send her to the hospital so he calls her the hospital to basically pick up Aunt May and Aunt May basically is in the hospital now and awaiting results for what exactly happened to her. So Peter basically goes home and thinks about everything that might be happening with uh, his aunt and he goes into school the next day and this is where introduced to Harry Osborne uh, which will be a very important character and will become Peter's best friend in the next few issues I'm guessing and they basically don't see eye to eye with their first interactions because Peter's being distracted by his aunt basically being sick and Peter basically endures Liz Allen um, not Liz Allen, uh, Gwen Stacy. He ignores Gwen Stacy, which is another new character introduced in this issue, um, which will become Peter Parker's uh, love interest pretty soon in the next few issues. 
And yeah, it's pretty interesting because he doesn't really give her the time of day and showing some growth on Peter's part in not being as, you know, easy to be overtaken by people as back then. Uh, Harry, Flash, and Gwen don't like this, so they pull a prank on Peter, basically getting him in trouble with the professor. And Gwen doesn't really like that they got Peter in trouble, so they do offer for Peter to basically go out for a soda with them um, after school. But Peter basically doesn't even acknowledge him, and he basically leaves to go see his Aunt May in a hurry. And they basically don't know what's going on here, so they just assume he's being rude to them, and it's a pretty interesting scene. Now, Peter goes and he talks to the doctor and realizes that, you know, uh, whatever is happening to Emmy is not good and that he's going to need money to pay her medical bills. So he's going off to try to see if there's any crimes. So he's basically cashed in with J. Jonah Jameson. Now, Ned and Betty basically have a conversation. It seems like Betty hasn't given Ned an answer on if she's going to marry him yet. So we'll see what exactly is going to go on with that plot point. And Peter basically is uh, still interacting with his classmates in the same way, making Gwen Stacy feel inferior and not used to men basically not uh, acknowledging her and her appearance and uh, her existence. So Peter basically just blowing her off every time. It's pretty funny. And eventually Peter talks to Foswell, who is in his patch identity and uh, gets a tip on where exactly a crime could be happening. So he goes off to basically see this crime and he gets into a conflict with um, the henchman of the master planner. And I guess he defeats them and stuff and they basically dive into the water uh, yet again, which gives another hint of their underwater base. So Peter basically was able to get some snapshots, I believe of uh the situation and he basically goes um in the water and he i guess wasn't able to find anything when it came to the master planner's base um at least he hasn't found it yet and the issue ends with the doctor basically saying that he has to run the test twice it just seems like whatever ma has is gonna do her in and it seems pretty bad for peter and for aunt may's condition and we'll see if peter can find a way to save aunt may and what his reaction will be when it's revealed what exactly is happening to aunt may in the next issue and yeah so this story basically starts off showing us who the master planner is and it's none other than Dr. Octopus and he's back from out of jail and he's going to try taking on Spider-Man and taking him out once and for all. Peter gets to a conversation with Betty Brandt and he basically doesn't want to hear anything about it and is still dealing with uh, Aunt May being sick. He just really doesn't want to have anything to do with uh, this relationship stuff and I don't blame him. He gets to the doctor and the doctor wants to have a word with him as the nurse tells Peter and when Peter talks to the doctor it's revealed to him that for some reason Aunt May has radioactive uh, poisoning and this turns out to be the case in that um, Peter in a previous issue had done a, a blood transfusion for uh, Aunt May and this gave her a radioactive poisoning. So now Peter has to figure out a way to find a cure for this and uh, realizing that it's his fault why she's going through this. So it's like a double-edged sword. Um, a double problem as you can say. So Peter takes some of Aunt May's blood sample that he got from the doctor's office and basically takes it to Kurt Connors to try to uh, save Aunt May's life. So Kurt basically meets a deal with Spider-Man and they try to figure out uh, how to save Aunt May and Peter gets uh, stuff to pawn to get money to buy the materials he needs to basically try to make this cure and it's pretty good. Um, it shows uh, Spider-Man's intellect as he's working with Kirk Connors to try to make this cure. And the Master Planner basically has his henchman steal the last piece of ingredient that he needs to make the serum. Or, I'm not sure if it's the last piece or if it's the serum itself, but um, he basically uh, kidnaps or, he, you know, he steals uh, the serum. So, uh, Kirk Connors basically um tell spider-man what exactly is going on and spider-man freaks out and goes off to try to find the serum before aunt may basically dies uh from her illness so he goes off and he tries to find any clue he can and he just starts destroying things and showing a more aggressive side to his super uh, heroine 
than he usually shows and he's basically working uh through a rampage through all the underground and different uh, games and stuff to try to figure out what is where exactly the master planner is at eventually he finds the henchmen at the master planner and tries to get the information from them and gets in a huge fight with them when one of them tries to escape in some type of like doorway uh like an elevator he basically goes in that elevator and he finds uh the master planner's uh, hidden base which is i believe underground in the water and eventually we get to see that uh spider-man gets to a conflict with dr octopus and they begin their battle against each other to try to uh get the serum basically from dr octopus and the battle is pretty interesting we get a lot of cool action panels showing dr octopus and spider-man fighting each other eventually the battle is so brutal and you know on a very high strength level that it starts making the whole building start collapsing around them eventually spider-man and dr octopus almost gets uh, crushed by the metal that's falling all over the place and this giant uh set of machinery basically falls on top of spider-man he's able to move out of the way to not get crushed completely but he's kind of pinned down under all the rubble and all the machinery and the serum is basically just a hands or arm's length away from where he's at he also realizes that the water from the top of the ceiling you know which is i believe they're underwater it's like an underwater base basically is uh pouring through and it seems like he's gonna have no chance of saving at me and that's how the issue ends with peter b sleeping trapped under the rubble and overall uh so this story basically starts off with spider-man slash peter parker pinned under this giant machinery and while he's pinned he's basically uh shown to be thinking about uncle ben and aunt may and how he's gonna fail aunt may the same way he felt uncle ben and as the water starts rising because of the cracks in the ceiling peter finds the inner strength to basically lift this giant machinery off him one of his greatest feats of strength in the original stanley's the dicko run uh one thing that makes this uh set of panels so interesting is that it set in motion this idea of using a giant moment and starting with tons of panels and getting less and less panels to get this giant splash page of this great grand moment uh we saw a very similar thing done in superman versus doomsday in the death of superman story art in the 1990s um so uh this is definitely very influential it's de definitely something that we should mention in the review now peter basically is limping and he's trying to uh he grabs the serum basically and tries to escape this area eventually some of the ceiling collapses and a giant wave of water basically pushes spider-man uh, towards the exit uh some of the henchmen of the master planner basically try taking the serum or try beating uh spider-man up spider-man basically fights almost you know exhausted completely of all of his strength he's able to fight almost blind it seems not even paying attention to what he's doing he's able to defeat all the different of the master planner's henchmen and he basically escapes from that underwater base or i think it's the higher portion i don't think this is underwater anymore when he fights the henchmen of the master planner he arrives with the serum to give to dr uh, kurt connors uh he also has athena of aunt may's blood to test if it's gonna work or not on her and it turns out that the serum actually works so he goes off to give it to the doctor and the nurse after thanking kurt connors for helping him try, uh, make the serum basically and after giving it to Aunt May, uh, it seems like she's going to be fine. So Peter goes off, and after, you know, uh, thanking the doctors and all of them for all their work and the nurses, he basically goes and takes some pictures of the Master Planner's henchmen. He goes to take them to J. Joe and Jameson to get some money. Um, and like I say, he just takes different pictures of the henchmen as well as talking to Foswell about everything that occurred at that night. And when he goes to uh, the Daily Bugle to basically cash in on the pictures, he basically talks to Betty Brandt and tells her that he's not going to give up on, you know, living his dangerous life and taking these pictures because uh, that's his job. And this makes Betty have some PTSD, basically uh, thinking about her brother and how he got killed because he wouldn't stop living a dangerous life. And this uh, just proves to Peter that there's no way he could ever really be with Betty Brandt because he's always going to have to be Spider-Man despite, you know, what she might say. 
and what she might think. Uh, so he basically lets her leave, uh, you know, crying and all that, asking why he craves action and stuff like that. Uh, so he goes off, he talks to J. Jonah Jameson, and he goes and sells him the pictures and says that he needs more money than usual so he can pay for Aunt May's medical bills. And J. Jonah Jameson doesn't allow Peter to take these to different news uh, people, which is a big deal because Spider-Man basically fought against the Master Planner's game. And it's going to get him some good headlines and a lot of sales. So he basically gives Peter the extra money and writes it off as him being nice and trying to help his aunt basically pay her medical bills. And it's a really cool scene. And eventually, we get to see that the doctor basically talks to Peter and wants to check him over because of him having some scars and some bandages on his face. And he just tells Peter to basically teach some rest once he gets home. And Peter says he will after he knows his aunt's okay. And when he goes to see Aunt May, he basically is able to talk to her and basically see that she's doing better. So he goes off to go back home and get some rest. And that's how the issue ends with the doctor basically saying he wishes more people would be like Peter and not be so dangerous uh, like Spider-Man. You know, dangerous and mysterious like uh, Spider-Man. Uh, which is funny because Peter is Spider-Man. And that's how the issue ends and concludes the three-part story arc of If This Be My Destiny. Um, it seems like the next issue will focus on the return of Kree and the Hunter. So that should be fun. And yeah. So this story basically shows us that Kraven the Hunter is basically back and is taking some sort of like magic potions to increase his strength and stamina and speed and we also get to see him go against a lion of the jungle. So it seems like now he's heading back from Africa in order to go uh, face off against Spider-Man and get his revenge and basically hunt for Spider-Man. Uh, we also get to see that Betty Brandt basically has a dream of Peter basically revealing himself as Spider-Man. This causes her to wake up from her nightmare and basically realizes that she wants to quit the Daily Bugle and basically try to distance herself from Peter and try to make a better life for herself basically away from Peter Parker. Um, so yeah, so that's not looking good for Peter. Peter basically gets news that his aunt is doing a lot better and that hopefully soon that after a few days she'll be good as new again from the doctor's words, um, you know, from the doctor's mouth. So we also get to see that Peter goes to college and he basically gets into an interaction with Harry Osborn, uh, basically trying to make him look, uh, you know, silly, basically trying to humiliate him. And Peter basically doesn't uh, really appreciate this behavior, but he doesn't let it get to him. And goes on about his day, basically. Uh, after that, he goes, basically, um, like I said, he's in college. And while that's happening, I guess Peter, um, there's a Spider-Man imposter basically grabbing J. Jonah Jameson. And before he can grab him and basically make like an example of him or make him, you know, a captured person and kidnap him, uh, the police basically get called, or the group of people around them basically see Spider-Man's trying to kidnap J. Jonah Jameson. It's revealed to us when the mask is pulled off, it's actually Kraven the Hunter that he was going to use J. Jonah Jameson to basically uh, try to get uh, Spider-Man to follow him. Um, but this was good enough because people saw uh, his imposter uh, version of Spider-Man basically try to grab J. Jonah Jameson. So this indeed meets the news because of J. Jonah Jameson basically being a newspaper owner. And Peter's basically eating an apple watching TV with Aunt May when they're watching the news when this uh, story breaks up. And Peter almost chokes on his apple. Um, so Peter basically realizes that uh, whenever Aunt May's friend basically came to um, see um his aunt may you know uh mary jane's aunt basically came to see aunt may basically used this opportunity to say these and go out to watch a movie and get into his spider-man uh costume and go after this feat imposter spider-man uh basically um peter uses this uh time after he gets caught out by a uh, craven who uses a type of like spider signal imp uh, imposter one um, to basically, like an imposter said, no, basically to try to get Spider-Man's attention. Eventually he does, and they get into a bit of a fight. Um, Kraven uses this type of potion or something, this jungle scent, to basically cancel out his spider sense, which is actually pretty smart. I don't know how exactly this is supposed to work. He gets the spider sense and how he can just turn it off. The only villain I know that can do that is Venom. Uh, because it was uh, connected to Spider-Man previously before it uh, went to Eddie Brock. But yeah, uh, apparently, I don't know, I think Carnage has that ability too, not to be uh, detected by the spider sense. 
Uh, but Craven actually figured out a way to do it, apparently, and Peter basically goes off and he fights against some uh, gang members that were trying to basically attack him, I guess, and eventually gets to do another fight with uh, Craven the Hunter, and it's a really cool fight scene. And the whole issue basically is just focusing on Craven basically hunting Spider-Man or Spider-Man hunting Craven. They're basically like hunting each other. And this fight scene goes on for a while in the issue. Uh, mainly just them throwing hands. Eventually, Peter's able to knock out Craven the Hunter with a right hook. And he leaves Craven basically for the police uh, with his signature uh, spider signal. And I think he was able to get pictures of his battle with uh, Craven, but I'm not sure. Um, and we see that uh, more people are on uh, secretaries are being hired to basically, um, you know, a new secretary is hired to basically replace Betty Brand. And uh, Peter basically ends the issue uh, talking to his Aunt May and uh, Miss Watson, basically, and Mary Jane's aunt, and basically just uh, uh, contemplating how his life is going. And that's how the issue ends. And yeah, so this story basically starts off with the judge basically granting the Molten Man uh, freedom after he's been a good citizen or a good uh, prisoner in prison and has shown good behavior. So he gets off on good behavior basically in prison. And the first thing he does after he gets out of prison is realize that his strength as the Molten Man, he's learned how to control his strength a lot more since he's been in prison, is able to, to destroy like concrete um like beam not beams but like uh like building structures basically like the things that hold the buildings up uh pretty cool he basically feels like he can't be defeated by spider-man again so the multi-man gets to a disguise uh which he has a plan to use that because it's kind of hard not to recognize the multi-man because of his skin you know uh being molten basically um he basically gets this guy that owns like a jewelry shop to basically try to open his vault for nice he's gonna buy some priceless jewels but then says that he's just gonna take them without pain and then the guy opens fire on him by using a gun um it doesn't work on the multi-man he just shatters the gun in the guy's hand and he's basically gonna attack the dude whenever a uh, spider-man shows up and he gets to a uh, fight with him and the multi-man basically tries to like play that he's just a normal dude but when he lands a right hook on spider-man spider-man realizes this guy is not normal and the guy basically gets away you know the multi-man gets away um, he gets out of his disguise and basically uh, realizes that no one's going to be able to figure out it's him because of his disguise. And uh, that he also left empty, empty handed basically, he didn't get any of the jewelry. Uh, so it wasn't really a win for him, but he did get to fight Spider Man and kind of uh, beat Spider Man in a fight. So that was enough for him, I guess. Um, we get to see that Spider-Man basically goes back home. He has to realize uh, what exactly happened, that that was no normal a criminal. Eventually he realizes that it felt like he was getting punched with a uh, with a hand of iron and he realizes that this must be the Molten Man and He basically goes to work in trying to figure out where what the Molten Man is using as his um, Identity eventually he sees where the Molten Man is at and he trolls him back to his hideout And when he goes in the door and then comes out he's wearing his disguise So spider-man basically takes pictures showing that this is the disguise that the Molten Man is using um, eventually, Spider-Man uses his fire signal to basically, uh, surprise the Molten Man, and then uses his webbing to basically try to, um, capture him, but that doesn't work just like the first time they fought, and that he just breaks out of it, and gets out of his disguise completely. This leads Spider-Man and the Molten Man to basically get into a one-on-one -on -one fight, hand-to-hand, -hand, and we get a lot of cool action panels. Eventually, Spider-Man uses a technique where he puts the Molten Man upside down with him, using his spider webbing. And it's a really cool action se uh, sequence, basically. You had a really cool uh, shadowed panel from Steve Ditko uh, showing surprise in the Ultimate's face as well. Just overall really good expressions and fight choreography uh, by Steve Ditko. Eventually, Spider-Man comes up with the idea, like he did the first time, to basically try to grab the Ultimate's hands with some, like, iron. Um, using iron as well against the iron body of the Ultimate. Or uh, iron hearted body is the multi man. He tries to get his hands to where he can't uh, fight. But uh, realizing that he's not going to be able to beat him the same way a second time, he also utilizes his spider agility to grab the multi man's blades and basically hog tie him. 
and then use his weapon so that he can break out of it uh, with just like his pure strength, you know, not using his hands or blades. And being hauled tight and webbed up, he's left for the police and basically is shown uh, evidence by the police after Spider-Man delivers evidence to them that he was using disguise to basically do some robberies or attempt to do some robberies. And the Multiman's basically surprised knowing these going to go back to jail and that no way he's going to be able to talk the judge out of not, you know, putting him in jail. So it looks like Spider-Man won again. Now, um, Peter basically goes to the Daily Beetle to give the pictures to J. Jonah Jameson to sell. And it's revealed to him by the new secretary that Betty basically has quit. And she basically left uh, the Daily Beetle. So this puts Spider-Man in kind of like a, like a depression type phase. And he basically just tates uh, his stuff to J. Jonah Jameson. You know, he gives his secretary to go give it to him and basically, you know, mail him his check and stuff like that. And uh, the secretary basically gives Peter the last thing Betty wanted to give him, which was a picture, I guess, of himself or her. I think it was uh, of himself, and he basically just trashes it and breaking it in the process in the garbage can of the Daily Beetle. And he basically, the last panel we see is him basically walking, thinking about Betty Brandt in silhouettes and his body basically in shadow saying the end and yeah so this story basically starts off with a scientist and this scientist basically was able to like he was working on a meteorite i guess that had fallen from space and this meteorite let out a gas and the gas basically affected uh this professor this scientist and he gained like superhuman strength and stuff like that able to lift stuff that's like 100 pounds uh like lifting a feather basically as he says and um overall it's just a really cool scene now we go to peter basically in college and he tries having interactions with people and a girl basically talking to Stacy, basically thinking that he's not that bad and basically told her that you know, uh, that he'd be cool with hanging out with her, but when she says that, you know, she hangs out with him because he's smart, he sees this kind of like, uh, this could be the same thing about, like, with Betty Brand, where she doesn't accept everything about him just because he's smart, um, she likes him, so he basically blows her off, and she sees this as rude and basically tells Gwen that he, that she's right, that Peter is kind of like, uh, up, you know, stuck up and basically like that, all about himself. Uh, we know that's not true and that he's dealing with the breakup with Betty Brandt, uh, a forceful breakup that, you know, didn't even really break up. They, she basically just left, uh, which was really messed up. Um, so he's dealing with that and it makes sense that he wouldn't want to dive into another relationship just right away, even though he almost did, you know, in the beginning of the conversation. But the Meteor Man basically goes off and he uses an enhanced uh, jumping ability and super strength to basically go and rob, I think, a bank or something like that. And he calls himself the Looter. So it's not the Meteor Man, he's called the Looter. Now, he uses this, like, device that blinds his uh, opponents and the cops, basically. And he's able to get away with all this money, so it's kind of crazy. Now, Peter's having, like, a science trip with his high school class, or it's not a high school, a college class. They basically go to this, like, science place, and they see the meteorite that gave uh, the looter his abilities, his powers. And the looter basically goes in front of the meteorite and basically tries, I guess, to steal it. And Peter runs off and basically uh, gets to his Spider-Man costume, and he gets to a battle with the looter. And the looter basically is using the environment to basically try to break valuable items that Spider-Man is basically trying to make sure that they don't break during the fight. And throughout the fight, uh, they're basically able to land hits on each other with, of course, Spider-Man probably holding back, not knowing if this guy is uh, a regular dude or not. And eventually the guy uses his uh, bright attack, you know, his little flash light that he uses to basically try to blind everyone and Spider-Man as well. Spider-Man knows that because he has the ability of his spider sense that he can just close his eyes and not get affected by the bright beam that, um, you know, the flashlight basically that the looter is using. And he's able to save some uh, bystanders basically that almost got crushed by one of the looter uh, basically pushing this giant thing of uh, machinery basically on these people. And Spider-Man was able to save them because uh, he wasn't blinded, so that was really good. Uh, so he basically saves these people, but realizes that the looter basically got away. Now, we also get to see that Peter basically was able to um, not get caught 
and people basically are making fun of him thinking that he ran away basically from the danger not knowing that you know he's spider-man and the looter basically uh got into his regular outfit you know and got out of his looter outfit and realizes that he really wants to meet her that it has to be his uh someday that he's gonna have to work harder to try to get it without spider-man you know foiling his plans and Peter's interaction with Gwen Stacy basically tells her that he doesn't understand why she's being so like harsh to him. And I'm really liking that Peter's not letting it get to him too much. Um, but yeah, so Peter basically gets to his Spider-Man costume again once he's out of that science, uh, you know, situation. And he goes and he actually confronts the looter yet again. And they basically get into confrontation in the air with the looter basically, I guess, coming up with the idea that, you know, the Spider-Man won't be able to catch him in the air, despite him fighting villains like the Green Goblin, who uses an air mobile device. Um, it's kind of weird, but Peter uses uh, like a like a high beam, I guess is what it's called. He basically jumps off of that and basically grabs onto the looter. The looter tries to use super strength to basically try to knock Peter out of the air and try killing him, I guess. And Peter basically grabs the looter's leg and says he's not going to let go. Eventually, he just lands a right hood, I guess, pulling some of his strength out and not holding him back completely. And this just knocks the looter out in a single hit, which kind of proves the point that Spider-Man was holding back the entire fight throughout the story. And he takes off the mask and realizes that this guy, he doesn't know who he is. He's just going to have to give him to the police and they'll probably be able to identify him. So he gets them, basically, he t he hits the balloon that the looter was using at a little bit at a time, basically, to get the air to come out a little bit at a time. Basically, get him to land safely on the ground where the police are, uh, because they're already waiting for the looter. And he basically gets off the thing before it lands on the ground, uh, getting on one of the buildings, and shines his uh, spider signal on the looter, that way the police can grab him. The police don't know that Spider-Man saved the day once again, and that's how the issue ends with Spider-Man basically saving the day from the looter and giving it to the police. And Spider-Man saving the day usually is the ending for most of these issues, but yeah, that's how it ends. So this story basically starts off with Mendelstrom in prison, basically being released from prison after he served his time. And yeah, I believe that he's been in jail for 10 years. And in these 10 years, he's basically been a good model uh, prisoner, and this is why he's getting off, I believe, early or something like that. I think he's getting out early. That already started his full term. But he has someone waiting for him outside, and they're going to start planning their revenge on the person that framed him and got him into jail. Uh, and it, it, it will be more explained later on in the issue. Now, there's a guy that basically tries to take a shot at Mendelstrom, and basically tries... Um, to kill people basically that are uh, working with them or something like that uh, but the guy gets stopped by spider-man he basically tells him to talk and reveal exactly why they're following Mendelstrom and stuff like that and spider-man gets into the car with this dude and basically has him drive him and tell you know uh Mendelstrom and the rest of his uh, cronies basically eventually they lose him though and spider-man has to go off on his own and get out of that car and basically go into the city and yeah um so next thing we get to see is that uh J. John james is basically getting new secretaries like every issue and this is like a running gag for the next few issues i believe uh, since betty brant left and yeah it's pretty interesting because J. John james then basically uh blames peter for betty brant basically leaving and to him betty brant is more valuable than peter of course because he has people that do stories but to have a good secretary is very hard especially working under jj jameson it seems um going to the next thing we get to see that peter basically is not letting his classmates basically uh get under his skin and this shows a lot of development in his character since high school and that he would let what other people say really affect him and it seems like now he's getting to the point where he's finally just accepted that uh some people are just gonna like hate on you and the so that's pretty cool now you see that minnowstrom is working on these different types of robots some looking organic some being completely uh, metallic and he's able to control these robots with his mind it seems with a, like this mind uh, control you yeah, or mind re remote mind um device basically it puts on his head and controls the robots with uh, thoughts and stuff so spider-man goes into a burning building and he realizes that this robot this organic looking robot is being controlled somehow and he gets to a fight with it and the fight is pretty cool 
And in the robots prequel, it basically is overpowering Spider-Man and is showing the intelligence of Mindelstrom. And this will be very important for the future. Um, for those that know about the Green Goblin, you know where this is going. But Peter comes up with the idea of, you know, basically uh, putting himself in the robot into Athena Fire, risking burning himself, basically. But he has Spider-Man's durability is enough to handle the fire for a few moments, and this is able to get the robot off him, and basically, I guess it explodes or something, it basically gets destroyed. Um, and I think the entire building also collapses as well, which is probably what destroyed the robot. Um, but yeah, so Mindelstrom is okay with that robot being defeated because he has another robot being built right now that has the ability to shoot like laser beams and looks completely metallic. Now this is where we get revealed to Norman Osborn, which is Harry Osborn's um, dad. This isn't our first time seeing him, but this is where we get his more of his personality and that he has a strained relationship with his son. Uh, basically not respecting anything that, that he says. He has a horrible relationship with his son. But it's revealed to us that uh, Professor Strong basically, that he basically screwed him out of one of his inventions and then he got him into jail by blackmailing him or something like that. And Strom has been saying that he wants to get revenge on uh, Norman Osborn. Uh, you know, because he basically had began to threaten Norman Osborn and then uh, Norman Osborn basically uh, screwed him over and uh, got him into jail because Norman was uh, basically screwing him out of his inventions. Uh, so yeah, definitely Norman's not a good dude. Eventually, Peter makes his way to where uh, Foswell in the Identity of Patch basically goes to try to get information on Professor Strom. Um, as he's been telling him since the beginning of the issue, he was the guy that was uh, basically, I believe, um, almost got shot by that guy, if I'm correct. Uh, maybe that was Strom, or maybe it was just one of his lackeys, but I believe it was uh, Foswell. Foswell's still trying to get information, and still making it seem like he's not a villain, um, which he was the big man, but he said that he basically turned over a new leaf and is a good guy now, and he hasn't really been shown to do any bad things, so we'll see when exactly if he'll ever turn back to the big man and lead the Enforcers again. Now, um, basically, we've shown again that this robot has the ability to shoot lasers, and he's very dangerous. Eventually, Peter's able to save Foswell as Foswell was going to get killed by Professor Strom and his henchmen. And after he finds a way out and tells Strom that, not, not Strom, that, he'll, that he tells uh, Foswell that, you know, uh, he'll be fine where he's at and that, that he goes after Professor Strom and his henchmen. And um, while they're basically in their base, Spider-Man has uh, to go basically save Norman Osborn because they sent the robot, this metallic robot, to basically go and kill Norman Osborn. So the robot basically starts destroying all of the office of Norman Osborn, saying that it's going to destroy everything that he has. Um, and then it's going to kill him basically right after when Spider-Man comes through the window, it basically begins a fight with the metallic robot. The metallic robot tries to use its laser beam to basically kill Spider-Man, but it never lands a hit on him. Does his spider agility and his spider sense. Um, he's routinely able to react to beams of light, which is a very impressive feat uh, for this version of Spider-Man, the Steve Ditko Stan Lee, considering this is the first version of Spider-Man that ever existed. And yeah, very cool fight scene. Eventually, as Peter's dodging these light attacks, basically from this robot, Norman Osborn comes behind him and hits him with some concrete. And um, this is another little hint that something's off about Norman Osborn. He's not just some regular dude. And for those of us that know who Norman Osborn is, um, yeah, that reveal is going to be pretty obvious. But yeah, so right there's a little hint that he's not just some normal human. He definitely has built uh, above human uh, level of strength. He'll just grab a giant piece of concrete and just smash it over Spider-Man's head. Um, it kind of knocks Spider-Man down for a bit, and Norman basically tries to escape, and it will be explained why he escaped, but uh, Peter gets up and he goes into battle with the robot again. He dodges uh, one of the robot's light beam attacks instantly uh, at point-blank range. Probably the most imp uh, impressive feat in this uh, in this run, probably, other than lifting that giant uh, piece of uh, machinery in issue 33. Um, he finally gets the robot off of its balance and is able to defeat it by knocking it to the ground. 
Um, and yeah, uh, so Professor Strump is uh, basically, it looks like he's defeated when um, the henchman basically makes a run for it. Uh, and, Fo and Foswell basically uh, puts him at gunpoint and says that he's not going to go anywhere. He's going to give him to the police. Uh, so Strom basically grabs the robot's torso, which still has the head attached and the laser beam that it has. And Peter basically has enough of this fight and he uses his webbing to grab the torso of the robot and just slam it into uh, the wall, which I guess destroyed it as it's firing its laser beam. Uh, so I don't know if the laser being destroyed or it was it being pushed into the laser, uh, its own laser by Spider-Man uh, using his webbing and smashing to the wall. But Pro Professor Strom is basically defeated, and someone at the window basically points a gun at Foswell, and Peter uh, basically pushes him out of the way as the spider sense activates, and he knows that this person is going to try killing Foswell. Um, and Foswell basically has a heart attack and he dies before he can give the information on who exactly was the person he was trying to get his revenge on. Uh, we know this is Norman Osborn um, that, you know, he's trying to take revenge on. Uh, but he wasn't able to tell Peter before uh, he had the heart attack and basically died. Um, and Foswell basically confirms that the guy is dead. Um, so basically after that, after he dies... We get to see that um, Peter basically leaves Foswell to tell the police what exactly happened because it's better if he does it as official uh, news reporter for the Daily Bugle. And yeah, we get to see that Harry basically goes to Norman Osborn to tell him about, uh, you know, to tell him that J. John Jameson was there. And J. John Jameson basically tells him about what happened with Professor Strom. And Norman basically says that, you know, he's happy to hear that. And that, you know, he doesn't understand why Strom wanted to get revenge on him. Of course, this is all a lie for Norman Osborn. It's revealed to us as J. John Jameson leaves that it was Norman Osborn that had the gun at the window. And, you know, Peter basically is walking, you know, throughout the city. And, you know, just, you know, as Peter Parker, he's thinking about what happened. And they could have swore that he saw a gun. And there's no way that a normal man could have been up there because there was no ladder. There's no nothing. And again, little hints like that, that we know it's Norman Osborn, but how exactly did he get up to that window? There's no way to get up there. Uh, if you put two and two together, you know exactly who Norman Osborn is. Most of us do. Uh, but keeping in spirit for this run review that I'm doing, I'm not going to say it. And we'll talk about that when we start the John Romita uh, Stan Lee run uh, right after we finish this run of Stan Lee's DJ Go. And that's basically how the issue ends of Peter basically contemplating trying to figure out who exactly was at the window and if he had imagined it at all or if it was really someone there and how exactly could they do it. And yeah, that's how the issue ends. Welcome back, my students, to a brand new episode of Comic Class. Today's lesson, guys, we're looking at Stan Lee and Steve Ditko's The Amazing Spider-Man, issue 38, just a guy named Joe. Now, this is the final issue that Steve Ditko made in his uh, Stan Lee Steve Ditko run. So, this marks the end of the Stan Lee Steve Ditko run, um, you know, playlist. Um, we will have one more video which will officially be the end, but in chronological order, this is the end. The only video after this is going to be the Sinister Six uh, annual issue that they made. We have to cover that because it was the first ever Sinister Six and the fact that Steve Ditko and Stan Lee made it uh, and that it's a very special story that is remembered even today. Um, we're going to have that in the playlist, but if we're looking at chronological order, this is the final issue that Steve Ditko ever drew. So, um, very important, and this is going to be a very interesting story to talk about, and it's been a long run. Um, this uh, run of videos has taken, like, I think, like, three or four months, but we're finally here at the final video. Um, like I said, with the exception of the Sinister Sits Annual, that will probably be out either tomorrow or on um, Sunday. And, yeah, without further ado, let's jump right into today's story. Let's go. So this story basically starts off with a guy named Joe, as the title suggests, and he's basically a wannabe fighter. Basically, he's trying to be like a boxer or something like that. When that doesn't work out, and he basically sucks at it, his manager basically gets him a job as an action uh, actor's like a stuntman. 
he gets to this like uh, science fiction suit and basically starts landing punches and the director of the movie basically doesn't see anything great in Joe just like everybody else but he gives him the part anyway as the stuntman now while he's doing some stunt where an accident basically happens like in most of these spider-man stories chemicals get mixed giant explosion because of electricity he basically gets electrocuted with these chemicals uh because of like the chemicals mixing with electricity like a live wire and it basically causes him to basically pass out when he wakes up he realizes that his body feels different and uh later on it'll get revealed what exactly happened to him his manager basically takes him out of there and he basically uh the director even said he wanted to keep the scenes of uh you know uh joe's uh performance uh so that's good for joe uh and it will get revealed later on in the issue of uh, how important this part was but peter basically uh goes to the beagle and the new secretary to john jameson basically tells you know him that she quits and that there's a reason why he can't keep a secretary so peter as he had came to basically see why J. john jameson hasn't paid him for his last set of photos basically um is gonna try escaping and basically does escape successfully from J. John Jameson basically blaming it on him yet again that you know Betty Brand basically left because of him. When he walks into Ned Leeds and Ned Leeds and him get into an argument about why exactly Betty didn't uh, accept uh Ned Leeds uh, proposal to basically marry him and they don't really like each other as Ned basically finally confers that he doesn't like Peter and even tells peter why you know betty doesn't really mean anything to him and of course peter knows that's not true even though he doesn't really show it like that uh which is very true for the real world that some people don't show their emotions on the outside that much uh but uh J. John jameson basically tells him to use that energy of uh, that anger basically go get some pictures of spider-man which is really funny now peter's basically walking you know mad about the whole situation kind of like just wondering why Betty left and you know this whole situation with Ned Leeds whenever a piece of uh, rock basically almost hits him at super speed uh, but his spider sense basically catches it like you know like he doesn't get hit by it and he gets to outfit when he realizes that um, this guy in this like science fiction suit is basically doing massive damage to like vehicles and stuff in the middle of the road uh, Peter uses his spider um webbing basically to try to grab the guy but just like a lot of super powered bows they're able to just break out of his webbing uh which really shows that peter 100 percent after the stanley state dicker run upgraded his webbing to be way more stronger because later on when he fights stronger foes sometimes his webbing can hold them so either he has to use more webbing on certain villains or he actually upgraded his webbing to be able to handle stronger opponents which would make a lot of sense for a character like spider-man with peter basically being like a, a like a genius that would be able to figure out how to make stronger webbing for stronger opponents uh, but basically the fight continues and peter basically gets defeated by this guy named joe and uh the manager basically grabs him and tells him that they need to go into hiding because he's making too big of a scene for him so he doesn't want to get himself arrested basically so Peter basically walks into, um, as he's going to college, he walks into a protest that some students are having. And he doesn't really like the idea of all these people protesting about, you know, anything they want. And it really shows uh, Peter's character at this moment and what he believes and stuff like that, which is really interesting. Uh, Harry Osborne, Gwen Stacy, and Flash Thompson basically uh, associate Peter with these crowd of uh, protesters when they start noticing that he's not actually interacting with them, he's getting himself out of there. Uh, so it shows that they're kind of wrong about him. I like little scenes like that that show that they're kind of judging Peter without fully knowing him. And this will completely change, of course, in the next few issues, I'm guessing, with his relationship with these three. Now, because we do know they become friends eventually. Now, the manager basically talks to Joe and tells him that his body is changing and stuff like that uh we even get to see that norman osborne's uh, son harry osborne basically tries to make fun of peter basically telling everyone that he's trying to pretend he's a scientist like his father uh which tells us that norman osborne is actually a scientist himself um to quote the movie you know uh, from spider-man 2002 um yeah so norman again another hint that there's something different about him is that in this issue we find out that he's actually a scientist himself so that there's something there as well as the thing that happened with mineral strom in the last issue that there's just something different about norman osborne 
So we have that little hint, and it's only in one panel, and it's very smart writing from Stan Lee, and also uh, ideas from Steve Ditko, I believe, as well. Um, very smart little things like that are very important to the story and its progression. And they basically notice that Peter's basically going off on his own yet again, and he just doesn't feel right being here with all these other uh, college kids, basically. Um, so eventually Joe wakes up and he goes into like a bit of a frenzy and whatever chemicals were uh, mixed with that electricity a uh, shock basically uh, messed with his brain and Other people know this as it will get revealed later on at the end of the issue uh, But Peter basically makes his way and he finds uh, He was beating up people and he eventually, eventually finds his way into this gym and fights all these fighters that are trained fighters and makes his way to Joe. I guess because Joe came to the old gym that he used to be at where they would call him a loser and not good at anything, he just wants to prove his strength to these people, but considering he's superhuman now, probably could kill somebody if he's not careful. So Spider-Man basically shows up and they get into a confrontation and we get a lot of cool action uh, panels that you don't really see in this entire run. So for Stanley and Steve Ditko's final issue together, uh, Steve Ditko did something really interesting in that it seemed like Stan, maybe out of respect, or maybe, you know, um, just an idea that Steve Ditko had, because maybe he knew that this was going to be his final issue, really laid a lot of cool action panels to basically end this final fight scene that he would ever do, and just really well choreographed and very good artwork, basically, of uh, Spider-Man and uh, Joe. So, eventually... I, I almost forgot to mention, I believe Joe calls himself the champ when he's in this uh, outfit, the science fiction outfit, because of people calling him a loser and stuff like that. So I think he calls himself the champ, uh, But so I didn't really mention him like that throughout the video, but yeah, that, that's something to keep in mind if you're reading this issue, that he does refer to himself as a, like an alter ego name. Eventually, Peter lands a final hit on Joe, and this seems to bring him to his senses, and it's revealed to us that the guy that um, could have put him in jail basically dropped the charges because he realized that, you know, Joe basically was out of his mind because of the chemicals and they messed with his brain. Again, a little hint towards uh, stuff with Norman Osborn. Yet again, we're getting a little hint that stuff like chemicals can actually mess with the brain and could lead you to become a super villain. Not saying it's not in your control at all, but uh, these little hints are very important for the future issues. Uh, but yeah, so basically the the uh, manager of Joe basically comes and tells him that none of the charges are going to be gone through with, basically, and that they basically offered him a role in the movie uh, because they liked the film that he did um, with when he had that accident and, uh, you know, the, the fight scenes that he did um, as the champ, basically, when he got his powers, basically. And stuff like that so that was really interesting i think he had his powers when he did that fight so maybe he didn't either way he got the role uh, and he got like a five-year contract or something like that to make a movie or something and so it looks like joe finally got a happy ending for his character it hopefully comes back sometime in the future uh, of the story i believe he does uh, but hopefully one day we get to see where it exactly is in the future and hopefully his life turned around and stuff like that and i think it's really interesting even though he's like a c-list villain or d-list um it is really interesting to finally see a character that really did change for the better and turn into a good guy uh considering how many villains in spider-man's original world's gallery that stanley Stigero made uh that didn't go through that and continue to be villains basically no matter what no matter what happens in their lives uh, which is good because we like them as villains but uh, we get to see that spider-man basically goes to the alleyway and norman osborne has hired people to basically try to take out spider-man for a high price in the underworld um like a ton of money in the underworld uh, if they're able to pull it off uh basically to keep spider-man from realizing what exactly he's hiding and yeah so they basically all get uh, destroyed and defeated by Spider-Man and when he comes across a training dummy that looks like Ned Leeds he basically punches it and says that he's jealous of him or mad at him because he's able to propose to Betty Brant basically and he can't because the shadow of Spider-Man isn't standing you know is standing between him and the shadow of Spider-Man isn't standing between uh, you basically Ned Leeds and the end of the issue basically shows uh, Mary Jane basically coming to Aunt May's house and or you know she was there and basically leaves right before Peter comes in 
and Peter comes in through the back door so he doesn't see Mary Jane and Aunt May basically takes him to the front and realizes that she's really driving off uh, in the distance and Peter basically goes to turn on the TV and have a cup of like coffee or something or you know just like checking out the TV and he sees that uh that Joe basically got a five-year movie deal or something like contract five-year contract deal and he basically turns off the TV and goes up to his room to go to sleep with Aunt May basically saying that you know the stuff on TV basically could give anybody you know nightmares and that to Peter you know that in his case that he only has nightmares when he's awake and that's how the issue ends kind of a sober uh, way to end you know, like a very dark way to end for the final issue of Steve Ditko but it does seem fitting considering how Steve Ditko felt uh, writing Spider-Man not getting the credit that he probably deserved you know that he does deserve I guess in my opinion he does deserve that credit of being very important to Spider-Man's character and is the cool creator of Spider-Man but um, I thought when I read that final panel it's very weird that that would be the final panel that Stan Lee and Steve Ditko did you know that Steve Ditko would draw is Peter's walking up the stairs saying something like that about having nightmares only when he's awake um, but it's very dark and it doesn't seem like something Steve Ditko would you know want for the character you know or you know a statement to basically be made if he told stan you know to make that line or not and yeah that was the amazing spider-man issue 38 just a guy named joe that was the final issue that steve dicko ever drew on spider-man it's kind of crazy that steve dicko never came back through all the years just steve dicko lived about like 40 50 years after this issue came out and it's crazy that they never invited him back or he never came back ever for any type of special occasion to draw spider-man again even for like an anniversary issue or something like that you know as like a collaboration or something like we're seeing with mark badley in recent years when it comes to nick spencer spider-man run especially uh, he had mark badley come and do some issues uh which to me were always great to read because mark badley's an amazing spider-man artist you know no pun intended um but yeah overall very good issue good way to end the the run like i said we have one more video in this run which did uh basically cover um the sinister sits annual um that's going to be really fun to talk about and it might be a longer video just you know just go through it at a slower pace i just really appreciate the work and we might even talk about the impact and the work you know either in that video or maybe in a separate video just you know to respect stanley Cedrico's uh, amazing no pun intended run on the amazing spider-man uh, and yeah i can't wait to jump into the john romita stanley era i've never read that run before so it should be really interesting to drop the videos on that run and just go through those stories with you guys and it's been a great run of videos um we'll talk more on the final video with the sinister sits annual uh but until then until next video god bless you until the next lesson keep on reading those comments